I do recommend Meetup to a lot of my friends that are looking for different things, wine tasting, movies, book club, meet a lot of new people, a lot of new friends, and it will make you more social. What is a chess dynasty? Unceasing dominance, move after move, again and again and again. We have a oh. resignation, we have history. He is the five-time FIDE World Chess Champion. But a chess dynasty can also be cruel. It forces most to defer their dreams until next time, if there is a next time. It's losing. Oh my God, did he just blow Yeah, him? he did. I'm blown away, the game is over. As the chess world turns to Kazakhstan, the Magnus Carlsen dynasty is set to close. The FIDE World Championship is finally up for grabs. For two chess superstars lying in wait, until next time is now. Jan Nepomneshi has methodically done what he needed to do to get another shot at the title. The pressure to seize the moment this time rests heavily upon him. Yana Pamnishi once again holds a one point lead in the 2023 World Championship match. What an incredible bounce back. Ding Li Ren knows firsthand what the end of this dynasty means an unexpected chance to make history. 
Can China's best turn his good fortune into eternal fame? Yan is just gonna smash through on the king side. Ding didn't have a good day. This is all over. And what a game, I have to say. The legacy of this championship spans across centuries. It reads from the names of chess giants. For the first time in a decade, a new name will raise the trophy and be etched into chess history. It's the 2023 FIDE World Championship. Whose name will next be called champion? Hello and welcome to Astana, Kazakhstan, where the FIDE World Championship 2023 is currently taking place between Yan Nepomnyshi and Ding Lai Ren. Score is currently 3-2 uh, in Nepomnyshi's favor after some dramatic roller coaster chess. And today, to cover all the action, I'm Grandmaster David Hal, and with me is my good friend and colleague, Anish Giri, world number six. Anish, you've been here the whole way. How have you been finding the match so far? Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure to follow the match. Uh, lots of ups and downs. And uh, today we are at an important juncture as Yang has taken the lead again. And Ding, having the white pieces, has an opportunity to come back, make it a 3-3. Looking forward to see this game. Yes, today will be game six. Historically, a very important game in any match. And uh, let's have a recap of how we got here. And uh, Ding Loren, of course, struggling at the early stages of the match. Game one was a draw, but game two, Yan Nepomnishi was the one who struck first. Ding, far from his best, surprised us with an early uh, opening idea, which backfired. Game three, he steadied the ship. It was a draw. And in game four, Ding struck back with a very impressive win with the white pieces. Yesterday, Anish, the roller coaster continued this topsy-turvy match. Game five, talk us through what happened. Yes, that was a special game. Jan has brought something to the table. He played his comfortable uh, 1e4, his Spanish, got a small opening advantage, was really deeply prepared, played everything very quickly. Ding was on the back foot, didn't find the best defensive setup. Jan just kept having the pressure and without any major blunders, just continuously being under pressure, making a few inaccuracies. Ding eventually lost the game and had to resign. It was a masterpiece, to be honest. Yeah, a masterpiece indeed, and that does take us to today. Ding will have white again, will be wanting to strike back. But of course, we're just watching from home out in Astana. We have chess updates and weather reports from Mike Klein himself. Thanks, guys. What a match we've already had. Three out of the five games have been decisive. That's sometimes more than we get in an entire match. Before we talk about the game today, though, let's talk about the weather. Many questions were asked about it at the press conference. Napomnishi did take his customary walk, despite the fact that it's negative 19 Celsius wind chill outside. He bundled up, put on a lot more clothes, and did his thing. He is Russian, after all. But yeah, the weather is taking a bit of a Benjamin Button effect. We were in t-shirts outside not, not only a few days ago, and already now we're back to wearing winter coats. We've gone from spring back to winter. I can't really understand it. In fact, it did affect gameplay a little bit, although Nepomnishi said it's not like a sporting event, but Nepomnishi could be seen circling around the board a little bit, doing a lot of pacing, and he said he did that just to stay warm. As far as the game, Ding said that this loss was more painful than his one a few days ago. One of the nice things about this match from a player perspective is that we know that a one-game advantage is not necessarily enough to hold up, like in some previous matches. There seems to be no indication that the players are going to play more conservatively just because they have one win in the pocket. Ding has already come back from a one-game deficit once. We will see if he can strike back right away and continue the string of decisive games. For Chess.com, this is Mike and Astana. Now back to you guys. These are the head-to-head -head scores between Ding Laren and Jan Nepomnyshi. After Jan's victory yesterday, he does lead in classical chess, five wins to three. Still a small margin, still more than half the match to go. And uh, Anish, it was interesting to hear Mike say that uh, Ding found yesterday's defeat even more heartbreaking than game two. What are your thoughts? Is he going to be able to strike back today? Yes, indeed. And I can understand where Ding was coming from. It felt like uh, a nice redemption story for him as the start was really, really tough. He seemed very nervous, at, uh, visibly. He was spending a lot of time in the rest area. 
was making lots of weird uh, moves, weird decisions that are uncharacteristic for a player as good as Ding. And it seemed like everything was turning around. His game three was good. Game four was even better. He won. The score was even. Jan uh, looked uh, shaky. And he was very optimistic, Ding. But suddenly, the trend shifted back again. And he lost the game and he felt that everything was fine. And he said that was a devastating feeling. And I understand where he's coming from. That said, he has come back uh, before and he wants, will want to come back once again. So I don't think he, he will despair. Even if not today, there's still plenty of opportunities in the match. It's a long, long match. Uh, though, of course, it's not endless. So you do want to strike back at some point and you definitely don't want to let it get, get away from you. As a two-point lead for Jan would already be a very significant advantage. Yeah, and I've been doing my research, Anish. Game six has been uh, very important historically. I, I estimate there have been 18 decisive games in World Championship matches in game six, which is an incredible ratio. Almost half of World Championship matches, there's been a decisive game in this round. Of course, people remember 2021, uh, Magnus Carlsen against Jan Pomnishi, the longest game in World Championship history. There have been blunders between Anna and Carlsen, game six. It always seems to be this game. Uh, so I'm hoping, I'm predicting that there will be even more drama uh, as uh, yeah, as we are waiting for the players to walk in. Should we make last minute predictions for this one, this round? Yeah, I, I think I can sort of uh, give a prediction of what I expect will happen on a more, on a more general basis. I think Ding will go for something where a lot of pieces will remain on the board, where structure might be a little bit closed and um, where there will be no direct uh, trades in the center. But in terms of a concrete opening, a concrete first move, that's pretty hard. He might do 1c4 again, or he might try to do something similar, maybe a reti with knight of 3g3, an opening you are familiar with. <laughs> hard hard to say. Maybe I, I would say probably mm, no e4, I think. And d4 is possible with a nimso, with some sort of a nimso maybe, but really hard to say. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you stole the words out of my mouth. I would love to see the Reti. Uh, it's my old man repertoire where there's minimal theory. You get an kind of original creative game very early on. But of course, Jan will have prepared for that. Uh, he's got a bulletproof repertoire at this point. Um, I'm predicting a decisive result either way. I think that Ding is going to take big risks in this game. Uh, I just have a feeling from his mindset, from the way we've uh, seen the match develop so far. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to make any predictions either way because I think it could go either way at this point. That's the one thing the match has shown us. But uh, meanwhile, we do see Yan arriving at the board, the first to arrive. And uh, Ding, we saw a few moments ago in his rest area. Uh, yeah, game six. I will predict yeah, a Reti just because I'm loyal to my favorite openings. <laughs> okay, okay. No, fair enough, fair enough. And uh, Jan is back with the same suit as he wore yesterday, the lucky suit uh, for him. I think looks. Uh, I like the. I like the way it looks on him. I'll try one on like that as well. Though I think it really depends on you know on your uh, face color as well, uh, how you match with the suit. But uh, really liking the. You know, Jan looks very fresh. Last couple of days and yeah, wonder in terms of um, from a game theory perspective, uh, how much risk should Ding actually take? And we have to uh, analyze that. I'm not sure how to do this kind of analysis, but I am not sure intuitively. I I feel that. Taking a lot of risks today could backfire because a loss would be devastating. A draw would not be the end of the world. But knowing Dink and seeing the way he played so far, I think he will take a lot of risks. And so I do think it will be a three-result game. I think Jan very likely will get chances of his own as well. And I think anything can happen. Uh, Dink so far played very aggressive, even with the black pieces. That game uh, after he lost the previous one in round two, the game three, if you remember well, with the black pieces. Oh, he, uh, I believe he accommodated actually with us that day as well. And Mm -hmm. He was uh, very, very aggressive, very pushy there. So, well, we'll see what, what will happen today. Uh, I, I think the, a loss for another loss for Ding is not out of the question. And that, that would be really bad news. Yeah, it would be uh, almost disastrous for Ding losing another white uh, if he does take risks, if they do backfire. Um, like you say, kind of game management, match management, game theory. I'm not sure it's going through their minds, uh, Ding and Richard Report, when they're. I mean, it's not in their style, really, to uh, make those kinds of uh, calculations. I think they both just want to get out there, play a game. And uh, meanwhile, Ding, interestingly, still sitting in his rest area, uh, reluctant to come to the board. What do you make of that, Anish? Uh, Jan looks ready, looks primed to go. 
Well, I heard yesterday was sort of uh, cold there. Uh, we had our, you know, Chess.com weather report. Uh, we are branching out as, you know, as a, as a, as a company. And we're also doing weather management. But um, I heard that they, they tried to make it a little warmer in the playing hall today. So perhaps the resting area is also a little bit warmer. So maybe the players will be able to spend some time. Ding also looking dashing with his, with his suit as well. I have to say, uh, players looking very sharp today, ready for, for battle. Nice uh, blue suit there for Ding, and uh, well, both seem uh, very much ready for game six as it starts in just six minutes as well. I like it. Dashing Ding, ready to kill with the white pieces, and uh, he's going to be adjusting the moves, uh, adjusting the pieces, sorry, and the first ceremonial move will be made uh, in just a few moments' time. Um, yeah, the Reti, the English, it could be anything at this point, uh, but Ding, I'm liking the fact that he has been sitting at the board the last few games. Yesterday didn't go his way, of course. He kind of got caught out in the opening, and that's why I think his strategy will be to remain flexible, take the game into unknown waters as early as possible. And uh, you must be impressed by Jan, right? Just the way he bounced back. I, I know I was here in game four. We made those predictions just before the rest day that Jan would struggle psychologically after his defeat. He came back with a very impressive win. Now it's up to Ding to show that he's uh, got that metal again. Ding yeah. Yeah. Pieces. I think Jan made a very good call yesterday. I mean, in hindsight, certainly he did. He played this uh, one of the main, uh, you know, main things in his repertoire, the Spanish, and he did nothing weird. Put pawn on d3, c3, a4, all the standard moves. You know, no, no unnatural play there. Everything was very clean and clear cut. Then he started fighting for the only big square on d5. Then you know, the game sort of. Uh, <laughs> Played itself in a in a sense. I'm not to take any credits uh, away from Jan, and certainly his conversion was very impressive. At some point, he took some very strong decisions. But in a way, um, I, I think he was fortunate in, to an extent that uh, he was able to um, to bounce back immediately and uh, got these opportunities. And well, he did everything right. It's always how it works in chess. Yeah, you cannot force a win. You always need a mistake or a bad decision from the opponent. But if you do everything right, well, the mistakes are going to come and. Yeah, he, he did his job in uh, the previous game. Now the task is cut out for Ding. So far, I feel, I don't know if I'm being subjective here, but I feel as though Jan is a little bit better prepared in the opening. I cannot quite pinpoint as to why, but somehow his uh, ideas with the white pieces, they're just, uh, they feel a little bit more poisonous to me. It feels like he puts a little bit more pressure than Ding does. Ding is just much more trying to simply get any sort of game, any kind of position without... Um, you know, without fighting for much advantage, Jan's still trying to fight for some sort of an advantage, I feel, and is able to do that in uh, his white games. So, uh, I don't know, I think it will be harder for Ding to make something happen today, but as we had seen in his previous white game, things definitely can, uh, can you know, it can take shape for him. And yeah, the players are, uh, you know, say having these last three uh, minutes before the game, the most nerve-wracking ones, the ones where you cannot leave the board anymore, but you also cannot make a move and you are stuck in this limbo. Fortunately, it only lasts three minutes. You're going to get out of it very soon. Yeah, they will be allowed to start the clocks very shortly. And uh, Anish, you mentioned that you feel Jan is better prepared. Do you think this is just a uh, kind of prior experience? He's been here. He's done it before, 2021. Okay, that didn't go so well, but uh, he's been in that zone. He knows what it takes. And Ding, with his second report, do you think it's uh, a bit of inexperience on their part? I wouldn't criticize Ding by no means. I just felt that Jan's prep was even more poisonous. But I, I think, uh, indeed, when you prepare for a World Championship match and for the candidates, and you do that with a large group of uh, pe of people, uh, then your prep, it sort of accumulates. Your knowledge accumulates. And I think Jan, in the past few years, he's been able to accumulate a lot of knowledge. And I know Jan for many years, and I think there were times when he was much less prepared. But due to these recent uh, events, these matches and uh, candidate tournaments, he definitely built up a huge prep, and we have the first move played by Dana Reznica, FIDE, um, I think vice president, I believe she is, and a big part of FIDE. And uh, did you see what move she made? Uh, it looked like 1c4. It was a pawn push. That's all I could see. Hmm. Um, yeah, Dana, a very strong Latvian chess player and uh, politician, I believe deputy chair of the FIDE management board. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, either way, Ding seemed to take her move back and... Keeping us guessing, he's played a couple of different first moves with white already in this match, 1d4 and 1c4. Will he switch things up even further? Uh, moment of truth. Any second now, the clocks will be started. 
I'm predicting one knight f3. Anish, you seem to be saying one d4 or c4 again. But I think one c4. I think I think the the move uh, Dana, who is a very strong player indeed, as you mentioned, uh, made. I think that was Dink's uh, suggestions. I think uh, one c4 has already been maybe predetermined. But maybe I'm wrong. He can indeed take it back still. It is allowed to take one move back if you have a guest coming. No, no more after that. But the first one you can take back very often. But I do think that one c4 is what uh, he asked her to play. I think that is more Ding style. He's you know, uh, not, he's sort of an extremely honest person. So he has a habit of just saying, um, yeah, he, he's just being honest even when you don't need to be honest. Let's let me put it this way. So I expect one c4. And we're off. We have the handshake. And okay, it is oh, no. d4. <laughs> wow. Then I misread that. Oh, d4. Interesting. Yes, I predicted the name. So if it will be a d4, but oh no, not at all. Wow, knight f3 on move two, staying flexible. Um, this one does Very cut flexible. out, yeah, cuts out the Nimzo at least, Anish. Uh, yeah. But I guess oh. surely he's not going for the London system or any other things uh, associated to knight f3. Yes, he does. He <laughs> oh, is. No. Wow. oh no, oh no, oh no, the <laughs> London. Okay, I think half the viewership is already lost. Uh, out of protest, a lot of viewers, you know, have, have logged out of our broadcast. Everybody hates the London, but well, well. Let's let's uh, wait and see. I think uh, Ding and Richard they have prepared something there. There, London, you know, it's it's become bigger than before. It was before it was just a scheme where you just make all these moves, like you just uh, bring a pawn here, here, knight here, bishop here, pawn here, a castle, and and you chill. But now there's lots of concrete theory, and um, it's much more subtle than that. Sometimes you develop the bishop to e2, sometimes to b5, sometimes you take dc5, sometimes you postpone c3, sometimes you uh, you don't go h3 you go h4 like all sorts of sometimes an early 95 a lot of uh, subtleties there so a lot of theory now and london is no longer the same no longer what it used to be um mm -hmm. but a very exciting uh, choice of opening um well in in some sense i feel maybe my prediction still not too much off as i suggested something where a lot of pieces will remain on the board and london is one such opening position mm -hmm. is also likely quite closed yeah it's a six yeah go ahead I was good. sorry. I was just going to say that Ding felt so guilty playing the London system. He left the stage temporarily, but he's back, and we do see some forcing moves. Uh, to me, this is like the Italian game of one d four. It's just so many move orders, nuances, uh, as you mentioned. But there are some forcing lines, and it looks like Jan playing very quickly. He has obviously prepared for this. I mentioned Magnus Carlsen plays this quite a lot, and uh, Jan, of course, prepared for him in twenty twenty one. So surely he will have done some work. We see an early trade of pawns on d four. Have you seen Jan face the London system that much? I'm trying to recall. Uh, I haven't, Anish. Uh, well, I've uh, played it against him myself. Um, mm. So I know that uh, for a fact. I've played it against him in this online um, tour, I, I think a season ago or a season or two ago, that the first uh, season of the tours, 2021, I think we speak. And I think my logic was that Jan used to be a Greenfield player. Mm. And so as a Greenfield player, you never faced London um, when the opponent is not on g6. So I thought it might be smart to play the London against him since he was just starting build, starting to build his repertoire. And I think at the time, indeed, his London was a little bit more shaky. In the London, also, he has always been going for the e6, bishop d6 setup, by the way. Always this e6, bishop d6 setup. But now he went for something entirely different. And as you mentioned, Magnus Carlsen plays London a lot and very successfully too. So Jan must have spent a lot of time preparing for London for his match against Magnus. And now he seems to be able, able to use that prep in this match. CDED Bishop F5, that's a relatively rare system. Um, there are much more fashionable uh, trends here with Queen B6 is a huge one where you take on B2 later. On Knight H5 uh, is also a very, very trendy system. Mm -hmm. but CDED Bishop F5, it's, uh, it's, it's a thing as well, a very natural uh, way to play. You take uh, and develop the Bishop. But uh, there, there is a quite quite some theory here, but it's a little bit less known. I think bishop b5 is how it goes, and then queen comes to b6 very often, you go c4, and it gets complicated. And I think at the end of these complications, actually, black does have a very solid position. So I think I understand what Jan is uh, trying to go for. But Ding is thinking he can also play it differently than bishop b5. He can just play it, just finish development with c3. But then uh, black has a comfortable uh, position. He'll go e6, bishop d6, castle, and finish development. 
Yeah, actually, uh, this system with Bishop F5, recently I was looking for a very young student and uh, the student wanted kind of a repertoire where it required almost zero theory, almost zero knowledge, where you could just get a position and play as black against the London system. And I recommended this one because, yes, white can play Bishop B5 and maybe some direct lines, but uh, I think majority of London system players will just develop pieces. And uh, Ding has that dilemma now. If he doesn't go Bishop B5, if he just plays like C3, uh, as you say, Anish, it's going to become a very long uh, maneuvering game. And uh, we should also remind the viewers of the time control. Uh, they do have two hours for 40 moves, no increment. Uh, they do gain 60 minutes after move 40. And it's only after move 60 that they gain 15 minutes and a 30 second bonus. And Maybe Jan is going for one of those long games. We know in 2021, he had, I think it was seven and a half hours against Magnus Carlsen, multiple time controls. Uh, okay, Ding does go C3, so avoiding any direct conf conflict here. And like you say, E6 is coming, Bishop D6 is coming. Not much White can do about that now. Um, I've got to say, I quite like these, um, these types of positions for both sides, just in practical terms, the Carlsbad. But uh, is the Carlsbad... The Carl's good here, Anish. Uh, we know that they had this, uh, they had this pawn structure against each other back in game three. Yeah, I think um, colors reversed, but basically, basically not re re reversed. So, like that, if you know what I mean, like the colors have reversed, but so did the players. So they are still <laughs> on the same side of the Carl's bus. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the, the Carl's bus structure is uh, referring to these two pawns against these two pawns, usually with this uh, attached to them as well. And uh, then we spoke about this minority attack plan. I mean, very long term, of course, not early. First to finish development, prepare B5. Or there is this F6, E5, uh, F3, E4. But with the knight already on F6, they usually it's the minority attack that, that you do. Uh, but you can also, sometimes you can also go for the E5 break and uh, try to hold up position with an isolated pawn. Especially with black, you can, you can often do that. Yeah, David, uh, you mentioned a student that wants to know little theory and just get a playable position. Are you talking about Magnus Carlsen here or somebody else? <laughs> no comment, Anish. Uh, no, it's someone a few hundred points lower rated than Magnus okay. Carlsen. Okay, but, just to uh, clarify. Just to clarify. Okay. You know, what is a big thing, by the way, is this... Um, so, Queen b3 is a very tempting move. Mm -hmm. And then there are, you surely are aware of the spawn sacrifice. Bishop d6, Queen b7, Bishop takes f4. Yeah. Queen c6, Maybe Queen can... f8. Yeah. yeah, maybe we can show this on the board because uh, if Ding is feeling ambitious, then this is one of the few direct attempts he can go for. Otherwise, it is purely maneuvering, I think. And uh, here we do see uh, Queen b3 and Ish talk us through this line because Bishop d6, I guess it's only come to light in the last few years. It's been spotted by engines uh, and so on. Yeah, I'm, I must say, it's not like I have too much to say in this position. Uh, well, I don't like, it's not like I have pages of the analysis here that I, I would share, but... Um, uh, I think it's a, it's a trendy uh, thing, and I, I think in some of the versions, it, it, sometimes the bishop is on g4, sometimes on h5, sometimes on f5, and uh, depending on where that bishop is, some of these positions are very good for black, some of them are not as good for black. It's very concrete, so black has the bishop pair, the white queen is a little bit misplaced, and the black king, although it looks like it's uh, sort of uh, in trouble as it hasn't castled, it will actually find a very safe place on g7 after g6 or g5 and king g7. Uh, so the big question is if uh, white will be able to finish the development of bishop e2 castle and then protect the b2 pawn as well somehow after potential rook b8. And if white will be able to consolidate this, uh, this position up a pawn, but certainly some compensation for... Uh, for black and it's very very concrete i mean uh, some computer analysis are required here uh, i i don't know if ding will take this direction i think mm -hmm. i yeah honestly uh, I'm, I'm not sure it will be very unpleasant for for him if he's not as well prepared as Jan. because the problem with the london system and uh, it's uh, you know it's one of the decent uh, one of the good openings but the problem with the london system is that black has so many different systems to choose from mm -hmm. and i've had that issue myself with the white pieces when I played the London very often even though you prepare you like you are the one who is choosing the opening so you chose the London but then it's so hard to guess what black will play there are like mm -hmm. 10 systems that equalize and five more that are maybe very slightly worse but you have to know what you're doing and so even if you you know you're going to play the London and you spend the entire day uh, preparing for it you still might be less prepared than your opponent who will actually choose one of the one of these 15 lines and we might see the situation here. Ding sort of chose the London, but he is the one who is less prepared for this game. 
And I think that's what happens. And one of the reasons why London is still not as popular as it could be, like just has a lot of choice. And this is just one of the many, many lines. Yeah, and we see on the camera, Ding not really uh, showing positive body language right now. Either he's uh, asking himself, you know, why didn't I check this exact line? Uh, like you say, Anish, there's so much to prepare for. Why didn't I check the specific move order? Um, or he's just uh, on his own. And yeah, either way, it can be unpleasant. I don't know about you, Anish, but I find myself so many times around move 10, 15, just sitting there beating myself up uh, in my head, just saying, okay, I could have checked this. I could have re refreshed this recently. But instead, it's uh, just that really unpleasant decision. Do you play into your opponent's preparation and risk even more with the white pieces or do you just play on and admit you have no advantage in a quiet maneuvering uh, system what do you think uh, is going through ding's mind yeah i think his body language suggests uh, that he maybe intended queen b3 but now realize that uh, he, he doesn't want to dare um or or sometimes you know you read too much into body language as our <laughs> colleague daniel always likes to say he doesn't like to read too much into body language and it is it is true. Well, you can indeed, if you want to, well, you can just finish your development. But the question is then, well, how ambitious are you? Let's say bishop e2, probably bishop comes to d6. You can trade, you can castle. And then you have, you have various ways of uh, playing this. You can try to go after this bishop maybe, though trading that bishop for a knight is not going to yield you that much. You could also just not try, <laughs> trade that bishop. Uh, I think the other move that comes to mind is bishop b5, where you apply a bit of pressure on the knight, so potentially you control the square a little bit better. But it's all, um, yeah, it's all not so, not so much. And uh, I think yes, a big choice here, uh, queen b3 or or not queen b3. But I, I think Ding should be in his prep, but he looks really pissed. I did he could yeah. he have already mixed up here that he should have played bishop b5 and he plays c3 and now he's upset. Like wh why why is his body language so negative? Yeah, it's it's really hard to get a call on uh, Ding Laren's body language right now. Um, I think he might be right. Either he's mixed something up or he's annoyed at himself that he hasn't looked at Queen B3 and this whole line uh, kind of in the recent uh, in the recent past. If you're going to go for this Queen B3 is white and go pawn hunting, then you want to have looked at this uh, in the last few days. You want to be fully aware of all those nuances, like you said uh, later, Anish, because actually that position the two bishops and the misplaced black king it's very dangerous for white uh, as far as i can recall you can uh, certainly find yourself in big trouble if you don't know all the details so um yeah it just feels like he's kind of stuck in his head a bit too much we know that ding's had this emotional kind of journey so far in the match and he's kind of uh yeah internalizing everything right now maybe having flashbacks to earlier points in the match where he could have gone a bit deeper with his preparation and uh i've got to ask as well we mentioned the carlsbad pawn structure Ding had this uh, structure with the black pieces in game three. It seemed to me that he maneuvered quite well. Okay, he, play, he plays a move, looks like bishop to b5. There we go. Uh, but this pawn structure, he seems to like this structure. And Jan has been consistently going for the black side. Which side would you take if you had a choice? Oh, uh, wow, say that a... we get a maneuvering position. Let's you're go existential here. <laughs> yeah, you're calling me out there. Uh, I think there are mainly two types of players. Mm -hmm. And there are those who like them with either color, and there are those who don't like them with either color. <laughs> Which one are you I, on? Which side? Um, I think it depends on who I play. It's one of these positions where if you feel you are superior in this lower game, I'd certainly take it. Uh, if I play a very strong player, well, let's say one of uh, the world top, like Carlson or Ding, uh, and then I would really uh, try to make sure I have a good position. So I wouldn't want some dodgy Carlsbad. But of course, if I play uh, a player significantly lower rated and I have a dodgy Carlsbad, I can imagine that I'll be quite happy because you have a lot of peace play. I think from body language of Ding, by the way, he mixed something up for sure. Because I think c3 and bishop b5, it's really not a thing. Mm. There is a variation uh, here where you go a6 uh, and then c3 bishop f5. And after bishop f5 directly, like you're supposed to fight for the advantage with bishop b5. But yeah, I don't know. c3, bishop b5 combined with his uh, facial expressions sort of make me feel like he's, uh, yeah, something has gone slightly wrong with his prep. But that said, uh, the damage is extremely limited because, well, it's even better sometimes, uh, you know, because Yana is so well prepared, it's even better to mix something up, do something non principled. Because if you do something principled after bishop b5, on move seven, the line goes like queen b6, c4, and it gets very forced. 
and then uh, likely Yan will be completely prepared and equalized by force. While here Yan is uh, confused, he will be confused and we will get a game. And uh, well, we saw in the previous Carlsbad game that Ding was maneuvering a little bit more, uh, a little bit more accurately with a little bit more feel, if uh, you would agree with me. And yeah. then if, if we look at it from a data, sort of a more global sense, then yes, um, Ding might be not too unhappy with the fact that we, they got this position. At the same time, uh, having the black pieces, Jan, of course, was worried about something, uh, some prep in the opening, that there would be something uh, dangerous somewhere, a pitfall. But here he knows that, well, he gets out of the opening with a equal position, he will be able to finish his development, castle short, and then it's a standard equal position where in order to lose, you have to make many inaccuracies or many mistakes. And Jan definitely feels somewhat of a relief there, but long term, long term, he could get outplayed as Ding. To me, it feels like Ding is the player with a little more experience, a little more feel for these kind of structures, but well, a very long way to go and uh, not to ruin it, but a very slow, um, very slow maneuvering game is incoming for us. I think this one will, uh, it will take a while before it gets too exciting. Yeah, and London systems, kind of a London system players, ultimate fantasy, that slow maneuvering game. Yeah. But uh, for the viewers, perhaps uh, not the most exciting yet, but it will uh, heat up later, judging by the way this match has gone. And Jan does sit back down at the board. Um, what moves are we predicting here? Either you put some pressure on that bishop that's just uh, landed on b5, I guess, or you develop with bishop d6. Try and trade off those dark square bishops immediately. And uh, okay, that's what Jan does go for. Very natural move. Yes, and when uh, preparing for Carlsen, you have to look at these positions quite deeply because Carlsen, he likes playing them. Uh, he likes even uh, playing the most innocent versions of things, like even that are not threatening. He just wants to maneuver back and forth. So I suspect Jan would have looked at these kind of positions in great depth. Uh, just not not just Bishop D6 Castle and uh, let's play, but even uh, further down the road, he would look at um, the plans, the ideas. You know, uh, what, what are, how does the play continue? Where does the F6 knight go? Is it going to towards E4? Is it going towards D7? Do you push E5? Do you push F6 E5? Um, do you give up the F5 bishop? Do you keep it with H6? All these questions: Do you go for B5 or do you wait with B5 or are you afraid of B4 after B5? Are you not afraid of before after b5? All these questions that come to mind, I think you would want to have them answered in your prep if you're facing Magnus Carlsen. And I suspect that this is a leftovers uh, from that match uh, because I, I guess you don't need to prepare 10 different systems against London. So whatever you prepare for Magnus, you can use for Ding. Yeah, and I guess that's the difference between these kind of really elite grandmasters uh, or these uh, top players in the world compared to some of the rest of us. Me, for example, I would stop my preparation around here. I'd say, okay, black is fine. I'll work it out at the board. Uh, but uh, at the World Championship level, they must have played training games in this type of structure. They must have gone into detail that you say about the plans, the pawn breaks, uh, where you want to put your pieces, which pieces to trade off. And um, yeah, I really like black's position. I just think he's uh, got a kind of moral victory out of the opening, but that's not to say he's uh, ever going to be better necessarily. We're in for a long, <laughs> long grind this game. And uh, any predictions on which plan Yan will go for? You know him. Is he going to go for something maybe um, just kind of in the needs of the position? Or I don't know if he can whip up anything dynamic here as black, which he would love to do, of course. For starters, I think you castle short, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. you could make a case for, for, I don't like the move, but you could make a case for knight d7 because you could say maybe you are afraid of taking on c6 and knight d5, which I think you're really not. You're really not because of c5 there actually but uh yeah well i mean making a case for long castle would really be insane i think that's a horrendous uh, idea <laughs> in this position i think this, this is really quite outrageous you, you cre create the same balance for no reason at all king is very weak on the queen side i don't think you'd want that yeah and no, i i i honestly don't don't know uh okay well uh sorry i i think i there there is maybe maybe a thought that at the castle there is knight h4, although then there is also bishop g4 keeping the bishop. So I was about to say, maybe you want to play h6. Because um, okay. I'm trying to understand why he's taking his time at all. This castle mm -hmm. is sort of so natural. But first of all, he has a lot of time. But secondly, yeah, maybe knight h4 is a question. But yeah, knight h4, uh, keep him at by bishop g4, where I keep the bishops. And also, I don't think bishop g6 is the end of the world. But maybe you want to, if possible, avoid uh, giving up the bishop for now. Mm -hmm. So Jan taking his time, uh, but what happens after castle? Uh, yeah, that, that, that will be a bigger question. Also, the question is on Ding. 
uh, does he want to trade the bishop uh, on b5 um, with the knight or does he, does he did he just plant it there just for fun and uh, will it retract later to f1 all these questions uh, and you mentioned that you're happy with the black's position i think you black certainly equalized but in a way, if we re if we reverse the colors, uh, you know what people very often do these days: try to imagine if uh, bl black was white and white was black, then uh, white, who would then be black, uh, would have also comfortably equalized at this point. So it's a matter of perspective, I guess. We have this equal playable position, and it's a matter of choice uh, and taste which side you prefer. Yeah, exactly. If I was Ding here, I would be thinking, "Oh, it's been a disaster. No advantage out the opening." But if you give me his position when I'm black, I'm like, "Yeah, this is my dream." survive the opening solid position no trouble at all um yeah could he also be thinking about kind of asking this bishop a question uh, i'm not sure why he's delaying castling i'm on the same boat as you uh, it looks so natural to just castle and kind of think later but jan clearly has something on his mind yeah uh, you can definitely mark an argument for a6 uh, i would be uh, a little skeptical uh, first of all i would wonder maybe white wants to take on c6 I mean, in a good version. So maybe that is, that will, also I have to move like queen a4 after a6. But uh, the reason you could suggest a6 before castle is that after a6, um, I don't have, for example, if, you, if I castle first, I can play maybe rook e1 and bishop to f1, yeah? The, well, I, I mean, I really don't think that's a big deal, but I'm trying to find an argument for playing a6 before castle. I think not. Yeah, I mean, he's, he was trying to be precise and just taking his time, but I think it's very hard to make an, to make a case for a move other than castle. Oh, and Dink plays yeah. rook one Actually, Dink, Dink actually maybe, um, he was kind of not happy that Jan played the system because he didn't have anything special prepared for it. But he does play quickly, so maybe he, he you know, he, he, he didn't mix anything up or he didn't, uh, there was no surprises for him. He just was a little annoyed that Jan played one of the very good systems that he had nothing against. And now, okay, he just plays what he prepared because he plays pretty, pretty quickly, yeah? Yeah, but then again, it's uh, a bit like Black's last move, Castles. Rookie one is also White's most natural move. Mm -hmm. um, what else, basically? So uh, yeah, it could, could be bluffing as well be... a little bit. Yeah, yeah, or just trying to get in the flow, trying to speed up. Uh, yesterday, the clock played a huge part in Ish, right? I was just watching from afar, but uh, it looked like Jan already had kind of uh, settled things psychologically by playing so fast in the early stages. Ding was suffering there a bit later on. Yeah, and I looked up with the database. Um, there are one, two, three, four, five games of Gatakamski here with the white pieces, <laughs> all played in the very prestigious Title Tuesdays. And uh, Kamski is known uh, to be really an expert in this slow kind of maneuvering games. He loves these kind of positions. He he hates forcing prep. He loves uh, playing chess, uh, slow chess. He, li he likes it very much. And uh, not surprising is Gatakamski that we see here. And I think, yeah, probably um, Dink, you know, he might have uh, might have gone for this uh, cagey kind of setup. Nothing too exciting for people that like forcing preparation, that like sharp opening ideas. But from a perspective of uh, what Dink needs, I think, uh, believe it or not, it could could be a, a good game plan. Jan not too familiar with these structures in general. Maybe just hoping to outplay Jan. The computer, of course, says position is very close to equal or actually equal completely. But slowly you can outplay um, your opponent, especially as we had seen in the previous Carlsbad game. So maybe, maybe some deep uh, psychological thinking there by uh, by Ding. But of course, for Jan, uh, there are really very, very um, many options. And it's really hard to lose this position. Of course, you can lose it, but it will to lose a position, you have to make many, 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 many mistakes and um you know you'll uh, it has to be very gradual yeah either lots of small mistakes in each or one big one that's uh, <laughs> how my experiences go against the london system um you may you mentioned the famous uh, legend himself gatakamski how do those games go uh, is ding taking inspiration is kamski part of a secret part of the ding team <laughs> well uh, uh yeah it would be surprising if kamski would suddenly be a uh, uh, in the Dink's team, Kamsky is known as, as a well, well, of course, a famous uh, legend. But um, he he's uh, known to, to sort of be a great, great player who really doesn't uh, want to spend much time preparing. So I, I don't think he would uh, he would be like enthusiastic about helping someone else prepare. Like he would probably not mind playing some training games, 
but I'm not sure that Kamsky uh, would be the person to jump uh, on the opportunity and uh, you know, uh, become one of the seconds who, who will suddenly start checking openings. He didn't even want to do it for himself. I doubt he would <laughs> want to do it for somebody else. But uh, he actually won a fair share of this. He has four four against one. Um, and he played differently. Uh, so one of the games after a6, he played bishop to f1. Another game after queen c7, um, also a to move. He took queen c6. Uh, in other game, he went after queen c7, knight to e5. All three are completely different approaches, but it seems that uh, Yakamski was just sort of uh, freestyling here, playing different uh, possible plans. All plans are leading to different positions that are all roughly equal. So it's not like Kamsky had it all worked out and he had one way to, of playing it. He just sort of just played this position and he demonstrated all possible ideas. So 95 is one, take and 95 is the other, and bishop of one back is uh, a third uh, third way to play. Just get the bishop uh, out, or maybe play a4 and. Uh, then yeah, it's you. You should some do something with the knight. Like very often, what happens is the d2 knight lands on d3, right, David? This is what we mm -hmm. learned, sort of. Um, yeah. Uh, this is what we learned uh, in our chess kindergartens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah, you chase d3. this bishop. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say d3 is the dream square for the white knight, and d6 often for the black knight. Um, but, yeah, I uh, think the reason is that you could sort of control this square and also the important b4 square as well, and potentially after mm -hmm. b5, where you play b4, even c5 square as well. Knight on d3 is kind of uh, doing this multi-purpose tasks. Also, knight h4 is possible to trade this bishop, and then the other one can go to f3. So this is sort of the, the future I, I could uh, see for this knight on d2. Yeah, and uh, you were talking about the minor pieces uh, there, because... You mentioned the chess kindergarten as well. Uh, when I was young, I was taught these kind of structures. Actually, bishops aren't that important. Knights tend to be the more kind of flexible piece, the more valuable piece. Uh, but it was only maybe in the last five years or so I realized from London systems, from Karo Khans, which often end up like this, that um, actually the light squared bishop for white can be quite important. Uh, the bishop and knight combo against the two knights tends to end up with a slight advantage for white. Um, so do you think is this something that Jan's maybe trying to avoid? Uh, if you gave me this position 10 years ago, I might have just gone bishop g4 and traded off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand what you mean. It is true that uh, it is true that that's what they used to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And and now the engine doesn't like it as much. Uh, that's that's yeah. a good good point. Yeah, yeah, this is a good point. Bishop g4 takes f3. This is an old uh, old instinct that I <laughs> no longer have. Uh, I kind of got rid of it, but it's true that that's how they used to play it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the end of the world. I mean, I... As black, I uh, can envision various plans. So there is, you are actually a big expert here, I realize, because of the Karokan experience. I remember you've beaten Levon Aronia, the famous game where Hikaru looks, you know, you guys know, you probably know, <laughs> the, the chess fans who are who know chess for a long time and know this YouTube meme where Hikaru looks at the board and there is Levon there. You guys know this meme? It's David there playing the Carlsbad against Levon. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, so I didn't even need to. Very... Sorry? <laughs> I didn't even need to pay you to drop that in, uh, Anish. Thank you. My best <laughs> no, game ever. I mean, the, the, tra the transfer has already uh, has already occurred. So yes, thank you for. But um, no, the, you are definitely a big expert on these structures. Jan plays h6, as you mentioned, keeping that uh, light squared bishop. That um, sorry, the light squared bishop that is uh, important, as you had mentioned. Uh, yes, uh, I think one big question in these kind of positions is, does black go for the minority attack with a6b5, because that is actually the standard, the old way of doing it. But I think very often, more often than not, after you do this a6b5, white will just go b4. Then the knight is heading to c5, the pawn will go to a4, and you will just create the weakness on a6 uh, for yourself. So I think they don't rush it with b5 very often these days. And another question is sometimes black just chooses to prepare e5 uh, and uh, accepts uh, as any and just holds it. This is another way of, uh, of playing. I think both of these are um, unnecessary. A big question, I guess, with this f6 knight, like uh, you want to throw it in uh, or you want to uh, throw it back to support e5 square, one of the, the two uh, ways. Sometimes they even do like, with, after h6 it's less likely, but sometimes what even happens is some sort of a, um, I was going to say some sort of a stonewall with f5, but uh, Ding has played knight e5. Uh, you usually make this move when black cannot recapture uh, then it's a very safe move, yeah, because you you have a fork on uh, on the mm -hmm. queen and the knight. Uh, so ninety five is a safe move, I guess. Uh, Jan will might play queen c seven. 
and then he introduces the idea of capturing the knight. And then white has a choice to take on c6 with a bishop or with a knight. Yeah. Um, what do you think Ding's plan is? Maybe we can jump into a board and uh, play a few lines, play a few moves, because knight e5, very direct approach. I thought maybe white would uh, just maneuver a bit first. But as you say, queen c7 would be my first instinct, again, by analogy with some other uh, openings to the Karakhan. Uh, because this is a bit of a strategic threat. I think if black trades off one set of minor pieces uh, happily, then uh, should be okay. You mentioned taking on c6. I don't really like it with the knight, just because black gains time and uh, gets to play c5 next move. No, uh, no, no. I, I, yeah, this... it looks, it looks uh, uh, very, yeah, it looks very dumb to take with the knight. Indeed, as I lose a tempo, and then indeed the c5 comes. That feels wrong. I, I feel, you know, I have this big urge. Like I see potential uh, for taking and b4. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the slide squared bishop on f5, it could kind of be a bad bishop that is like staring at all these light squares but doing nothing. And my other knight can head to c5 sometimes. So I could see, I could envision a sort of a good knight, bad bishop kind of scenario here. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a long way to go. I think you start with a5, probably you want to get rid of this uh, potential weakness. After, oh, the, the bar is liking white, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do here? Do you just go a3 or there is something more? Maybe just maybe even knight b3 sometimes. I'm not sure if that's too ambitious just yeah, to rush was... in with the knights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's actually smart because I was wondering after a3 just for uh, because I wanted to kind of keep the pawn structure uh, more, uh, more, I don't know what's the word, like more solid. Like it's after cb, the d4 pawn is, uh, of mm -hmm. course, it's not really weak, but I wanted to keep the pawn structure this way. Uh, but I was wondering after a3, like how outrageous is to play a4 and take mm -hmm. away the b3 square from the knight. I don't know. It's maybe a big weakness, and I just go rook c1, c4. Yeah, no, I think I have completely misplaced this position. Rook c1, c4 just looks very good. And a4 is a weakness, probably. Yeah. So maybe a small strategic threat then? Uh, yeah. Unless Jan has some immediate way to kind of simplify that that you were trying to show with a5 uh, to take this knight. Yeah, I think if I would take with the bishop and go before, I don't know if I'm better with white, but at least I would feel a little bit excited. Uh, I, would mm -hmm. I would feel like I'm playing for something. I already see, uh, I see the outlines, you know, of how I could win uh, this good knight against bad bishop uh, kind of game. So the other approach by Jan could be to just go ninety seven and avoid this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't strike me as a Jan type of move. Uh, I quite like it as well. You could imagine the bishop dropping back eventually, the knight coming out to f five, maybe jumping back to d six. Makes a lot of sense long term, but. Uh, I guess Jan plays good moves, and it is <laughs> potentially a good move, so uh, maybe it is his type of move, but maybe not first instinct to retreat. Um, no, and uh, the knight on, on e5 is then what I really like here for white is that uh, maybe it's an illusion of, of, of an advantage here, but I like that the knight on e5 in this position after knight e7, it is uh, very firmly sitting on e5, nobody is uh, targeting it. In fact, it might be a stretch, but could see um, h6 of move 11 being inaccurate already. And I think the fact that Ding replied so fast suggests that actually Ding was prepared for this uh, position. Because uh, I, I think instead of h6 on move 11, there was really something to say for the standard move queen c7. I think they do this really very often. And the idea is that after knight e5, I can now take on e5. Mm -hmm. And after d, I have maybe knight to e4. Uh, I have lots of options here. Um, or maybe knight even to g4, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, because of the concrete, uh, yeah, the computer likes g4. Because knight f3, I have bishop e4, and f4, I have queen c5. So maybe good for, uh, for black. Uh, so queen c7, uh, move 11, yes. And because then after queen c7, if you take bishop c6 first, first of all, yeah, I, I could take with the queen. But I guess if I take with the pawn, the position is a little different. After knight e5, I have c5. And after b4, maybe I can uh, make a move with my f6 knight and then meet knight e5 with f6. So it's a little bit of a different uh, a different game. And also I can take on c6 with the queen, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Keeping the pawn structure as is is also a question. Yeah, what 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 is uh, what that position would, uh, would be. Maybe you go knight e5. You have a nice knight, but I, I've kept my pawn structure uh, intact and I don't have this potential weakness on c6. So I think this move h6, the young played, it's... Uh, was not a must. There's also uh, an option to go knight d7 here, for example. Maybe then knight h4 would pick up the bishop. 
but maybe that was a lesser evil. Also, it's possible to go knight e4. So there were options. I'm not sure h6 was the only move. Because after h6, knight e5, yes, yeah, a question for Jan. Does he allow the knight to stay on e5? Or uh, does he allow bishop takes e6 straight? Hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, the thing is getting something. I, I think probably knight e7 feels like it's a stronger move. Uh, but it's it's a difficult one to make. Yeah, and uh, I was going to ask what happens if black plays knight d7 here. Which piece do you exchange? Uh Kind of how do you resolve that tension but uh, either way jan has a difficult decision to make strategically uh, he's got to look into the future here i think you're right actually h6 is kind of a useful move but is it top priority maybe not it feels like jan uh, just kind of playing by hand there and only now is he properly uh, kind of tanking properly thinking uh, but already yeah not too pleasant this decision I think we will see a lot of maneuvering if knight e7 happens then um, mm -hmm. this game is just going to maneuver for the next 20 moves and, do we uh, like is is uh, g4 way too premature? I mean, I, I would not do it, but is it way too premature to go g4 f4 after knight e7? <laughs> Let's jump in and check maybe. And uh, knight to e7. Yes. Yeah, wow, and it's g4. You woke up on uh, the wrong side of bed today. Just want to check, mate. No, no, I just want to. You know, it feels completely. It feels completely mistimed, but I just want to show something and take a look at. I think knight e4 you have here. It's yeah. Just, if you no, didn't it's... have knight e4, then maybe, but. So it was important to control the e4. It's important to control the e4 square before you push f4. I guess that is the the def mm -hmm. definition of uh, of how you should do it. Because once knight jumps to e4, the problem is not necessarily only the knight there, but the problem is that f6 is coming, and our e5 knight has will have to leave, and then the weakness of the e4 square and the king side will be telling. So yeah, no no direct issues with knight e7. And I think knight e7 uh, is is sort of the the right way uh, to go. I think Jan will play it. If knight d7, which you mentioned after knight e5, I was thinking about uh, so trading on bishop takes c6, bc, mm -hmm. knight d7, queen d7, and knight b3 to c5. I was wondering about that. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I cannot assess this uh, right, 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 right away, but I, there is, there is a, a part of me that uh, really worries for, for black here because this black square bishop, it could be just shooting empty air. And I have this knight on c5, which will forever stand there. You'll never be able to get rid of it. And I could see all sorts of, you know, I could I could envision all sorts of scenarios where uh, somehow these positions end badly for, uh, for black. So knight d7, I think the most risky move of all, actually, getting rid of all the knights and allowing knight on c5. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I agree. As soon as I suggested it, I was like, oh, actually, let's not analyze because uh, this leads <laughs> to one-way traffic. I used to lose a lot of games uh, just like that, good knight versus bad bishop uh, when I was younger. But uh, yeah, a difficult question for Jan because he's pretty much committed to those types of positions uh, unless he plays a move like knight e7. Uh, yeah, no, but I think, I'm, I'm wondering else. even if, is it even such a difficult uh, because is it even such a difficult choice? Because the more I think about it, the less I see what's wrong with knight e7. Uh, I, I think yeah, knight e7 is uh, by far uh, the most strategically safe move. You could allow bishop c6 bc before in some version, in some circumstances, but you know, it's so, so hard for a human to assess where it's okay. I would think that maybe if you get f6 e5 somewhere um, and you get good counterplay in the center, you could uh, afford this weakness on c6. But uh, why bother sort of, um, why bother? So if I play knight e7, I mean, you will have to play slowly, I guess. You'll play a move like a4 maybe first. Question will be, by the way, if white will trade light squared bishops with bishop d3 or not. Yeah. Because Again, if with, I... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was going to say, with colors reversed, that's a huge victory, right? But uh, here with white, maybe. Yeah, because the good thing for white after bishop d3, uh, bishop takes mm -hmm. d3, knight takes d3, I managed to get my knight on a great square. And of course, young mm -hmm. cultured, uh, cultured player plays knight e7. Okay. Yeah, nice. And on the board, let's just show this. Uh, it's the dance of the knights, Anish. Whose knights are better placed? Yeah, knight on d3 is fantastic. This knight d3, knight d2. So these are ideal positions for the knights, I think. So uh, it's a very common idea, actually, to go bishop d3 once you have a knight on e5 and not and not not to take with the king, but to take with the knight. Because knight, as I mentioned, is fantastic here. So it controls e5. So, but a4 first. Yeah, to, mm -hmm. a4 first. I like it more. After a6, we, we might... We might go to d3 or we might go yeah. to f1 even more ambitious a6 you know a6 is committal because after a6 i will uh, play with white a5 and maybe knight b3 knight c5 somewhere mm -hmm. so a6 is maybe committal i wouldn't go a6 yeah 
it's normally better not to touch pawns in this structure unless you can kind of force through that minority attack, like you said earlier, with kind of b5, b4. Uh, because if you touch any pawns, you might just leave weak squares. Um, I think that's what people have learned over the last just decade or two. Um, yeah, a4, I like it. Just asking Yan as well. Uh, asking Yan, how is he planning? How is he uh, setting up his pieces? But uh, meanwhile, Anish, it's been a interesting start to the game with the London system. Uh, maybe not all of you as happy with the opening choice, but it has led to a very rich middle game. And uh, I think just while Jan ponders his move, let's go to a short break. We will be back with more action in game six in a few moments. Introducing WorldQuant, the partner of the Champions Chess Tour and Chess.com. WorldQuant is a global firm in the field of quantitative asset management. If you don't know what that is, it's the job of building complex mathematical models that seek to identify market inefficiency. For 2023, WorldQuant Brain is bringing together its International Quant Championship and the award-winning Champions Chess Tour to hunt down the next generation of quant finance specialists. It sounds very exciting. You put your skills in practice in a case competition where you get a real challenge. And I signed up. <laughs> WorldQuant is seeking new talent and new energy, and it's looking at the world of chess to help. Because nobody knows how to analyze a position better than a chess player, right? No quant experience? No problem. So, do you think you have what it takes to compete in the International Quant Championship? Sign up and be the next Quant Champion. Hello and welcome back to the match between Yan Nepomnishi and Ding Liren. 
WorldQuant is an official partner of the Chess.com broadcast of the FIDE World Championship. They're a global firm that builds complex mathematical models to identify market inefficiencies. Now, WorldQuant Brain is bringing together its international quant championship and the chess community to hunt down the next generation of quant finance specialists. Because nobody knows how to analyze a position better than a chess player, right? If you think you have what it takes, register for the international quant championship. Head to go chess.com slash IQC or use exclamation mark IQC in chat. And Anish, we're back with some moves. I see a look on your face. You're not liking the developments here in the game for Jan Nepomnishi making some big and committal decisions. No, it's horrible. It looks horrible. It looks horrible what's, what's happening here. Um, I think he's very unfamiliar with the position because I really don't like uh, what he has done in the last two moves. I think the move a6, as uh, we talked about, I think it's a positional mistake. Because mm -hmm. after bishop f1, if I was coming, I don't think that trading this knight this way is also fantastic because knight on e7, I think, is not a great piece. So maybe I'm, maybe I am uh, underestimating black's potential on the king side, but I really don't think so. I think if I just take, take, play a5, let me pull up the analysis board so uh, we see that. The left position is still with things to move, but here I think Ding will take and play a5. I think it's an automatic. You block this, and then the knight comes to c5. The knight standing marvelously on c5. After that, you can never kick it out with b6. That's why a6 is a positional mistake. And then I will play even b4. I no longer have to worry about the c pawn. It will be firmly guarded by the knight on this file. And oh well, I have pressure on this uh, pawn. The knight on c5 is also pressuring the e6 pawn. I really don't think that knight g6, f6, or anything like that is coming very quickly. And I think black needs that because, well, what else does he? I mean, he just has, I think the position is really like it's a horrible position for black. And it's happened so fast. I, I think he's made one inaccuracy after the other. I think h6 was inaccurate. I think knight e7 was okay, but then I think a6 was inaccurate. And I think knight d7 also is inaccurate. I think maybe the only way to still try and make sense of this move is to just go a5 and or better or worse weaken the b5 square but at least at least keep control of the c5 square mm, well you don't need to go b6 so just yet of course but yeah well even this i i don't like but there is at least potential to eventually go for b5 and uh somehow break this pawn structure open because you after a6 a5 uh i think it's drifting yeah, it feels like dark square domination is imminent. And Jan is pretty much just saying, okay, take my dark squares. And uh, Anish, just to, while we have the board up, just to kind of go a few moves further, I'm not uh, even sure what black plays uh, in this position. Let's say, I don't know, let's move the queen. Uh, once the knight ends up on c5, like you say, uh, there's simply nothing to do about it. Even if black ever captures uh, on this square, let's give a few moves. Um, let's say here, even if black captures, I mean, let's That's even worse. Mm -hmm. here. It's even worse and if you'd never take this uh if you can't take this piece then it's just going to stand here for the rest of time um but david i noticed one thing the king side. Uh, as you were showing maybe i missed something there uh some detail because as you were showing the line i realized after knight d7 queen d7 a5 he will play mm -hmm. queen c7 after knight b3 he has knight c6 of course so this yeah. i have to take some of my words back i missed this detail because now it's very hard to get knight c5 so mm -hmm. I can play like rook a3, queen a1, but well, th that is a little clumsy. And while I do it, maybe you strike in the center with e5. So uh, maybe knight b3 was not accurate. Can we take a move back? Because we yeah. can wait for a knight c6 and then go b4. Maybe here I should play... Um... Maybe queen a4 first? Or... Yeah, then, then the bishop c2 will also. So you'll, you'll need to spend one more tempo. Maybe also a move mm -hmm. like rook a3 or rook e3 first. Because I can start with b4, in fact. Mm -hmm. I can start with b4. And then, and then move them. Yeah, yeah, this is the right way to, to go. Yeah, yeah, this is the right way to go, yeah. Uh, so I, th I think I stick by my uh, assessment. I think Jan did play in an accuracy, but uh, Ding has to... Yeah, Ding has to do it this way. And while he does it, maybe Jan wants to do some rookie 8 e5, some... If, of course, if Black gets some direct play in the center with e5, it could be not so bad for him. So it's, it's not uh, maybe as bad as it looks now, especially if Black plays it very well in the coming few moves. But I'm not sure Black has, uh, Black has this e5 break in a good version here. Yeah, uh, I agree. This seems like it has to be what Jan is hoping for. Still surprising he played it quite quickly relatively because it's so committal. He's basically banking or uh, kind of gambling on the fact that he can break in the center later. 
It's Ding considering anything else. Uh, I mean, starting here just allows a knight capture. I don't think that helps white at all. Um, knight takes d7 looks automatic, uh, to yeah. me at least. Oh, yes, I think Ding cannot believe his luck. So he's trying to double check and he is trying to, uh, to see beyond... Uh beyond what first comes to mind. So because the first thing that comes to mind is that you just take an a5 and knight b3 and c5. Then maybe he thinks, okay, Jan is not a bad player, so he probably has a point. Then he realized maybe it's queen c7 followed by knight c6. Then he realizes, well, maybe I shouldn't go knight b3. So then there is something to think about. And so he's thinking about it right now. Uh, because indeed, uh, of course, it's the things are not too bad for black. He's got this queen c7 idea. White will have to be a little bit creative here about getting the knight to c5. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, I, th I think uh, definitely not something I expected. I thought we, we would have much less action. I thought we, we would have much more maneuvers, much less committal moves, much less trades. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Jan plays something very direct, but uh, very risky, a very, very risky approach, strategically speaking. And uh, I think it's uh, possible to well to explain. I, I think another Carlsbad game where Jan is not... Uh, Jan is not playing the most accurate way. It's, it's a very difficult, complicated structure where you need to have a lot of experience. And uh, I think Ding is uh, a player who is just much more experienced in these positions. Yeah, Ding has been playing these positions since he broke onto the chess scene, while Jan uh, has never really been in his repertoire. We mentioned it in game three when he played uh, D4 as white, he got the Carlsbad and felt like he was playing by hand rather than, uh, yeah, rather than kind of knowing uh, what he should be aiming for. And uh, that's clearly why he went away from d4 in his last white game. And there we go. Ding does capture on d7. He's guaranteed to play a5 next. I think if white waits, then black will play a5 without thinking, Anish. Uh, something you showed uh, a bit earlier. So white's next move. You can pretty much pre-move yeah. at this point, a5. And well, uh, really interesting. Yeah, but, but of course, uh, uh, I already missed Dania. If you play Dania here in a 15 second chess, he, he would probably <laughs> play bishop c2 here. And yeah. after you remove a5, he would take your queen on d1. But, <laughs> so don't remove, please, I guess. Don't remove, uh, but just wait for queen d7 and then play a5. Yeah. This is, yeah, <laughs> this is a world championship and it is over the board, so no pre moves here. But uh, yeah, I'm sure Dania, he'd find ways to win, even if white had this dom uh, kind of dominant knight on c5. There would be ways to break out and uh, switch it around. Somebody uh, says, <laughs> OMG, a 0.02 advantage. Well, unfortunately, I don't have access to computer and I uh, I envisioned this knight on c5. So for me, it seemed like a huge advantage for white. But maybe uh, I've missed a few circumstances because chess is a concrete game. So you, as a human, with uh, we are sort of predominantly run on pattern recognition and we envision uh, positions that are about to come. And sometimes uh, we can miss the details uh, on the road to that. And so I saw a position where I go a5 and I lands on c5. And that position looks really, really dangerous to me for, for black. But of course, uh, maybe the computer points out um, some sort of a some sort of a concrete resource like queen c7 first and then maybe knight c6 quick e5 to break uh, that pawn structure apart and maybe quick d4 and maybe you equalize. So maybe that is possible, but this was just not what I immediately spotted. So. Uh, not sure it's 0 0.02. I think we need a good computer here to to check. Um, and very likely, even if it's equal, it is probably equal because of a very, very concrete sequence of moves. But indeed, Ding for now plays the move a5. That was the uh, only move. Yeah, and it is the type of position that might be equal. But if black is inaccurate, like you say, or if black is just one move too slow, plays a lazy move, then it could turn into a plus one uh, advantage immediately. So um yeah the london system maybe i need to add it to my repertoire i'm liking these kind of slower positions right now you don't play the london system this is meant for you david <laughs> you genuinely think so or of course a... like you you like these 200 move games this is where where it starts <laughs> oh it you heard it here first you very well it's it's the ready it's the ready of 1d4 <laughs> if i start playing it consistently anish i'll start blaming you uh, or my opponents can blame you even yeah yeah i think your opponents will will regret uh, yes they'll be like oh you know our life is no longer the same after the, yeah, david had this commentary with anish one day it's now it's all it's all london no it's uh well i have to say it in uh, defense of the black players like uh there were there were options like early on i pointed some systems where the queen was taking a pawn on b2 so it's possible to try and get these london players out of their comfort zone but uh, if you play a system like this one, where you go C, D, E, D, and just play slow cards, but then yeah, you are up uh, for a long game. And indeed, Jan plays queen c7, so he uh, he had this um, he had this uh, all anticipated. 
So I was a little bit too uh, too harsh there at first. I missed uh, the Queen C7 idea, so I take uh, everything back. And I, I will. We we'll have to wait and see. We we'll have to wait and see. If Ding does get a knight on C5, then indeed what Jan has done will be a mistake. But if Jan manages a quick uh, E5 break and uh, everything will be traded, then Jan's uh, judgment would have been very very deep. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking, Anish, uh, I'm ob obviously from the UK and uh, the two games I've been, or two of the three I've been here for, one was an English opening and now it's a London system. It's as if, you know, the stars have aligned, the chess gods are trying to say something. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the monarchy is, uh, you know, it's, uh, coming for us and uh, yeah, very, very impressive, of course. I mean, uh, uh, it's a generally an interesting topic, you know, the names of the openings, uh, there are some openings are named after uh, countries, some after cities, some after animals. Like there's the orangutan and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it's it, some after players, of course. It's all a very interesting, uh, yeah, interesting uh, topic. And uh, even some openings or variations, they have names, and many strong players don't know these names. Uh, and and that's like a whole yes. There's there's a whole uh, <laughs> culture of uh, giving opening openings names mm. and London and uh, there are even a few that for example the Vienna you have multiple Viennas I think yeah there's in the Queen's Gambit uh, kind of decline yeah. but later accepted and then uh, also in 1e4e5 knight c3 yeah do you wish uh, any openings were named after you Anish I guess we were born in the wrong generation All yeah we were born kind of a little bit taken. late for that exactly everything is already taken everybody already got called dibs on everything so it's hard. Um, I mean, it's a big question, let's say, if Grunfeld contributed the most to the Grunfeld. I have my strongest doubts uh, whether he did. But, uh, well, he was one of the early players to, to play it, and he, he named it after himself. And, yeah, uh, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, Carlsbad, I mean, I, I, I think there was a tournament in Carlsbad, I, I guess, and that's where they played the structures. But uh, you, could, you could safely... Uh, you know, you could you could safely find a player who has contributed a lot to, to these openings as well. And uh, yeah, I don't know what the English have, have done to to get uh, the entire 1c4 named after them. Um, really not sure. But uh, <laughs> but here, here we are. Yeah, there's plenty I could say about that. Uh, <laughs> how we take what we don't deserve. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, either way, that was the English opening 1c4 in uh, in game four. And now it is the London. And uh, yeah, Ding thinking. I mean, there's clearly one plan in the position, right? Uh, White needs a knight on c5. It's just how to arrange it, how to set that up. Uh, I'm also is. wondering about... Oh, sorry, go on, Anish. Uh, no, I just want to make a point that it is a very, very important moment. Um, because as e5 is inevitably claiming, uh, coming, sorry, I'm sorry reading the chat and somebody wrote claim, so I sort of coming as a claiming. But uh, yes, e5 is inevitably coming and then you want to make sure your pieces are positioned in the best way as white so that you can take on e5 and then establish a block on d4 and you don't want your pieces to be in the way. So a big question, let's say you want to go rook a3 before or rook e3 before or queen f3 before, uh, very, very important moment. Maybe like something. I, I maybe Queen F3 actually possible because after Queen F3, if you go Knight C6, E5 is not an option. Maybe you don't mind after Queen F3 even to go Queen G3. Sometimes end game probably is. I don't know who benefits from going into an end game, but White certainly doesn't mind. I think if you get a Knight on C5 in an end game as well. So mm -hmm. a big big moment for Ding here as the natural Knight B3 is met by Knight C6. You have to do one of these moves that prepares before. And uh, now the more I look at it, the more I like the move Queen F3. But my first instinct was Rook E3. So uh, definitely some options there for Ding. Yeah, actually, I was uh, attracted to Queen F3 as well. Uh, I'm not sure how Black meets the threat of, or the idea at least, of getting the Queens off. Uh, maybe we can show what might happen if the Queens do come off uh, in an endgame if we bring up a board. Uh, Queen F3 here. Let's assume Black replies in the way he wants to. Knight C6 attacking this pawn. We have time for Queen G3. And suddenly it's not so easy for black to avoid the queen trade unless you do you really want to play queen d8. Uh, white will play this b4 and knight b3 idea anyway. e5 is not coming, no counterplay. And if you do get the queens off the board, unless black again is quick to strike with e5, I'm not sure he is, then uh, yeah, knight on c5 could spell disaster. I'm surprised the evaluation yeah. bar is not reacting here. It feels no, but, really beautiful for white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I think the, we got trolled there by the chat. Uh, it's not 0 0.02. I now uh, just checked on uh, on a good engine. 
that I'm uh, Cloud Engine that I rented, uh, just to be sure. And uh, White has a huge advantage here after Queen F3. I mean, okay, huge. Uh, like, <laughs> it, how huge can such a position be? But to how big it can be in this kind of position, it is huge. So uh, Queen F3 is the best move. And um, Queen G3, also B4, like after 96, even B4 is stronger. Like, this, yeah. we, don't, we don't need to rush an endgame. We are fine also in middle game. And I love the fact with Queen F3 that I stopped E5. And now mm -hmm. you are really, uh, if you don't get E5, well, you're really in trouble. I'll bring my knight to c5, and I can trade queens. I can also postpone it. I think middle game and the end game both are better for white. So, uh, and I hate your knight on c6, by the way. It's a horrible piece there. Unless you go e5, it, it's the only mm -hmm. way to justify the knight there. Uh, and I'm sorry, I called it your knight. It's not at all your knight. It's Nepos. <laughs> so, I'm glad it's not my knight. <laughs> <laughs> no, after queen f3, uh, black, black is. Uh, like it's much much worse, and mm -hmm. the kind of evaluations that like the the Lila, Lila gives zero point three, which is uh, very very high for Lila. It's like calibrated in such a way that zero point three is a big advantage, and uh, especially in a Carlsbad structure, to get a zero point three by Lila, that is uh, that is really a lot. You have mm -hmm. to do a lot of things wrong, and I think Jan has done a lot of things wrong, a lot of unnecessary decisions, and. Uh, after I think Queen F3 is, uh, is also Dingle played. Like, it's very easy. It's quite obvious to me also that it's a very good move. So Dingle played Queen F3, I think, and then uh, difficult uh, for, for, for Jan. I think he should go Rook FC8 or something like that to at least prevent B4 for now. And then White goes Queen G3. Now I want to bully your Queen away. If you go Queen D8, then I go B4, probably, and Knight B3. And so after Rook FC8, Queen G3, you can then go for the end game, but the end game is very sad. and. It's very early, actually, but I am already going to call it. I think uh, Ding fans are, can get their, uh, uh, well, you know, their heads out, their this whatever trombones or whatever they have, and start uh, prepare for celebrations because I think uh, this is going to be a good day for Ding. The position is very easy to play; it's completely risk-free, and it is totally fitting Ding style. And Jan, uh, well, definitely doesn't. Uh, doesn't uh, like what, what he is going to be seeing in this game. So very optimistic for Ding already. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Ding thinks about his move, let's look back on how he was feeling yesterday after going down in the match 3-2, to two, and how much this bounce back would potentially mean to him. This time, this lose uh, even hurt more than the previous one. Because I thought I was totally... Fine. So, but okay, we have still have many rounds. I hope I can recover from this tough lose. And uh, yeah, Anish uh, Ding saying it there himself. Uh, of course, this game would be huge for him. He's already got a better position, we think. Uh, the type of position that suits him that uh, Jan is maybe uncomfortable in. And are you sticking with your prediction? Big words. Thinking he's going to strike back here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, calling it, you know. I 80% uh, chance that he was going to win. Uh, oh. I, I think, like, Magnus watching this game is just face palming because, you know, he, he's a big, uh, big fan of Carlsbad's. Like, he loves... Uh, I'm not even sure he plays them as well as he loves them. Like, he loves them so much and he's always happy to get a Carlsbad. Sometimes in some complicated cards, but he even uh, can make mistakes. But in the clear cut positions like this one, Magnus really excels when uh, it's all very clear and the post structure is clarified and there is no uh, no murky play on the king side against the king. And when um, it's all about the squares and maneuvers, I think Magnus really understands these things very well. And I think Magnus must be shocked looking at this game, seeing how uh, quickly things deteriorated for uh, for Black here. And, uh, well, he must be loving White's position as well. And uh, I think he's a little bit jealous of Ding sitting there, you know, at the World Championship chair. He wants to, he's thinking today, he's a little bit of a FOMO, I think, you know. He thinks, well, I could also be sitting there against Jan. I could, you know, I could have also uh, converted this position, so. Yeah, the 2021 match could have been uh, a lot more straightforward if uh, Magnus has picked up the London system, potentially. And Earlier, it... yeah. But I think it was straightforward yeah. enough in the end as well. Let's, let's give him credit where it's, where it's due. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps. And uh, it all comes down to this A6 move. You mentioned that you don't like many of Jan's decisions. I just I just hate this one decision to put the pawn on A6. It was so unnecessary. You could have basically the same uh, same position, but with the idea of kicking black, uh, kicking the white knight out of C5 later, if you need to, with B6. It just feels like putting all your pawns on light squares, just strategically, just 
was horrible for Yan. And there we go, Queen F3, what we thought was the strongest move from Ding, really powerful stuff, multi-purpose, and he gets up. I think Yan maybe now will start to realize the damage he's done yeah. uh, to his position. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, he will, he will. He he has a uh, good chess understanding, of course, when he's unfamiliar with the position and his impulsive style, he is able to make a mistake. Um, but with understanding that he possesses, it will dawn on him I, if it already hasn't, uh, what, the, that uh, what he has done is, is wrong. When you mentioned the one mistake, A6, I, I could uh, argue for, uh, you know, a second one here because, in fact, you can even here, if you pull up the analysis board, we can, after a6, bishop of one, we could have then played a5 with black. And uh, it really wasn't the end of the world. For example, the computer also doesn't hate it so much for black. The weakness of the b5 square is a lot less significant than that of the uh, c5 square, because here after b6, if you put, let's say, the bishop on b5, you will never be able to attack my pawns. I can play b6, I can free my rook, potentially for uh, some action on some uh, file somewhere at some point later on in the game. And uh, here, your knight doesn't have the access to c5 square. My pawns are nicely protected. You don't have, uh, well, before is not tempting, nor is c4 weakening d before square. So uh, this is a very decent setup for black. I would rather have the pawns, of course, on a7, b7, keeping flexibility and keeping also the minority attack uh, as an option. But this is definitely not the end of the world. While after a6 and then going knight d7, I think this really is a second uh, mistake. But Yes, of course, a6 was played with the wrong idea, so you could definitely say that a6 was the main inaccuracy. I would also say that, of course, for example, the move a6 was unnecessary, but it was not such a big deal as um, as this a6 move uh, move was. And yes, basically, a, a sequence of decisions, uh, each probably with the wrong plan in mind, uh, led Jan uh, to be un, in a significant disadvantage here. And uh, he will realize after queen of three, which he probably missed, um, that situation is very difficult, and I don't know what to suggest for him here. <laughs> and I really don't know what to suggest for him here. But, but uh, yeah, things are not looking good because besides the position objectively not being very good, it's just stylistically it fits Ding so much. Like I could when I when Ding played a queen f3, I, I told you that he will do it. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Ding, I know his strengths. In a position like that, like if I understand that queen g3 is best. I know Ding understands that Queen G3 is best. Like I, I, there's certain things like I trust, uh, I trust Ding uh, with, and uh, converting a position like that is something I trust him, uh, trust him on. Mm -hmm. How would you put that style into words? Anish, you mentioned it's this feeling. You just know you kind of get this instinct that uh, he's loving things. But I mean, a lot of uh, the viewers will know him as a dynamic player. He's won some beautiful games in his career, but also strategically, he's just extremely strong, right? Yeah, I think so. What what is happening here is uh, it's a position with a fixed pawn structure. Uh, so uh, when a pawn structure is fixed, you kind of know where the pieces belong. So Dink very quickly realizes the knight belongs on c5. He very quickly realizes that e5 is black's only pawn break. And uh, once he you establish all these uh, things, and there there is nothing complicated. There is no counterplay against the king. There are no dynamic factors. The, the factors are very static. The ideas are very clear cut to a player of a level like Ding. And then it's just a matter of uh, considering options. And uh, one by one, there is rook e3, there is rook a3, there is queen f3. And very quickly, you see that, well, rook e3, rook a3 allows e5, queen f3 does not. And that's already enough to make queen f3. So, uh, and then you also, as a bonus, you know this queen g3 idea and all that. So uh, it is really a very easy move for uh, someone that there is a position who is a positional player and i think ding is actually predominantly a positional player mm -hmm. he can calculate extremely well and he has had some beautiful tactical victories as well but uh, in my own experience against ding he is a great positional player especially in uh, typical d4 type positions so we speak now cosmos structures we speak the catalan kind of uh, situations um, the, this this type of pawn structures he's familiar with and he knows where the pieces belong and uh, yes now he He's thinking, and uh, Jan just played rook fc8. That's a good uh, good move, of course, um, trying to prevent b4. And this is where I suggested queen g3 going for an endgame. Mm -hmm. Is that the only approach? I guess the white knight can start trying to hop into c5 already. Um, don't well, 9 b3, 9 c6, right? 9 b3, ah. 9 c6 was always the issue. Um, okay. Tricked me there, Anish. Yeah, the move order may be important. So uh, offering the queen swap, offering the queen trade makes a lot of sense right now. Um, let's just put that on the board, maybe. Um, it, was, it was the first move that yeah. came to my mind, knight b3. 
but that plays knight c6 and I'm tied down to this weakness on a5. Well, details, they're important. And queen g3, now you just retreat and still stuck, slightly at least. Uh, although knight c5 here, maybe. Knight uh, a5 and b4. B4. Ah, okay. Mm. Got to calculate that. Yeah. Got to calculate. B6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, b4, b6, important, yeah. Oh, and it's fine, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's it's fine. No, no, but but you know, already when he played Queen F3, already now, like knight between knight C6 already was a thing mm -hmm. after Queen C7. So I'm pretty sure that uh you know after Rook C8, the only question I, I have, so you you wanna play B4 and Knight B3 because Knight B3 is Knight C6. You can play B4 because the pawn is hanging on C3. Mm -hmm. So you could somehow not want to go for an end game if you are white. Maybe like you could go rook e3 now. Mm -hmm. Which is, rook on e3 is not harmonious. I can move the bishop away and then knight f5 is coming. I don't like rook e3. Uh, it really, I don't like it. But don't make me make this move, please. <laughs> I also don't like rook ec1 because after rook ec1, I uh, allow potential e5. Maybe not now because takes rook e1 and rook e7. But the rook kind of belongs on the e file in general. So I don't like rook ec1 either. So queen g3 is really by far the most harmonious way of getting my way. And okay, that it involves a trade of queens. I think I would be okay with it. Maybe Ding is so ambitious, he thinks that trading queens is uh, making life easier for Jan, but I don't think so. I think an endgame is also fine. But well, maybe, maybe middle game is more ambitious because in an endgame, maybe black will just stand passive, play knight c6, rook c7, rook e7, then prepare e5. Maybe black can hold this way, maybe. Yeah, uh, so he could the, he could uh, not play queen g3 because he is too ambitious. But queen g3 is so nice because if you go queen d8 after queen g3, by the way, then I really have everything I want. I just go b4. And then I'm just coming with the knight uh, via b3 to c5. Okay, I don't see. Maybe uh, I don't know why the bar is not uh, completely on the white side here, but uh, to me it looks very good. Yeah, I'm wondering if there are any tricks here, like, I don't know. Bishop c2 or what? Bishop c2, yeah. And then... yeah rook, e c, rook e c1, let's say. Rook e c1, yeah. Yeah, I'm kicking you out. Yeah, that's annoying. I wanted you to use the other rook so I could come back this way, maybe. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't see anything here. Knight f five. You just move the queen somewhere. Um, queen probably f three. Yeah. And yeah, this guy is trapped. You probably win a pawn. You have some cheaper, like queen g five, rook c two, knight d four, maybe. <laughs> wow. Just to put that on the but board. But I don't know if it's. I'm not sure if it's. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if the if result of position is not lost, I go c d, rook c two, knight yeah. d three, knight c five. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Still looking good for white, but yeah, it's uh, some considerations there, of course. Uh, queen g3 by far the most harmonious. Let's see, maybe rook a3. But the problem with rook a3 is that after b4, I still don't threaten knight b3. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, rook a3, maybe I threaten knight b3, knight c6, rook e a1. But again, I doubling on the a file, this is just it's such a pity to do that. The rooks don't belong there, and to spend so much effort to establish knight on c5 while you'll get hit on by e5 somewhere, I don't think that's necessary. So let's let's see. What are the other options that you would uh, consider here with white? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, queen g3, like you say, is so natural. I was attracted to this one, but obviously looks uh, clumsy after knight c6. So I'm less inclined now. And yeah, all the rook moves, like you say, they kind of have drawbacks to them. So uh, queen g3, I would, yeah, I would bank a lot of money on right now. But uh, of course, there are options. I don't think there's a need to rush. You can play like h4 or something first if you really want to. But um, yeah, decision for Ding. Actually, h4 takes away the option of queen g3. So I'm exactly. not so keen Yeah, I'm not one. sure it's a useful move. Mm, difficult. And yeah, the reason I asked about Ding is because uh, when I first played him, I think back in 2016 at the Olympiad, um, our coach at the time, the England coach, he was like, okay, just don't get in any dynamic position. Just get something slow and strategic against him. And I was like, wait, are you sure? Because he's pretty good there too. Uh, but yeah, that's yeah. what I managed to do. And I managed to hold. Um, but yeah, it's just, where do you target him? He's so universal. And especially here where he's going to be loving life, going to be loving his position. Queen I G3. think the the main weakness of Ding right now is his black repertoire. I think his, uh, his opening repertoire with black is vulnerable. He's, uh, he's not as deeply prepared as some of his colleagues as we had seen so far in the match. For example, yesterday he was um, out of book at some point, didn't know... Um, the plan, the right plan in that position where he could have known it because uh, the position has been played before. So I think mm -hmm. this is his main weakness. Like the concrete knowledge with black is sometimes lacking. Yeah. 
I mean, if we already start like nitpicking and asking why he's not 2900, let's say, yeah, like uh, this is what I mean. This is what I mean in terms of weakness. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, if, like strategic understanding uh, is is incredible. Uh, tactical vision and calculation is also extremely extremely good. So, well, he's definitely one of the best players um, of our generation and of all time, of course, as the chess players become stronger and stronger with more and more knowledge available. So. Yeah, I, uh, I really uh, am wondering uh, here, so I would s circle in between these moves that we talked about. So I think rook c1, rook e3, queen g3, I don't see another uh, useful move. Mm, so I, I would be choosing between one. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say the big question I would have is uh, after queen g3, how big that end game is. Now, of course, white is better. I think that is uh, safe to say, but I... I start wondering, yes, with accurate, not with accurate, with patient defense, how much is it? Is it uh, enough for a win? That said, I still think that uh, as white, you should, uh, we should take the, the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the computer, by the way, likes rook, e rook ec1 more, I see here. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very because sophisticated. The computer yeah, yeah, of course. But I think the computer doesn't really see e5 uh, working out for black anywhere. But as a human, I'll be I'll be a bit concerned by that. Mm. I'll be concerned about allowing e5. Yeah, yeah, I would be inclined to <laughs> agree there. Any just allowing any central activity when your opponent's kind of stuck passive, it's counterintuitive for any human. Uh, yeah, rookie c1. I'm really doubting that will happen. Uh, I saw you pull up the computer there, and uh, what other Ideas is it suggesting? Well, I, it I like... had one idea. I had one idea. I didn't want to say it out loud. Okay. I was embarrassed. <laughs> but I had that idea. And that is to go G4 and then Queen G3. But I didn't want to say it because Whoa. I was a little bit embarrassed of that. But actually, the computer doesn't hate it at all. <laughs> wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that that's not going to happen. It feels... No, no. It's an outrageous. Yeah. feels too much <laughs> giving potential counterplay. Completely. Yeah. completely unnecessary and outrageous. But uh, after G4, Queen G3, Queen G3, 8G... Mm -hmm. You have improved your pawn structure quite a bit, and you kicked away the bishop from a five, which is an achievement. So it actually is like it's actually sensible, but it's just yeah, I, I, you, your hand cannot make that move here. Mm -hmm. It's just not uh, not it. And the computer also suggests a very deep move, rook a two. Okay, that is extremely deep, and well, let's let's try to understand. So let's make these moves on the board, perhaps. So rook a two. Bishop g6. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. It's basically, I think I think it's like a waiting move, yeah? He's mm -hmm. just waiting. Because now after bishop g6, I have knight b3, knight c6, queen g3. Can we make, not bishop g6, can we make some other move? Just for... Uh, okay. Bishop g6. For purpose. Bishop h7. Can we make bishop h7? Yeah. Um, knight b3, knight c6, queen g3, queen d8. And now what is the difference? Uh, why is your rook ah, on no, a2? The computer just... Very mysterious. Computer just, yeah, strange. Okay, Ding played rook a3, the much more human version of that, mm -hmm. that same move. Very nice. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, dislike this move so much. Uh, but uh, you know what I didn't like about it? I Yes, I didn't like the fact, oh, but I don't want to go before. I want to go knight b3 now, of course. And after knight c6... Let's say I wait what again. I want? Yeah, what, what, what do I want? No, knight c6. You queen time queen d8. Is it as simple as just playing this move just to protect one, yeah. and then jump in? Yeah, no, we talked about it. We talked about. It. I, I said that I don't like doubling on the A file, but you know it's a temporary measure. Mm -hmm. So you maybe double on the A file, then afterwards you plant the knight. You go before you are, you go back with the rooks. Yeah, I'm just just I was just concerned that while I do this, uh, E five will will come at some point. E five break will come at some point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a matter of choice. Matter of choice. I think my my default would be to go Queen G three. My default would be to go queen g3 because I'm okay with end games usually, and I also don't mind uh, often to, you know, to, yeah, to simplify somewhat. Uh, I'm not terrified if opponent gets drawing chances, but uh, Ding needing a win and feeling smelling blood, he uh, plays much more ambitiously, and well, very possibly it's a better better choice. So we'll let him uh, have that. Yeah. Already you see a line, for example, uh, passing by, by the way, which, which is exactly what I don't like. It's like bishop c2. I like bishop c2. Yeah, and just... after rook to c1, yes, uh, bishop goes back to g6. Uh, white goes b4. And then black can strike in center with e5. 
And mm-hmm. with the rook being on a3, uh, slightly a clumsy, I feel this can slip away and black can equalize here. So this is the kind of things I'd, I'd be worried about as white. But well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah, and it feels like this is the moment that Jan will have a long think. He knows what's coming. The white knight is coming in to c5 in the near future. And while he ponders what to do next for black, let's have a short break. We'll be back shortly with more action from game six of the 2023 FIDE World Championship. Yes. What is a chess dynasty? Unceasing dominance, move after move, again and again and again. We have a oh. resignation, we have history. He is the five-time FIDE world chess champion. But a chess dynasty can also be cruel. 
It forces most to defer their dreams until next time. If there is a next time. It's losing. Oh my god, did he just blow Yeah, he did. I'm blown away. The game is over. As the chess world turns to Kazakhstan, the Magnus Carlsen dynasty is set to close. The FIDE World Championship is finally up for grabs. For two chess superstars lying in wait, until next time is now. Jan Nepomneshi has methodically done what he needed to do to get another shot at the title. The pressure to seize the moment this time rests heavily upon him. Jan Nepomneshi once again holds a one point lead in the 2023 World Championship match. What an incredible bounce back. Ding Li Ren knows firsthand what the end of this dynasty means. An unexpected chance to make history. Can China's best turn his good fortune into eternal fame? Yan is just gonna smash through on the king side. Ding didn't have a good day. This is all over. And what a game, I have to say. The legacy of this championship spans across centuries. It reads from the names of chess giants. For the first time in a decade, a new name will raise the trophy and be etched into chess history. It's the 2023 FIDE World Championship, whose name will next be called champion. Hello and welcome back to game six of the 2023 FIDE World Championship between Ding Loren and Jan Nepomniachtchi. As we see in front of us, uh, Jan has just made a move and Ding is now thinking. It's move 19 for him after this turn and Anish, we're still liking White's position. Yeah, of course we do. Of course we do. Um, I think the big question is here in general in this position is how how do players assess Queen G3 trade? Because I start getting a suspicion that Jan is not uh, fear does not fear the trade, and Ding does not want to do it because I think the Bishop on G6 is potentially vulnerable to Queen G3. So I envision a position where the Knight comes to C5, Black Knight goes to C6 A5, and then I have this Knight E6 idea when the Queen is on G3. Mm -hmm. So I think simply uh, Jan is okay with Queen G3. He will just trade the Queens and hope to sit it out, and Ding will uh, probably also not try to do that. So maybe maybe the position is. Uh, yeah, it's uh, more complicated than this. And then the question is, if Ding doesn't want to play Queen G3, then what will he do? Yeah, I guess the other option, he's just made a move, Ding. Uh, it is Knight B3. I was about to say, yeah, the other option is Knight B3 first. And only then, if uh, the Black Knight starts putting pressure on the A5 pawn, uh, like we were examining before the break, then the decision, Queen G3 or not Queen G3. I'm not sure whether we need to rush that with White. Um, I think he's just delaying making that uh, making that call. We haven't seen many end games in Ish. Uh, I'm just thinking back in the match. Other than maybe you could argue game one, we haven't seen many kind of long protracted maneuvering positions without the queens on. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, I think both players are very very good. Uh, but having a passive end game, I think the nature of uh, having a passive position it doesn't shouldn't shouldn't fit Jan's style because he's. Opening repertoire has been um, neither of and the drag, uh, sorry, neither of and Grimfeld for a very long time, and these kind of openings they don't lead to passive positions very often. They lead to often they lead to worse positions, but uh, the worst positions with active counterplay. So I cannot imagine Jan being uh, happy with the passive defensive setup. So I think an endgame with Queen G3 is welcome indeed. Knight B3 first is a good way to start. Jan will play Knight C6. That's a given there. The question then is, uh, does Ding then go Queen G3? And then indeed, the Queen D8 met, is met by Knight C5. I think after Queen G3, Jan will take an endgame. Because when you are worse, um, as a defender, you often have a tendency to welcome a peace trade, even when sometimes the peace trade uh, is harming your position. But in particular, in this case, I think it shouldn't harm your position. I think a Queen trade is, uh, is OK. Maybe it brings Black a little bit closer to, to a draw. but. Yeah, still a lot of suffering in the end game. The other question is, of course, maybe Ding does not want to play Queen G3, but then I don't know which move. This Rook E2 A1 move, it's a very clumsy one. I don't think you, you'd want it. I think then E5 will uh, likely come at a good moment. Yeah, uh, I agree. 
it does feel like uh, Ding maybe objectively should also go for the end game, but uh, maybe we should examine Anish. We've been quite kind of harsh and quite down on Black's chances. Uh, how maybe we should uh, check out how both sides will set up once the queens do come off. Um, let's jump into an, an, an analysis board, sorry, and um, yeah, knight c6. I'm expecting as well. I don't see anything else at all for Black. You can maybe flick in bishop e4 if you really want an end game, uh, but uh, queen g3. Do you think, firstly, is Black going to take on g3, or is Black going to allow the capture on his terms on c7? Oh, but if you allow the capture, I could also not capture. I could go knight c5 <laughs> next, I guess, uh -huh. and uh, go b4. Uh, though I do think that possibly I don't mind to take on c7. Um, I think mm -hmm. you take on g3, probably you double my pawns, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. I felt the rook should come to e7 because I think defending the b7 pawn from the side uh, is uh, the most multi-purpose way because you don't want to be defending it from a7, God forbid, or uh, from b8 where the rook is passive. I think rook on e7 does a good job at or c7, yeah, or um, a good job at protecting the pawn and also potentially uh, contributing to black's play. Mm -hmm. The knight should probably land on c5, so we can play knight c5. Black could in position like that, in structure like that, sometimes black could consider a move like h5. Uh, to try to, uh, it's to try to cramp the g3, uh, g2 pawn. In this particular case, I don't like the bishop on g6. Um, I'm even wondering after a move like bishop e2, how you're going to deal with it. But if you had the bishop on f5, you could go h5, g6. Well, there would be an issue that the bishop would also have little squares there on f5. Mm -hmm. But if the bishops didn't, ex like if the bishops were not on the board, let's say that you you do want to play h5. This is the this is the standard thing that white wants to play g4 and black wants to play h5 to get the pawn somehow more mobile. Uh, so if h5 is not going to happen, then maybe let's make a move like rook e7. Yep. And here, does white yeah. want to play b4 like they did in the middle game? I'm not so sure because it's it's nice to have this option later uh, mm. of attacking this pawn. Oh yeah, good point, good point. Indeed, you have the rook b3 idea, which I didn't see. And maybe even rook b3, rook b6, and mm -hmm. then b4. If, so, uh, um... of course, you need rook e1 first. And before rook e1, maybe you you might want to go move like f4 to, to slow down e5. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, yeah, maybe you can play f4, and if black plays rook a8, which I'm not sure is a good move, maybe rook ac8, a little bit closer to... Because now rook e a1, probably very tempting, which as mm -hmm. you mentioned. Rook e a1, as you mentioned, yes, and rook b3 next. Um, black probably will go for some f6 to to keep e5 in in reserve. Then let's... Mm -hmm. Do you do your rook b3 move, or...? Uh, yeah, I want to. I see a pawn. I'm going to try and... Rook c7, let's say. Mm -hmm. My f1 yeah. bishop, I rather had on maybe f3 at this point also, but okay, let's let's say because now I think e5 is potentially potentially coming. I just realized as well in this position, uh, there's also maybe some tactics with knight takes b7. Oh, nice. Whoops, <laughs> nice. I just saw yeah. the evaluation bar go up slightly, so it must be a tactic. Uh, it must be this one just to show and the skewer. Uh, nice. But either way, yeah, it feels like this is a lot of pressure for white. Yeah, the bar's happy. Um, no, definitely. Uh, definitely pressure. And uh, oh, okay. Actually, what I didn't realize is that in the uh, uh, end game, because I was going for mm -hmm. b4, rook on a3 is actually kind of useful, right? Because you have this rook b3 idea. So mm -hmm. I thought uh, white will go knight c5 and b4, and rook from a3 has to go back to a1. But now that you mentioned rook b3 idea, then I, th I kind of like the move rook a3. Like even for an end game, it could be a useful move. And yeah. bishop g6 is not. So maybe the inclusion of rook a3, bishop g6 benefits white. So maybe Ding has played it well. Yeah, yeah, we of course. yeah he's happy with the endgame, of course. No, no, he's happy with the endgame. He just wanted a better version. He just wanted a better version of the endgame. Yeah, he's so in tune with all these little finesses. It's impressive. Uh, queen g3. And sorry, in this position, queen g3. And yeah, I don't like actually the way that Jan has set up his rooks. If he knew an endgame was coming anyway, then... Maybe a rook on e7 already would have been nice. Mm. There's a rook a8, perhaps, yeah. Or rook a8, exactly. Uh, I guess he wanted to keep the option open, maybe of late to playing b6 as black, so he kept the rook on a8, um, just in case it comes to the b-file. But queen g3, okay, he's very quickly avoided uh, any queen trade. Queen e7. What do you mm -hmm. think of that? Again, feels awkward, but maybe necessary. 
yeah but i uh i do like it because i like the like i was i'm obsessed with this e5 move because i think this is black's only source of counterplay mm -hmm. and so i like this move queen e7 i uh, i think after knight c5 he wants to go e5 mm -hmm. and i think the e5 well it, it gives him some counterplay so uh, i like this move i like this move I, I didn't see it somehow. I assumed Queen D because I was obsessed with uh, this A5 pawn. But uh, now that I realize that E5 is possible, uh, I start liking his uh, position again. Now, uh, if we go back to position earlier, Dink, of course, could play Queen G3 when the Knight was on D2. So he could have gone before Knight B3. Now, like the way Dink has positioned his pieces is still a little bit disharmonious. So I'm uh, overly sensitive to these things. and I, I would have preferred queen g3 directly because now rook a3 knight b3 look a little bit odd and knight c5 is met by e5 so you, you can't have it all of course against yes against a player like Jan, you can't have it all the bard always says that e5 is wow. rubbish but i don't know why what are we missing here there must be something tactical perhaps or maybe, or maybe e5, is, maybe just b4, and let's say e4 is not an achievement. Or I, I thought e4 mm. is definitely an achievement. Yeah, it's not at all. Evaluation yeah. bar is really loving this for white. Um, oh wow! No, I mean, I, to I, do with f3 immediately. Ah, even that. Just yeah. before black gets time for f5, because mm, mm, this is hanging. You don't even have f5. Yeah, and also knight on c6 is hor horrendous. Uh, it's it's a horrible piece, and mm. uh, indeed, maybe f3 is also a problem. Maybe f3 is a problem, yeah, because in general, I think jumping with a pawn from e6 to e4 is an, is an, uh, is a success, but here, yeah, everything is very clumsy. The circumstances are against black. The bishop on g6 indeed is um, not allowing black to play f5. Can we just, for arguments, can we just play bishop h7 uh, and pass and f5? I just want to see how the computer evaluates this position. Let me play like rook a2 or something and f5. Rook a2, that's yeah, quite a yeah. useful pass for it. Yeah, but f5, like let's get f5. Like how bad is this? Still very bad, wow. yeah. Mm. But it's not obvious for a human that this is bad. Uh, I've got to say. Not, not, not. Yeah, to me, not so. I mean, I and I, of course, I understand Dwight can be much better here because of the knight. Mm -hmm. But I feel that getting e4 and f5 would be an accomplishment uh, for mm -hmm. Black. A tremendous accomplishment, uh, creating could, uh, a lot of counterplay potential. I could understand if White's bishop was like on b3, for example, but it's still very far from there. Um, this rook, it's not sure where it goes. It's not mm -hmm. clear. No, not clear yeah, to me can, what's the what's the issue. Uh, you like can imagine black playing like king h8, g5, f4, just trying pawn storm counterplay. But uh, do we think Jan's going to go for this? Because potentially, I mean, this looks very strong for white. The more we look at it, especially kind of uh, the tempo up version that we had. Yeah, there. exactly. No, the problem uh, is the tempo position. up version. Yeah, yeah. No, the problem is that I, I was just I was just curious, like how bad is this idea in general? But uh, of mm -hmm. course, that in the tempo up version, uh, we're doing probably much better. Can we just take a look at the position after knight b3? So after knight c5, can I go knight takes a5 or not? This was the other question I had. Wow, knight takes a5. Feels like something should be lining up here and sure. this bishop's sure. a bit loose. Because uh, the, pin is, but... the pin, is on, pin is in my favor. After knight takes e6, yeah. I can move my a5 knight and you are the one pinned actually. Although I can wow. play rook a1, yeah. a, rook a1 simply. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now, 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 and now it's uh, back at you, yeah. yeah. Maybe knight c6 was premature instead of knight c6. What, knight, what if instead of knight c6? What move to make? Knight c4 or? Knight c4. Rook c6, rook c6, rook c6, rook c6, rook c6 maybe? Rook c6, yeah, rook c6, yeah. Rook c6. Yeah. You pick it up while it's pinned uh, to the rook. Wow, this is getting idea. complicated, yeah. This is the idea. Knight c5, knight a5, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rook a5, b6, of course. Rook a5, b6, of course, being the point. Mm -hmm. Yep. Double attack. Stuff. Subtle stuff here. Wow. So actually, a uh, hidden trap for Ding, potentially thought it might be mm -hmm. the other way around for Na uh, for Yan. But uh, yeah, really clever move, queen e7. Knight c5, knight takes a5. Yeah, it's not an obvious cheaper, yeah? Knight a5, not obvious. Mm -hmm. And especially yeah. after knight a5, knight e6, you can see knight c6, rook a a1. You can miss rook c6 there if you don't have the bar with you brought to the game. Mm -hmm. Do we think it's time uh, this rook has done its job maybe on a3? Is it time to go back just to keep this one defended uh, in some of those lines? Oh yeah, uh, wonderful moments to, to drop the rook back. 
Uh, let's do that. About these let's do that. Little yeah, details. Yeah. Let's do that. Excellent. But then maybe black has time to protect this bishop so that knight takes e6 is. Oh, the knight takes e6 remains. Issue. It remains an issue yeah. because I will then collect the yeah, the, the knight on a5. Let's show the difference here. Knight takes a5 is less effective because we can take and. Uh, this position is still horrible nice for, for black. Still nice, yeah, because e6 is uh, very weak and e5 squared is very nice for the rook, yeah. No, this is uh, still very good. Knight c5, knight a5 is a, a little trap, I guess, that Dink should probably avoid. Rook a1, probably a better move, but, well, still, uh, going rook a3, rook a1, back and forth, like, uh, you feel like as though maybe black gets some time, black gets some time to come up with some defensive resource, such as, you know, knight a5 in the right version or e5 in the right version. It seems that e5, more often than not, is not really working. Uh, but uh, Jan might come up with, with some defensive idea. So far, he's uh, already yeah, come up with this queen 7 move. He might come up with some concrete defensive idea. He's a very concrete player, it seems, after all. Yeah, solving all those problems with these tricky tactics, uh, Jan. And uh, while we wait for Ding to make his move, let's learn more about the topsy-turvy path that Ding Loren took to get here. Ding Liren's unpredictable path to this year's FIDE World Championship was born from the right combination of good fortune and persistent gameplay. Ding's journey to Kazakhstan almost never got started. Travel restrictions in China prevented him from qualifying for the candidates, the gateway tournament to the World Championship. But when a spot unexpectedly opened up, Ding ground away to earn the vacated seat and punch his ticket to Madrid. His foot in the candidate's door, Ding struggled in the first half of the tournament, failing to earn a win and falling to the eventual winner, Jan Nepomnishi. But that's when the magic began. In the second half, Ding began to turn things around, starting with a resounding win over Jan Kshistov Duda. We have a victory for Ding Li Ren, and his candidate's chances are not gone at this time. Ding then continued his momentum with back-to-back -back wins over Richard Rapport and Fabiano Caruana. In his final match of the tournament, Ding squared off with Hikaru Nakamura in a battle for second place. With rumors suggesting Magnus Carlsen might step down as champion, second place at the candidates now had an entirely new meaning. Needing a win, Ding took advantage of a missed opportunity by Hikaru on move 38 and worked steadily from there to secure the victory and second place. The second half of the tournament has been his four wins in seven games. While his runner-up finish at the candidates was certainly an accomplishment, Ding left Madrid without a seat at the World Championship. That all changed later that summer when Magnus announced he would not be defending his title. With the five-time champion out of the mix, Ding's second place finish at the candidate suddenly became a golden ticket to Kazakhstan with the rare opportunity to cement his name amongst the distinguished list of FIDE world champions. Much like his opponent, Ding chose to skip most of the high-profile classical events over the past few months and instead selected to immerse himself in his preparation to face Nepomnishi. Time will tell if that approach and Ding's string of good luck and competitiveness will earn him the most famous title in classical chess. And uh, Anish, we talked about uh, Ding's journey on previous days, but it's been so unique, his path to this world championship. In some ways, it feels like it's a fairy tale. It's written in the stars, everything going in his uh, favor. and. Do you think he's going to make the comeback? Is this title uh, his destiny? Yeah, uh, in indeed. It will all come down to whether he will finally get it or not. The journey to the World Championship is very difficult, but only the ones that make it, you know, will write their name in history. And uh, I think um, the circumstances so far, they have been uh, difficult for Ding, but uh, the fortune, when it, it matters, always smiled his way. He... Uh, wasn't able to play a lot of tournaments. He missed, for example, the FIDE Grand Prix tournament because of visa issues. He missed out on a lot of tournaments because of um, the lockdown in China, the COVID lockdown. He also struggled a lot in the online competitions where everybody played in uh, much more favorable time zones. He had to play always in the, in the early, early in the morning, basically at night. Lots of things were going against him. But 
when it mattered, things really quite the opposite worked out in his way. He, of course, got uh, uh, into the candidates tournament. Um, he got uh, second place there, which never is enough. But in this particular year, it was enough to qualify five for the match as Magnus decided to, to skip. Now, Magnus had decided to skip, you know, this year, not any other year where Ding wasn't the second. So it's it, he was very uh, lucky in some sense there, but it will all come down to this event. If he will be able to, to win and become the world champion, it will certainly be a miracle. Uh, miracle, <laughs> not, in, not in the sense that it's uh, in, in a way to take any credit away from Ding, but in the sense that so many circumstances have really worked out in his favor that uh, he even got that opportunity. But if he is not going to win this, then um, then you know the fairy tale uh, will not will not have the that happy end um, that it that it uh, deserves. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see. I think a comeback today is likely. But even if he comes back in this game, still a very long road ahead. And um, yes, the match uh, is just a crazy match. Uh, so many twists and turns. The players, um, s such different players, have the, each of them have such different strengths and weaknesses. And it's just very hard to predict whether Ding will finally take this one home or not. But as, as for this particular game, uh, looking things are looking good for him, although there are some challenges this position as we've, we've seen knight c5 knight takes a5 a big a big resource there for Jan. but uh, overall it's definitely a, a favorable outcome of the opening for ding and he couldn't have hoped for a better position in the modern day when um modern day in era where black players are so well prepared Jan is so well prepared for the match to get a position uh, with so many chances so many opportunities so many trumps is not something you uh, you know you not something you complain about yeah, and I've got to admit, I did fear for Ding uh, after seeing his first white game uh, in the candidates that you alluded to, uh, Anish Nepo also, uh, Jan also beat uh, Ding there when Ding had white. Ding lost game two of this match, of course, but last Thursday, uh, he managed to pick up the win with the white pieces in that English opening. Again, kind of uh, cruising here, it feels like, or at least in a dominant position. And Turning that trend, that's uh, that's the key. We talk about the white pieces a lot, but uh, in World Championships, historically, that's been essential. Striking with white, Jan, Jan did it yesterday. Uh, it feels like this is a key game for uh, for Ding. If he can win this one, then yeah, it's a coin toss. Anything can happen in the second half of the match. But if he fails to convert this, it will feel a bit like a defeat. It just feels like everything's mm -hmm. been going in his favor, just like his journey uh, to the World Championship. He needs to finish it off. Um, so... What are you thinking uh, he's going to go for here? We mentioned knight c5. Doesn't look so convincing. Of course, he'll calculate that. He'll come to the right conclusions there because uh, he's so good at that uh, kind of that type of calculation. And rook a a1, I mentioned uh, just before our break. It does feel slightly counterintuitive. The rook only landed there two, three moves ago on a3. So is there any other plan that he could come up with? I don't think black's got a threat. So one or two moves, yeah. luxury to maneuver. Yes, exactly. I I don't think Black has a necessarily a useful move. When you made this move King H7, it didn't impress very much, as you can probably agree. The King on H7 is, just looks a little bit odd. The question though is, um, can White improve the position? Like I'm not even sure Rook A to A1 is such an improvement as I you mentioned this Rook B3 idea. It's now stuck in my head. I I was a big fan of Rook being on A1. I didn't like Rook A3 at all. But um, well, now that the Rook is there, we can try to make the best of it. So we could try to keep the rook there, but I don't know. Like I, I don't think h3 is uh, super useful. I think h4 is somewhat committal. I also don't think it's very useful. Um, so well, difficult choice here for for Ding. And, wow, well, it's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe he's no, but maybe um, I said it's committal, but maybe it's not actually. Maybe it's okay. Yeah, a useful move perhaps. Maybe he can play queen f4 next. And then even g3 is uh, an option to re reinforce the spawn. It's a loft, uh, you know, giving king space is always useful. Maybe h4, yeah, was, uh, was a nice useful move. Uh, I understand Ding. I understand him because he doesn't want to bring the rook from a3 to a1. He wants to, he wants to uh, keep the rook there for potentially using it for, for the b3 square and simply just admitting that you made a move that was not useful. This is just not what people like. You want to be consistent. H4 is the most consistent move. Yeah, and Anish, uh, before we dig deeper into H4, we are seeing a lot of uh, messages from the featured chat about your mug. Is that Magnus? 
Maybe you can show us a bit closer. Yeah, it's Mag Magnus with the U, yeah? Mag Magnus. Magnus, wow. <laughs> Is okay, that, I got uh... it from the legend, it's Legends of Chess, yeah? I already showed the cup earlier. It's Legends of Chess um, <laughs> from back in the Chess 24, uh, Chess 24 days. Is that an intentional uh, use, an intentional choice of Mug today? <laughs> well, you put me on the spot there. You know, I have about uh, 20 mugs I choose from. And uh, every day I choose this mug. So, yeah. <laughs> Either way. Where can we uh... buy this mug? Okay, okay. Well, wait, 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 wait. Just 24. So I, <laughs> I want a percentage of these sales because uh, you guys weren't selling mugs for two years. Now suddenly there are hundreds of orders. I want my... Um, you know, affiliate code. Use the uh, code uh, Anish Champ twenty twenty three for for uh, zero percent off. <laughs> I I feel like I need to up my game now. There's a mug that I kind of want to use, but uh, maybe okay. for the next break I'll bring it if over. Sell some, if you want to sell some mugs or some other cutlery, like it's here's the place, guys. <laughs> it's not for sale. Don't worry. <laughs> it's exclusive. Okay. But either way, I feel like I need to compete with you, okay, okay. Uh, Anish. And okay, H four on the board. What is black going to play? Big question. It's yeah, struggling. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I like that idea. Uh, I like the idea. Uh, when the moment I realized that um, black has no useful move, I started liking the idea of a waiting move. I couldn't see one that looked pretty, but maybe h4 is that one. Yeah, maybe h4 is that one. I, I can go get behind it. The question, so big question is if bishop, if bishop c2 is a thing. Oh, but it's not. So bishop c2 is knight c5, knight a5, knight e6. And now, please don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that um, there's a little threat of queen takes g7. Um... Oh, rook a5 first. Rook a5, b6, knight e6 here, even stronger. Yep. Just to show this on the board, uh, yeah, there's a threat of mate. Even rook, even rook d5, even just to yeah, just to Oof. finish it off. Yeah. Boom. Pin and win. Yeah. Jan already made his move though, so let's uh, let's catch up. Mm -hmm. Rook e8. Okay, the rook left the c8 square. So is knight c5, knight a5 still a thing? Or is it no longer a thing and does he want to go for e5 instead? Big, big question. Um, it's still a thing, I believe, yeah? Let, let's yeah. try. We have to calculate this. Let's uh, bring the board back up. Oh, no, but h, h5 maybe? So Has it changed knight c5, something? knight a5, maybe h5? Oh, sorry, knight a5 you wanted? Well, I think, I think knight a5 is, is gone because of h5, h5 I think. One of the reasons. Wow. And take now. And then rook a5. No, rook a5 uh -huh. first. Rook a5 first. Take here first. Yeah, yeah. Now that was the point. And now and now 96. And mm. now again rook d5. Wow, beautiful geometry here, Anish. And uh you're hitting this bishop. We could see a position like this one and uh take queen h4 is there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. If there wasn't queen h4, you could argue that maybe black can cling on. Queen d6 as well looked like uh, a tactic, mm. but this double attack wins the game. Beautiful stuff. H4. Wow, this is literally an eight move variation, but uh, it's a key detail. The fact that white can throw in h5 earlier on. Uh, so bishop c2 uh, and rook e8. Okay, there was a big difference. Rook e8 was played. Knight c5. So if knight takes a5, does it work? He wants e5. He must Indeed, he wants e5. Yes, yeah. and we are going to have this position, which uh, doesn't look to me optically as bad as uh, the bar suggests. And I can totally imagine a player like Jan or any other top player for that matter. Um, well, apart from some really, like apart from, let's say, Magnus, who is usually like incredible understanding of these kind of positions, but most other top players, I can totally see them misevaluate uh, this yep. position somewhat, somewhat, because I don't think it's obvious that this is horrible for Black. I think e5, e4 feels like an achievement, feels like we're getting some play, we're going forward, and uh, well, I'll, I'll be impressed if Ding uh, will realize that this is not... Not, not something he shouldn't avoid. At the same time, I think he should also go knight five because I'm not sure what other move he can make at this point. What other useful move can he make? Yeah, e5 might come either way, so you might as well kind of post up and put your piece on good squares first. Um, should we try and kind of uh, understand why this is such an optical illusion? Because uh, to me as well, I think if this was a game situation, I would argue that I'd made a huge gain for black. Uh, I'm assuming b4 just to solidify this knight, just to threaten to take this pawn sometimes say e4 again is it just f3 and the structure is good for white is it just you mentioned earlier anish this knight is a bit dead and he's gone in knight c5 we're heading this direction. yeah yeah i i think i think it's the uh 
predominantly the fact that f5 f4 is very far away from happening and that the knight on c6 the knight on c6 that that is a huge uh, huge um, factor i think if you had like a knight on h5 now you could play knight h5 f5 <laughs> I would hope for I would hope the evaluation would be very different, but the knight is so far away from uh, action. Like, where does it even go? At the moment, you go for e4, you release the tension from the center. The knight no longer contributes to e5 and d4 squares. I mean, the knight contributes, but it no longer uh, is relevant because the d4 pawn guards the e5 square. The c3 pawn guards the d4 pawn, and once you go e4, like you get excited, your e pawn gets excited, but your knight on c6. You know, it breathes a heavy sigh uh, because the knight on c6 now is completely uh, left without a purpose. And I guess this is the main factor here that this knight is completely out of play. Probably mm -hmm. that's why black is essentially playing a complicated position. You could say down a piece to an extent. And this is probably why um, it's bad. And I can play rook a2, or switch the rook across, maybe to f2 even. And potentially F E D E bishop c4 can happen, where I pressure the f7 pawn as well. And um, yeah, I, I can see I can see why this is so good. Dink uh, did some calculation before playing knight c5. He was nodding his head a bit. I think the calculation involved knight takes a5. I think Dink uh, also spotted the h5 idea, and he was making sure that it works. Mm -hmm. It was a very very nice idea actually. I think yes, I actually love this move h4. And now that we saw it, it was not even just the abstract. Uh, improving move, but it was a very concrete one as well. So it was a multi multi-purpose move. Very nice. Yeah, that's what this kind of top uh, top elite uh, players they always have these little details. It was not on my radar at all. Uh, just that detail that uh, kind of g seven mate queen takes g seven mate uh, is so important in all these lines for tempo. Uh, wow, nice move by Ding. And what do you think, Jan? We see his body language now. Doesn't look too positive. He was uh, he was calculating clearly a moment ago. Is he looking at e5 now? Was he relying on knight takes a5? Maybe having missed something? Uh, maybe missed this h5 move that we showed? Uh, what could be going on in his head? I think he was relying on e5 um, predominantly. And I think um, he might now start slowly be understanding that this uh, is not as good as it looked to him at first. Mm -hmm. It's always hard to tell. At the same time, I don't think he has another way uh, to play here. I mean, I'm not saying that if IV4 is good, because as we had seen, it's not. But I do think that, especially if you play the game, if you're sitting there, you probably think that, well, you have to make it anyway. Of course, the one advantage of pawn being on e6 compared to e4 is that you have the potential to go e5 with the idea to somehow exert the pressure on the d4 pawn and get some counterplay. Because once you go e4 after that, well, you can no longer go backwards. As we know, as Danny Rensch once mentioned, pawns can't go backwards. <laughs> so it's it's important that um, yeah, you might want to preserve flexibility. At the same time, well, you even have to deal with knight takes e6 issues sometimes. Mm. Maybe not now, but potentially. Could, could black Hard. try and... With a pawn on e5, Anish, and try and leave it there. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not sure how. I was, I was thinking, but how? Like, you're so tied up here. Yeah. Where do you where do you move the queen? You can you need to move the queen away, yeah, to threaten ed. You have nowhere to move it. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, queen f6 Even might run into. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And you win a pawn uh, in some of these lines. Yeah, really unpleasant. And the queen often tied down to this pawn uh, in a lot of variations as well. That's why white's knight is so good. And, and I have a, I have moves here to improve my position. I can play rook a2. Mm -hmm. I can uh, swing to e2, indeed, if needed. At some point after rook a2, d takes e5 becomes potentially a threat. e5 on the board. This is all happening. You know, it reminds me of... Uh, this is Ding. Uh, this is Ding's kind of game. It reminds me of some of a game I lost to Ding. I also did this e5, e4 thing. I also did that. I did that uh, in a slightly different structure, but I also did this e5, e4. And I was kind of hoping that, you know, it will be something. It was a very similar situation where you go e5, e4, and you feel like, you know, you get some space in the center, maybe some attacking potential on the king side. But somehow it is just strategically horrendous for you. Uh, and I remember Ding playing that game extremely powerfully. That was in the Sinkfield Cup. 
It was a brilliant game on his part. He beat me, then he went on to win the tournament and beat Magnus on, on tiebreak. So mm-hmm. um, for those wondering, you know, where, where's Magnus, they, just should, they should also know that sometimes these two players, they beat him as well. So it's, no, uh, it's not like they cannot beat him. And there was one instance where Ding has beaten Magnus in a tiebreak. So uh, I think the Ding, he is sometimes, or actually most of the time, he is able to show this very deep understanding in a position like that, where both sides have different um, trumps. And uh, you can evaluate uh, properly which trumps are more significant and you feel intuitively, but also realize which pieces are better, which pieces are worse. And here, yeah. So we see the bar is uh, in white's favor. It's not obvious uh, at first for uh, to a naked eye that white is doing so well because black has so much space in the center. But I think Ding he has this figured out. He has a he has incredible strategic understanding, and he realizes that he has a wonderful uh, opportunity here. And uh, like you say, Anish, pattern recognition. He's had something similar before, and uh, he'll be feeling confident. Meanwhile, he does move his rook. Wow, rook b three, and uh, we'll be back in a moment to examine the last move that Ding has just played. Wow, okay. I do recommend Meet Up to a lot of my friends that are looking for different things, wine tasting, movies, book club, meet a lot of new people, a lot of new friends, and it will make you more social. from chess.com back in Astana and you know my favorite Olympic sport was always the biathlon you combine cross-country skiing and shooting but here in Kazakhstan it's a little bit different their own version of the biathlon is you make your move and your chess.com game okay did that and then you go getting pushed on a ramp by some kids are you ready Zovai here we go please tell my mom I love her and here we go. Oh, going backwards. Oh, no. Why am I backward? Oh, that's the end. That's the end. The end of Fun Master. Uh, second part of the trip. And scene. They did it much better than me.
Hello and welcome back to game six of the FIDE World Championship 2023 between Ding Laren and Jan Nepomniachtchi. It has been heating up just before we went on break. We were saying how much we liked White's position. Ding, we were expecting him to just keep control, keep a bind uh, with a big advantage, but instead he's gone for something much more direct. We've saw a flurry of moves actually in that break and uh, big changes in this position, Anish. Yeah, it's incredible. You just, uh, you know, go for two minutes, uh, take a small breather and you come back and, the, you know, <laughs> position has changed so much. In fact, Ding has gone for a concrete sequence that we haven't anticipated. We have uh, come to terms with the fact that B4 was a very strong, uh, slow strategic idea with a very uh, counterintuitive sort of uh, way that you allow E4 and then eventually you realize the knight on C6 is uh, completely helpless and all of that. But in fact, Ding had different plans. He had a very concrete idea in mind, which was also why he was uh, nodding his head before. He was calculating something concrete. And we can maybe show what happened. So after knight c5, e5, he played this uh, rook b3 uh, sequence, which is completely forced. And after rook b3, uh, black has to take uh, on a5. Then he takes on e5, so trades uh, a5 pawn for the e5 pawn. Uh, the consequence is very unclear. Queen f6 is uh, the only possible res sensible response. And now it's Ding's turn. I mean, it could it could be a great news for, for Ding and his fans. He might have done something really, really good. But we have to wait and see because we are in the middle of the variation. Uh, the position hasn't clarified yet. And we are yet to see uh, what exactly is going on. We, I can see the bar is still liking white a lot. But I have to say... I need time to understand uh, what's going on here. I think I think uh, Rook A3 is probably probably what he wants to play. I don't see. And I mean, there is some Knight D7 idea there in the air somewhere. But I think what Black has Queen to C6. But I'm not. Maybe we. Yeah. Maybe we jump in, uh, Anish. It's getting complicated. So let's check out some variations on the board. Uh, Knight D7. You mentioned attacking the Black Queen, but she's not quite trapped. Only one safe square, but or kind of one safe-ish square uh, looks good enough. Yeah, I guess no, you could continue seven. this variation. Yeah, but uh, I don't think there's much to continue yeah. here. Yeah, it's just rookie five. Because you can three. take. Yeah. yeah, this is the key detail. And uh, next move, this rook drops. Black emerges the knight up. Uh, you were mentioning also rook to a three in the I think game that is position. the only move. Yeah, I don't. I don't see. Is there an alternative to that move? Do you see one? Not that I see, unless we swap rooks first, but I don't think there's a rush to commit to that. Ah, swapping the rooks first. Yeah, but what is the point to swapping them? If after rook a3, you, yeah. anyway, you're not going to take on e5, are you? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, you, so rook you might. Do you want to take on e5? Rook e5, d5, queen b6. So dubious. I mean, there are some knight d7 ideas, mm. Mm. followed by e6, perhaps. Yeah. Also, there is. I don't need to rush it as well. I have move like B4, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I think positionally, just I'm doing very well as well. I have E6, um, some kingside, uh, kingside attack potential. No, I think Rook E5 is dangerous after Rook A3. But what else? What else? And why is but why is Ding thinking? That's uh, I want to understand. So, what are the alternatives? What is what is he thinking about? Yeah. I'm I'm assuming it's something to do with rook a3. I don't see what else either. Um, knight d7, you can rule out. It's a very forcing that variation we showed. It's very linear, very direct. Um, yeah, I'm struggling, uh, Anish. Maybe he's just kind of fixated on rook a3 and there was something he missed further down the line or initially or that he didn't evaluate. And now he's kind of just rechecking that. Uh, he Possibly. spent a few minutes on the move on this move, but you would have thought that he was... Uh, well, he could have tanked earlier uh, instead of going for this whole line. He was the one who initiated it, right, with b three. Yeah, just two moves ago. Well, I, I assume he missed something, of course, because uh, otherwise he wouldn't pause. But I, okay, let's say you missed something. Okay, you you had a minute already. So I'm just wondering. He spends already five minutes, and well, the time is not like it's uh, running out, but it is precious. Time is precious. I, I'm wondering. Just I just don't see an alternative. I. And rook a3, whatever he missed, um, is nothing dramatic because everything is protected. Uh, I mean, maybe knight c6, he he missed maybe that black can sack a pawn with knight c6 and he's afraid after rook d5 that there's some rook e1. But after knight c6, you have options. You have knight d7 now. If queen has to go to d8, then you can take on e8. You have plenty of... Um, yeah, you have moves here. You have everything under control still. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing to, to 
a bit too concerned about. I, I do H5 and H5. Oh, H5 is a, is a nice one. Um, although, okay, I'll take on D7. It's not like it's the yep. end of the world, but this is a nice tactic. But again, there, there are options. So I, I just don't see, uh, I don't see the, the need to, to waste the time. Maybe he wants, to, yeah, but taking on E8, this is so counterintuitive and so strange. Well, whatever it is. Yeah. Some intermezzo, maybe Queen E3. I'm just trying to look oh, for other Queen ideas. Queen E3, that is the move. Queen E3, yes, Queen E3. Queen E3 is alternative, maybe. Okay, maybe Queen E3 maybe. is alternative, maybe. But I can take and take H4, and then, okay, and then it's some move. Yeah, but it gets complicated. At least that's a move. Okay, okay, because I just didn't see a move, but this is this is a move. Okay, now I mm -hmm. uh, I allow him to think. Okay, he can proceed to thinking. That's fine. Uh, but Rook A3 is probably good. Interesting how the game took a completely different turn. It's now extremely concrete. In general, this kind of game suits Jan. The problem is that if his position is bad, it doesn't matter what kind of game it is. It's the sequence will uh, will lead to a bad position. But Jan finally has something to calculate, at least. Something concrete, because before he was strategically busted. But now, yes, some some action, uh, and it's on Dink to prove. So we'll see. Uh, he didn't, Dink definitely, definitely taking his time here, but... Uh, the bar is still happy, so rook a3 perhaps. Yeah, knight c6, I guess, because okay, knight c4 is. Uh, I can just mm -hmm. take and take on b7, probably. Looks like a free pawn. Yeah, although it will be not so simple, I'll take on e5, play queen b6, or queen b6 first, and then queen b2. Mm -hmm. not... Which way does white take? Yeah, like, I don't know. I was planning with the pawn. pawn. I was planning with the pawn, but then I see queen b6, then mm -hmm. queen b2. Um, well, it's. Not looking clear to me. I can play knight d6, queen b2, rook a5, or rook a4, but, well, I don't know. The a pawn is there. Some, Of course, I have some I have some nice tactical tricks, like e6 and some h5 is in the air. I, I love my knight on d6, queen g3, pawn e5 combination. But, you know, it's a clarified position with limited material, so maybe black has play of their own. Mm -hmm. And ding is tanking, yeah. Yeah, this is a dream for Jan, at least uh, kind of psychologically compared to that passive position that we uh, were expecting for him. And uh, this is the current position. We're expecting Ding to play Rook A3, go a pawn up most likely, but uh, still messy. And yeah, Queen E3, another option, or Knight D7, all these lines. But yeah, big think. He needs to speed up. Uh, I was actually about to say before the break uh, that I was really impressed by Ding's kind of time usage. Just really quick, just trusting himself, kind of upping the pressure, playing nice, sensible moves quite quickly. He's moved 24 now, Anish. He's got 44 minutes to make 16 moves. Should still be fine, right? Yeah, of course. The, for now, it's fine. But um, yeah, if uh, you want, you know, if, if you are rooting for someone in general, it's not like I, I don't have a skin in the game here, but if you are rooting, so if you look at it from the perspective of Ding or his fan, if you're rooting for someone, I think you want to see um, speed and confidence, right? You want to, because the moment somebody thinks this long, you kind of start wondering, well, he missed something. What is he thinking about? You want, uh, yeah, you want uh, more action there. And Ding is clearly taking his time. It could also be a positive side. He might be very optimistic about his position. He might be thinking that it's also, it's time to, you know, to calculate um, a sequence which will lead to a very good position. So he doesn't want to sell it too short. He sees queen e3, he sees rook a3, and he thinks one of them might lead um, to an overwhelming advantage. But I don't know. I mean, I really don't. Uh, I really don't think queen e3 is that tempting, because you can take and take on h4. But uh, well, maybe there is something that bugs him after rook a3. Especially rook a3, knight c6. I think was also was also unclear. No. Mm -hmm. It did get very messy. Um, some of those lines we were showing with knight c4, also knight c6, as you mentioned. Uh, just going back with the black knight and that's going to get the e-file i just really don't like the decision even if objectively uh the computer still says it's a big advantage what is it almost plus one apparently but uh yeah it just feels like lack of control now and like you say if yeah uh if yan gets this just kind of opportunity to strike uh, opportunity to calculate his way out of trouble he will take it he will seize it uh the margin for error is far uh, lower now for ding yeah, a little but, bit disappointed uh, yeah. because I uh, made this whole big speech about how Ding is, uh, you know, with his superior understanding, he is capable of playing before, allowing e4, and, you know, now he didn't back me up there. I feel somewhat betrayed by Ding, but uh, <laughs> that said, I I understand that, okay, this is also a very tempting and it's a very concrete approach, and I think he got seduced by something here, and now he probably realized that what he planned is not so so simple, so he's taking a moment there. Um, 
because of course it's before business it was um, it was not so obvious but i did think that uh, since he was going for this line i thought that okay he maybe he has figured it out but it seems as yes like uh, like every human he uh, he just got seduced by some uh, something concrete there on on the road instead of uh, going for the strategic strategic solution yeah and uh, a few moments ago in the feature chat anish we did see a uh... Kind of interesting statement. Uh, Ding's problem maybe overthinking, and Yan's problem underthinking. Do you think uh, that's a good summary? Yeah, for sure. There are two types of players. There are those who overthink, and there are those who underthink. That's clear. Um, and sometimes you are, you know, it, it happens to you. Both happen to you. Like in my case, I think in my case it's mostly overthinking. In a, in a, uh, yeah, mostly for me it's overthinking. But uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you try to speed up, and then you underthink. So it's it can happen. Jan, of course, is really usually uh, overthinking is usually not his issue. And Dink, yes, of course, he, he does overthink things a lot, for sure. Yeah, He sometimes doesn't trust his intuition very, very often when he's in bad shape. In my Kanzei tournament, where he was uh, not in his best shape, he was not trusting his uh, instincts so many games. Even in the one against me, I played a game with him. And so often it was clear what uh, the direction uh, should be and so often he would um, start thinking for a long time and make a move that was clearly not uh, on our radar on both of our radars at all but he just kept going deeper and deeper and started to overthink and came up with these weird moves that were also not very good so Dink definitely prone to overthinking when in bad shape and having lost two games in this match we cannot yet speak of Dink's good form he has to prove it still and uh, yeah he might start overthinking here but let's give him a benefit of the doubt. He has uh, still 40 minutes. The bar is with him. And uh, let's see what move he will um, he will make. Maybe we can take a look at the engine uh, lines here to see how they evaluate. Oh, the engine actually really likes rook a3. And it says it's the only move uh, to, to maintain the advantage. Queen a3 is uh, liked a lot less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as someone who's prone to overthinking, I do uh, empathize a lot with Ding. It's one of those positions you can certainly get kind of too far down that rabbit hole, you can get carried away with calculation when at some point you just need to kind of take yourself out of the position, as you say, Anish, and just say, uh, just kind of talk to yourself, rook a3, only move that kind of even hints an advantage or uh, keeps the tension, keeps the ambition up. Everything else feels like black is uh, able to simplify. And uh, on the flip side, Jan, very instinctive. Is that just because he's been in great shape over the last couple of years, great form, uh, playing quickly, Jan? That's who he is, right? Like, he has also been playing a lot of bad moves very quickly. The game that he lost here, he also played it very quickly. The game the games that he lost to Carlson in his match, where he was, uh, you know, when he was doing badly in the second half of that match, he was also playing very fast. So it's just how he plays. He just plays fast. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But I guess it's just his pace. It's just how he always played and how he always will play. I think we, we could try to think along with Ding after Rook A3. Which he made, fortunately, okay, he made uh, the best move. I think knight c6 will come. I think it will come quickly. Because I saw the computer prefers knight c4, but I think that position looks very unpleasant. Oh, no, actually, wow. knight, knight c4 quickly. Okay, that's the first, that's the top choice. I don't know, knight c6, maybe something was wrong with it. But to me, knight c6 looked interesting. I don't know, maybe I missed something there. Yeah, commentator's curse strikes again, Anish. No, but it's a top choice. Knight c4 is a top choice. And we get that position we are, by the way, calculating. Bishop c4 is a must. D c4. Knight b7 is very tempting. Uh, queen b6, knight d6, rook e5, d5, queen b2, and then rook a4, rook a5. We get the position that we were uh, looking at. I like white's chances there a lot. I like white's chances there a lot. But uh, that said, it's a clarified position. So at some point, there will be a concrete sequence of moves where uh, you make a move, I make a move. It gets kind of forcing. And in the end of that forcing line, either white wins or it will be a draw. So uh, it will get very concrete. But I think we are going down that line. I'm very excited to see what's going to happen there. Yeah, should we jump in and try to go as deep as we can, try to figure out what's going on in Ding's mind? Let's bring up the board. And like you say, it looks very forcing. I don't see any junctures. Yeah, really, I, any I would, I would, that's why I would also, we could also just uh, talk about life for two, for two minutes, because I guess that in two minutes we'll end up in that position on the board, because the moves are <laughs> absolutely forced. Yeah. So how's it going, David? I guess <laughs> <laughs> life is good. Thanks, Anish. Okay. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Okay, so it's bishop c4, d4. <laughs> yeah. He's going to take this pawn, surely. 
it's not 97. Like, oh, 97 maybe 97 is actually an alternative actually 97 is a nice alternative isn't it mm -hmm. one of these two jumps let's check out this one we assume we'll see the other one so uh let's allow that to play oh, it's out really not nice the bar is like no 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 it's horrible, <laughs> horrible. Queen i guess six? just queen c6 yeah i thought it takes 95 but it doesn't give anything of course mm -hmm. uh, you just move the queen and what, what have i achieved queen somewhere yeah, yeah. Or somewhere this rook else. Looks a bit whatever, silly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not this square, but yeah, oh, the rook see. looks a bit strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the knight on e5 is not. Uh, we have achieved nothing with the rook's not doing nothing. No, no, of course. Knight b7. With knight on d6, pawn on e5, potential for e6. Like there, there is so much, you know. Like that position, I would love it in a blitz game with white. After mm -hmm. knight b7, and queen b6, knight d6, rook e5, d e, queen b2, rook a5. Like there's so much, um, so much electrical potential there for, for white. Some e6, h5, you know. Like, so many dirty tricks are there. I would love this uh, with white in a blitz game. I can see uh, some sort of a dirty chip or somewhere coming from a mile away. And I think black has to be extremely precise here to uh, avoid that from happening. But in a classical game, especially someone calculating as well as Jan, he could avert the disaster. And if there is a solution, he could find it. Yeah, I think that's the key. Objectively, if there's a solution, then uh, yeah, I think Jan will save this game. If not, then as you say, it's so easy to fall into some tricks. White's king is super safe on the h2 square. No problems ever with the king. And meanwhile, queen and knight, we know how dangerous those are. Everything feels so loose for black. This is undefended. This is going to get hit. This queen, where does she go? Really unclear. Um, I, am, I am wondering about like an endgame, uh, queen b1, queen d3, something like this, if I can get it. But I guess can be rejected by white. Maybe this uh -huh. is the best bet. So many, uh, so many moves came to mind. Uh, I, I didn't see the end game at first, but it's certainly interesting to consider. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking about queen c1, rook b8, rook b1 idea to try to uh, go straight for the, uh, you know, for the checkmate, which. If, if it fails, it might backfire, and I see the bar says it doesn't work, but I don't, don't immediately see why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Do Me you see neither. why it doesn't work? Um, it looks interesting, doesn't it? It be one kind of a big thing. Yeah, but it's just one check. Let's say I continue pushing. Okay, it'll be one. In. Okay, I guess I'll trade off here, and then I just need to move my queen to give my king some breathing space. Oh, like queen g4, queen h1, king in g3, let's say. Yeah, I just didn't yeah. see that queen move, but let's say. Ah, maybe somewhere else as well. Queen f3, okay. maybe? Ah, queen f3 maybe even stronger. Okay. Yeah, just to attack this piece. And g3 is pretty safe for the white king. Okay, okay, okay. okay. This is a good argument. Indeed, very often when you do this back rank business, it's just one check. And here is a good example of that. So this is not good. Queen b1, queen d3 is an idea. Another idea I had is I, I wanted to go queen b6, actually. That was my first thought. I want somehow to dislodge the knight from d6. And okay, I give you this pawn. But at least I... Uh, safeguard my king for now and i'm trying to i'm trying to uh, discoordinate your pieces like i say if you go knight c4 maybe i can play queen c7 trying to tie your pieces to each other and make you uh make put you in a very clumsy position at the cost of a pawn and now you no longer have e6 h5 tricks now you have to worry about coordination mm -hmm. wow Ooh, dings what is h5 reach for his wow. h pawn wow so start with h5 okay 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 what is that what is that what is the bar? Oh. The bar is uh, okay with it, yeah? Looks okay. Yeah, uh, not changing things too but... much. Okay, h5 wow. is interesting. You you include h5 and then you want to do the same. Mm -hmm. hmm. How sure. to say? It's very committal. Very, because the pawn on h5, it could potentially get attacked. So let's say you go bishop h7. Yeah. But now... Uh, oh, the oh, bishop h7 is not liked, yeah? So knight b7 or what? Let's say knight b7, for example, the same variation we were talking about, improved Rookie version. Five? Ah, so it's an improved version, yeah, you claim. Because of some, because of what exactly? Some queen of three or? Uh, Somewhere. It feels like an improved version. <laughs> Let's say the same thing. Maybe it's not so different here, actually. Just quite well, I didn't know for whom it's an improved version. Uh, are you sure it's an improved version for, uh, for, for white? Because I got the bishop away from the e6 uh, tactic. Uh, h5 pawn can potentially be exposed. Uh, I was guessing. I just assumed that Ding thinks it's an improved oh, version. Oh, for sure. That, well, we can assume that, that Ding <laughs> thinks that. But the, also, uh, instead of bishop h7, maybe I can place the bishop somewhere like on d3 or something. Wow. Where it's maybe more stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're saying, okay, well, you can take a pawn in some variations, but black will get active in return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm, I'm ready to give you the... I, I don't even see how you take it, because I have some rookie one counterplay there. 
at the mm. end of the line. Bishop d3 looks uh, optically like the best move uh, to me, but uh, it's a very concrete position. So let, let's see why the bar doesn't like bishop d3. We are unable to guess a single move here because it's so difficult, so concrete. And the uh, points, like the disadvantage of each bishop move will be revealed many, many moves later. So we cannot see it, uh, you know, with a horizon as humans. We cannot see, uh, see it so far ahead. Yeah. Bishop d3 looks, I think Jan will play bishop d3. Bishop d3 looks uh, the most sensible to me. It is a very Yan type of move, bishop d3. Yes, very, very. Bishop also stable there, you know? It's it's like defended by the bishop page 7. The problem with bishop page 7 is that I'm afraid somehow of a back rank now. Mm -hmm. Like the back rank could be an issue. So I'm very worried about that. I don't want bishop page 7. I, I hate that move. Mm -hmm. Instead, if I have to choose, yes, I think I, I plan the bishop on d3. Because, okay, on c2, it's kind of weird and vague, yeah? It's hanging in the air somewhat. Mm -hmm. But on uh, d3, it's nicely protected by the pawn. I think bishop d3 will eventually come, but Jan will, of course, have to calculate the consequences of, of all that. Yeah, we talked about Jan being impulsive sometimes. This is a position he has to sit and calculate. It's so crazy, so many options. Yeah, I was it's also difficult. wondering. Yeah, it's difficult. I was wondering if he could take this and then go like queen e7 or queen c6. Yeah, but that a ggf looks very sus, but maybe yeah. it's possible actually. Somewhere queen take and take this knight, but yeah, it feels it's very possible. shaky. Yeah, if you take this pawn, there'll be some check and. White is uh, cashing in before black is ready. Not quite. Wait a second. Is, uh, is, it, is it possible to go like AGFG? Because the bar is kind of acting weird. So could I go queen somewhere and then trap the knight, sort of? Wow. Here? Or the with knight. the queen else. Yeah, no, but, yeah. but like then the, I'm I trying to get it out. Oh, 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 queen, queen d5 and queen d1. Oh, when? So. In Queen d8, sorry, queen d8 and queen d1. Queen d8. Ah, whoa, a niche in this position. Take, and this is crazy. Oh, but I just saw the bar. Yeah, that's why I found it. Of course, I'd never find it. Check. I just tried to make sense of the bar, and I and I try to understand, like, how does it not transpose? But Jan can do this, by the way. This is such a beautiful resource. He's capable, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. This is a, it's, actually, it's actually a blunder by Ding, what he did. He actually blundered wow. this. Can he so, still uh, can he still somehow salvage it after rook e5? Rook takes e5, queen takes feels wrong. No, no, endgame is bad. D queen d8 maybe here like rook a1. Mm -hmm. Just to stop any checks. But now the black maybe bishop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can take. Now it's just so the worst version. Ah, queen of f3. Queen f3. Sorry, I have queen f3. Maybe that's the move. Okay. I have queen f3. Uh, in this position, yeah, instead of rook a1. Yeah, I defend and, and defend the pawn as well. Okay, this is uh, some damage control there, at least. Mm -hmm. Still looks oh, pretty good still for looks white. Bad. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. still looks bad for black, because I take knight b7 and uh, it looks actually as bad as ever. Mm -hmm. This could be Even one if... way that Jan might spot the idea, but then reject it anyway, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. You might get briefly excited. But then you see queen f3 and you think, okay, you have an even, even worse version. And you have to also realize, as a human, of course, players, they don't have the bar. Oh, to c2. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay, wow. okay. And if quickly. that's the best move, then I just tip, take my head. Uh, tip my head. Let me just check. Can we just check if that's the best move? Because I just, I just want to see. Because this is just such a random move. I want to see if this is the best move. Let me. It feels wrong. It's like you say, it's, this bishop is floating in the air now. It's going to be a tactical target. It's going to be hit with tempo and some variations. I'm surprised that he played it so quickly. Bishop d3, we weren't refuting yet. Um, okay, it's the best uh, bishop move because bishop d3 is met by b4, which is well. <laughs> an incredible positional uh, chippo. But you know, the only defense that uh, Jan had in this position, bishop c2 is kind of kind of close to lost. Mm -hmm. um, because knight b2, rook e5, queen e5. Wow, just queen takes. Queen b6, knight d6, queen b2. Rook a5, that position is apparently uh, like close to winning. But the defense Jan had is actually a rook e5, only move, de queen d8 that we saw. And after queen f3, queen d2. Wow, a niche. g queen e1, king h2, queen e5, g3, queen c5, queen f7, king h8, and they are okay. <laughs> You've been doing your puzzle rush, your geometry. This is crazy. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been turning on my engine is what I, what, what I, what I did. Yeah. The engine's been doing its uh, The engine's been doing Puzzle Rush, rush uh, day in, day, day out here, I can tell you. Wow. How much this did Jan take for this move, by the way? Crazy. Bishop C2? How he much did he spent? A couple of minutes, I think. Uh, oh, okay, he spent about four or five minutes. 
and he had uh, 58, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, this is, of course, uh, another case of uh, Russia. Bad, uh, yeah, 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 of course. It's, it's, it's a very bad time management, of course, by Jan. I mean, this is a, it's always the case. So when Jan wins, like yesterday, it was a wonderful, yeah? Uh, he was playing fast and good, mm -hmm. but he's also playing fast and bad. Like, this is clearly a moment to think for a very, very long time. He has, like, half an hour more than Ding. Could have definitely invested 15 minutes here without a question. 15 minutes for sure, maybe even 20, maybe even 25. But uh, playing bishop c2 quickly when there is this, especially if you see rookie 5d, queen d8, I think he missed it altogether. I think he was only thinking about, he only thought about rookie 5d, queen c6, which is mm -hmm. horrible. So he was only thinking about which square to choose for the bishop. And he actually chose the best square. Yeah. But he missed that the resource. Yeah, that in itself is impressive, just uh, his instincts, Jan. But here we go, uh, knight takes b7 on the board. Knight takes b7 now has just been played. And uh, yeah, Jan, I'm getting confirmation he spent three minutes pretty much on that move, just over three minutes. It's too quick. This is uh, yeah, yeah, way, 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 way too quick. Mm -hmm. I don't mean like, let's. it has to be taken in a, in a context. I mean, let's say if he has uh, four minutes, uh, it's, 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 it's good. But uh, he has 58. <laughs> If Ding had maybe three minutes on the clock, he would uh, you could justify it by saying that he didn't want to give Ding additional time. But given the circumstances, given like you know the the pot odds as they say and all the stuff, yeah. Given the amount of time the black had, the amount of time the white had, the kind of problems that he has to deal with on the position, this is like a, a classic case of a very bad time management. And this is nothing new. It is. Uh, it is the flip side of Jan's strengths, and uh, in a bad position, it, it becomes his weakness. Yeah, as uh, someone who has a lot of experience with bad time management, I'm actually on the other side of the scale. I spend way too long, but I know when my opponents are bluffing, and here it's clear that Jan, I mean, you need an hour here to work out all the diff kind of different uh, options here, all the variations to calculate as deeply as you can, and nobody can do it within, within three minutes. So actually for Ding, that's a confidence boost. Um, he knows that Jan is just kind of Playing on feel here, he's not uh, not worked everything out yet. So Ding, trusting his calculation, takes on b7. And uh, some of those variations you showed, Anish, it's actually similar to those lines uh, earlier with all the cheapos in the air, all the tactics in the air. But maybe now it is uh, an improved version for Ding. It feels like he's going to get centralized uh, very quickly with his pieces. It seems but this queen e5 is the, is the way to go, according mm -hmm. to the computer. So uh, I, I was like looking at de before, because I had this e6, but now rook e5, queen e5. Now the end game is completely gone because if you go queen e5, queen e5, d, uh, rook b8, knight d6, rook b2, rook a6, f7 mm -hmm. pawn is very vulnerable. So the end game is is finished. Let's, let's so show that on a board, maybe. Yeah, let's show that on the board, perhaps. Very important. It takes e5 here, and uh, yeah, it's all about this one pawn, this one detail. And next move, check, and this pawn will drop. Yeah, now h5, bishop g6 is just a tremendous inclusion. Yeah, like if the mm -hmm. pawn, if the pawn is on h4, bishop on g6. Uh, this is still very much defensible. You go rook b3 and so on. Uh, but yes, uh, now the end game is gone. Oh. So you go uh, rook e5, queen e5, queen b6. Oh, queen b6 first. Jan played queen b6 first. It will transpose. I play knight d6 because of this nice trick queen d6, rook e8, of course. Yep. Wins the queen. So yes, he has to take. He has to take. And now um, queen takes is the move preferred by the engine. Not obvious, but okay, it's preferred by the engine that you take with the queen. And after queen b2, I believe it was just rook a5. And uh, there is this surprising threat of knight to e8. Well, not not oh. unfindable, of course, at all, but just somewhat surprising. It's not um, not obvious, but uh, well, let's say cool. queen c3. Let's say if queen c3. Also, there's some knight, isn't that? Yeah. So let's say, can I play here? Knight e8. I don't checkmate. know why the bar is. That, yeah, is 98 just, oh, the bar is staying all the way, yeah? Yeah, this is yeah. winning, yeah, here. Mm -hmm. F6, for example, just, yeah. Or maybe there's something even what? better. Maybe you flick in a check first. But how yeah. can this just, ah, ah, root takes e8. Okay, okay, so queen d5 maybe, yeah? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, queen d5, just keeps it simple. If... Oh, on knight takes f6, in the king h7, knight takes f6 and queen b7, that's nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, wow, yeah, nice. This is a puzzle rush, yeah. Check, and next move, we take the rook with a check. All comes with tempo. It's no surprise though that the tactics work out here for white. And can black defend better here uh, against this threat? How was the exchange side? Because it didn't seem obvious to me. So queen c3, uh, mm -hmm. 98, rook e8. How, how clear is this? So why is it so clear? I have rook, a, rook takes a, no, but why is this on the winning on the spot? 
There's no checks, so there must be some mating idea. Let's say we take. Uh, yeah, I was hoping to take queen d4, and I was hoping I have queen d1 check and the c pawn, and it's some, mm -hmm. some queen f7 maybe just protects the h5 pawn. Yeah, defends this. Uh, so this is just one. Yeah, check. it's just it's just a winning position because I guess rook a8 is a threat. Watch this the material, of course. Queen g6. <laughs> Oh, oh my Sorry. god, this is Jesus, this is so pretty. Wow. This is so to, cheap. Had to oh, do fantastic. it. <laughs> you had to. Fantastic. I actually didn't even see it. Yeah, wow, this is a shame. Very easy. Yeah. Um, okay, okay. To... So uh, definitely, definitely some uh, juice uh, there for, for Ding. Some mm -hmm. juicy stuff there after knight d6, rook e5, queen e5. I guess uh, this queen d3 is the mistake, yeah? In the, if, if you're looking back at, uh, at this analysis that we looked at. Mm hmm. Either way, Ding has to play knight d6 here. And, yeah, what uh, is the... Yes, I mean, what, what else? What He's, by the way, taking his time. But what else? What else? He's the opposite of Jan in this game. He <laughs> is taking his time when you think that you don't need to. And Jan not taking when you think you need to. So it's just the opposite. It's remarkable. Just different styles. Clash of styles. Yeah, really. Uh, I guess queen f3, but it just feels so wrong. As soon as you see you can put your knight on the d6 square, you go I mean, for it, right? Even close. Like I'm seeing here, I just put the engine lines just uh, to see the options. I mean, there's not even a sensible alternative. You have to, like, mm -hmm. why, is he, why is he spending? Okay, he just wants to double check that he's winning, but he has no option, of course. Is, is that a sign of nerves? Is it just the fact that he's not felt in the flow this tournament? Because Ding on form plays this move in 10 seconds. A little bit of that, uh, but also, as I already said yesterday, I think that um, he doesn't care about uh, Jan's time spending. He has his own. He has two hours and he has 40 moves and he is just uh, he's just pacing out his time. So he has the time, so he just spends it. Um, but, well, you know, 28 minutes, it looks still okay, but when it looks like 20, because, you know, the old clock, okay, nowadays they have seconds, but I, I don't know if you remember, but back in the day, the old uh, digital clocks, they would show only minutes until you would go down to 20, min to 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, they would start showing seconds. Yeah. And like, th that would be a big panic moment for me because I would see seconds and I would be like, okay, wait, this is, uh, now it's, it's, it's going down, you know? Yeah, so I was of that generation, there weren't even seconds on the clock, Hanish. <laughs> yeah, the, the ones with the flag the that analog. falls. Yeah, yeah, the flag that falls. No, I played that as well. But uh, I think 20 minutes is the kind of mark that uh, gets you a little bit nervous. That's when you... Um, and he has... Okay, of course mm -hmm. he plays 96. But he has uh, still to make some moves. So he, I shouldn't... Yeah, he shouldn't be thinking forever. Luckily, he played 96 already. He has 27 minutes, still enough. And after rookie 5... I think he will take with the queen because um, pawn takes is not so attractive now. Yeah, and after queen takes queen b2, rook a5, it's really on uh, Jan to find the defense. And it's very difficult. Yeah. Difficult position. Extremely difficult for Jan. And again, body language. Either he's got the best poker face ever or he doesn't realize Jan. I'm not sure he's calculated. Maybe he just doesn't have this 98 move on his radar. That's an easy one to miss. Without it, maybe it's far less clear, right? But even if you see queen 98, uh, I, I don't think you panic as black. Like you think that you have options. Let's say um, rook e5. Rook e5 will come, especially from Jan, it will come instantly because there's no alternative. Let's jump in maybe. Uh, okay, rook takes e5 on the board. Yeah, you know, as a spectator, the thing I like about Jan is that if the move is the only move, he makes it just immediately. This is, <laughs> this is nice. This is just, there's no, you know, there's no dead air on, uh, on stream. He just makes that move and okay, we get the action. But Dink, like, he just, you know, double checks, triple checks. Yeah, I've, I've got to say, Jan, like when I first met him, we were eight years old, European under 10 championship. He played the whole game against me as if it was blitz. So it's, it, he's true to himself. Most of us, we get slower with age. I get much slower, but uh, What Jan, was the result? Uh, I managed to draw, but he got the gold medal. I got the silver. <laughs> Is that the one where Magnus got the bronze or not? Oh, uh, that was uh, a couple of years later. Um, uh -huh. Because there was one where the three of you were, uh, or or no, there was <laughs> you, Magnus, and who was there? Is Jan or correct? Jan got the gold, Jan, Magnus yeah. silver, me bronze, uh -huh. and then uh -huh. yeah, some other like Andrekin, I think came fourth. Or, um, yeah, plenty of strong players this 1990 generation. But crazy year, yeah. crazy year. Up. Isn't yeah. 1990 like it's an insane year? It's like by far the strongest year of all the years around it. It's unbelievable. Bashir Legrav, Karyakin, uh, yeah. I could go on and on. Yeah. Plenty of 2700s, but... But it's already enough. I mean, just to, to mention Magnus, Jan, mm -hmm. Arakin MVL, 
I mean, that's all right. And you uh, as well, of course. <laughs> Slightly and that, lower that, down. The, yeah, is Andrake in exactly 90 as well, or? Yes, I think so. Andrake um, as well, this is absolutely unbelievable. Hammer, Savage, like 20 of others. Yeah. My year 94, I, I think we did, but I don't know, like who else is in the top from 94? I think nobody is from 94. Mm -hmm. There's a few 93, Wesley. 92, 92, a couple as well. 92 mm -hmm. is also a couple. I think Fabi is 92. And Ding? And Ding is 92, yes, yes. Yeah. But yeah, 1990 is just uh, crazy. Yeah. Crazy, yeah I've, crazy. I've already planned if Jan wins the tournament, I'm going to rehash that uh, childhood picture of us standing next to each other with our medals just <laughs> for the social media, for the likes. Yeah, and you can use this uh, picture for on many occasions, you know, if uh, Magnus does something as well, or if you yeah. always have this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, by the way, D, uh, DE5 is very much an option here. And mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that even though the computer has everything worked out, uh, the calculations you have to do here to conclude which move is stronger, it's extremely hard. And personally, I am an intuitive player, so uh, I would take that decision somewhat intuitively. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have to say that something in me likes the D, the D, DE move, like especially without H5. I, some, there is a part of me that likes this DE move, especially I think the knight on D6 gets the stable support and the potential mm -hmm. for the E6 break as well. I have to say I'm guilty of liking DE, but I know that the computer says Queen E5 is the move, uh, the money move, and Ding spends a lot of time, and he doesn't have uh, that much time left because he has to make 11 moves in a crazy position, and he cannot think forever. He only has 24 minutes left. So Ding will now go all out. It will be his last big thing, an important big thing, and he has to, yeah, well, he's a calculating kind of player. He might uh, find the best move, but the calculations are so extremely hard. And the modern computers, they see everything very fast. But there are so many deviations and options after Queen E5, Queen B2, Rook A5. I think Black must have many, many can move candidate moves. Mm -hmm. And while Ding takes this big decision, it's 50-50, Queen takes E5 or D takes E5, uh, we will be going to a short break, but we will be back in a few minutes with further coverage of Game 6, the 2023 FIDE World Championship. different things, wine tasting, movies, book clubs, meet a lot of new people, a lot of new friends, and it will make you more social. I have three puzzles here. It's chess, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes, it's chess. No, we're gonna go. No, but suddenly, that. you know, there's like some kind of, some kind of triangle so all over the place. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, okay. Why no warning? I'm not the fastest. <laughs> So here is the first one. Oh, okay. Okay. So F2 check. Yeah. A rook A takes F2. Queen yeah. G2 check. Rook takes G2, knight H3. King H1, rook takes F1. Rook G1, H2. Wow. Is there like a mate or oh, anything? Okay. So I can... Yeah, I think I have solved it already. Like F2 is uh, okay. the answer. Um, actually, actually, I didn't have time to calculate king takes f2, which looks, uh, I mean, at the very least, I can just take on d3 and on f1 and I'm much more ahead, and, and there is also rook f2 in the end, so it's just checkmate. But of course, the point is, after rook, mm, doesn't matter which rook takes on f2, then there is queen g2, check, followed by an h3, check, and rook takes f1, checkmate. Uh, or, or rook g1, rook takes g1, checkmate. Okay. Okay, I did or then play currently blind. All right, your 10 seconds is up. Harder than the Yeah. I just got it while I was singing briefly. Yeah, so it's obviously F2, and then uh, Queen G2, Knight E3, and Rook F1. Wow, okay, so you're... Uh, I mean, there's also Rook F takes G2, but same thing, yeah. Yeah. I'll... I mean, Rook F takes F2, Queen G2, Rook G2, Knight E3, King H1, and then Rook G1, Rook G1's bait, but yeah. Okay. Black to play and win, or what? Yes, black to play and win. Well, I mean, I got it right, and I think it's X. I don't know, but I didn't, I didn't find the mate. I saw the dumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're good, you're good. Uh, I'll make a move, bro. Knight e2, yeah? Unfortunately, the move is not knight e2. Yeah, same thing, I'm trying to find the mate. F2, rook takes oh. f2. 
I need the warm up. Can we try it again? <laughs> <laughs> that Different was permission. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need the warm up. Um, if it was my, if it was a game, I'll go 92 takes, G3, and then I see if. But I think it's it's just perpetual there now. I don't think it's a mate. Yeah, no, I don't. All good. Um, the correct move is actually F2. Yeah, rook bf2. And then. Oh wow, like this. Somehow it's an unusual pattern, but it's yeah. really cool. No. Exactly. Yeah. It's so easy. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to game six of the 2023 FIDE World Championship. We currently see Jan Nepomnishi in his rest area, potentially in big trouble on the board as well. Ding has just played the sequence of moves we were predicting, computer approved as well, and White in charge right now. And uh, it is actually Jan Nepomnishi's move. He's still sitting there, not returning to the board. Anish, Feels like he's in big trouble. Do you think only now he's realizing the big threats that uh, face him? Yeah, yeah, for sure. He realizes the importance of the moment. I don't know if he... Um, he's an optimistic guy, generally, a very optimistic player. So I don't think he thinks that he is in trouble yet. He he probably hopes um, that there is a solution. 
So he understands that he has to think about it very seriously now. This is the moment to think. And he is thinking now um, on the screen, he will take a bit of time there, then he will think on the board because he understands that knight e8 is coming. If there is a solution, he, he, he will believe that there is one. He is that kind of guy. He uh, It has to be here. So he's taking his time. What I really like, by the way, I told you about the psychological 20-minute mark. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but look at Dink's clock. It is 20 zero, zero. It is 20 zero, zero. You're a prophet, Anish. Uh, and no, there's no incredible. increment either, so he must have timed it on the spot. Uh, that's when the panic sets in. No, um, well, I, I think it will be crazy to actually time your move with, uh, with the clock like that. But um, <laughs> it's a nice symbolic, uh, uh, sy symbolic mark. Uh, it used to be big uh, back with the old clock. It used to be big because that is when the seconds um, started ticking down. Now with the clock showing seconds from the from the first move and from already, it shows seconds even when you have more than an hour. The clock has changed. Of course, it's better this way, but um, now it's less sim less uh, impactful, less symbolic, but still um, he left himself with just enough time. I think 20 minutes for 10 moves in this position might just be enough. And the important thing for him is that, well, he has a very clear idea. It's 98 and uh, it's a huge threat. And actually the question is, how do you stop it? I, I see this Queen C1 G5 staring at me. This is, but this might be a huge panic. I think the end game might be bad. But Queen C1 G5 is a, a sort of it's, it's a big move uh, to try and at least trade queens. But there are potentially uh, all kinds of downsides with that. I think I don't know. Yeah, the end games could be lost. But besides Queen C1 G5, I don't know Queen C3. We discussed already Queen C3 98. Uh, we didn't see a defense. What else? How else do you defend from uh, 98? Some queen b8, but that's just uh, very, very sad. Yeah, it's a uh, sad position in general, though, Anish. And just before we jump in to analyze some of these variations, we do see neither player at the board right now. Uh, it feels like, OK, this is one of the rest uh, areas. I think this is Ding's rest area. Maybe he's just off getting refreshed. No, he's returned to the board. Uh, and it's actually his opponent in move, Yanna Pomnishi, still not returning. Uh, maybe having missed rook a5, which wasn't necessarily obvious. White had options there too. Um, really powerful play by Ding, it's got to be said, in this dynamic position. And uh, we do await Jan's return to the board. And yeah, I believe... We... Sorry, sorry yeah. On. Yeah, no, sorry. I, th um, I wanted to say that I believe that um, Rook A5 is not, of course, the move that um, he would have missed because this is just uh, uh, the natural move. I guess what you meant to say is that he probably m missed the 98 threat or he had mm -hmm. underestimated that because... Yes. Uh, that is um, that is a bummer, and uh, ninety eight is something that uh, well, that is definitely a question that you, you you'll need to answer. And I think I noticed it before. I don't know if it's always the case, but I think Jan usually thinks in a, a resting area when he has missed something and when his, his position is bad. This is what I recall from the two matches that I have observed. I think this this becomes a pattern, and I think um, when he is uncomfortable with with his position, when he's uncomfortable with what he had just missed prefers to to think in his own intimacy, in his own uh, resting area. Yeah, that was definitely the case in 2021. Uh, after he lost game six against Magnus, uh, his future defeats, whenever there was a blunder, whenever he'd miscalculated, he would often stay away from the board for a long time. And I think it happened in, was it game three and four as well in this, uh, in this match? Uh, he did that a couple of times after missing Ding's replies. And uh, yeah, clearly right now he realizes he's in trouble. Not sure how to minimize the damage, Anish. You mentioned some ideas trying to get the queens off the board. Feels like that has to be part of the plan. It's just whether you rush that. Uh, maybe the queen c1, queen g5 maneuver still on tap for later on. Uh, maybe black can defend oh, yeah. the c4 pawn first. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, after knight e8, you can still do queen c1, queen g5. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. Good point there. I'm not even sure if knight e8 is, um, if that is a threat or rather a response to queen c3, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's in the air, but it depends yeah, exactly. on what black does, right? Exactly. I oh, actually, the move that was staring at me is this move King H7. I don't know why, but it was. It's been staring at me. Wow. Intricate. I don't know. It's, I, I don't know. It's probably horrible, but I was just thinking about it. Um, That's cunning. Maybe we can jump into a board. Yeah. The I, I remember now. What was my idea? My idea was 98 through K8 Queen C1. That was my idea. Mm. Let's put this on an analysis board. Yeah. Beautiful. Again with the geometry here. Anish, this is a check. And because yes, the Black King wasn't this in check. Is, this Quincy 1 to 4 is the most thematic perpetual ever. Yeah, everybody always looks for that pattern. Yeah, yeah King H7, I like. I think Jan will play King H7. I love the look of this move. 
Yeah, I wasn't uh, aware of this move. It wasn't on my radar. I was looking more at kind of defending this pawn. And if knight e8, uh, firstly, this was on my radar to check and come back with the queen. But then also I realized maybe you can go back this way uh, with mm. queen b8 now. It's only after you said queen b8 in another mm. variation, Anish, that... Uh, nice, nice. This pin. I have to say, all of these positions, they don't look lost to me. Uh, I don't know about you, but they all look to me... Uh, they don't look lost to me, all of them. So I don't know why the bar is so excited. The bar is excited because... The engines are so strong now, when they see an advantage, uh, they basically, they either see a defense, then they show it's a draw, or they see a win, and then they show it's kind of a win. So the computers are just, uh, they see too far ahead. Uh, basically, the position is promising for white, but I don't feel that it's winning. I, King h7, I don't see a win. Bishop d3, I don't see a win. I just don't see why it's winning. And I, I see, uh, you know, limited material, relatively speaking. I see the A-pawn still there on the board. Um, I, I don't understand why. Uh, of course, I see why it is uh, dominating with, in the center and has all sorts of promising ideas, but I think it's very early to speak of the game being over and the situation on the clock too is not in Dick's favor. So I think after Jan makes a move, it can be bishop d3, it can be king h7. I think uh, it's far from over and uh, I, I, I think Dick has a lot of work ahead, a lot of work ahead here. Yeah, I completely agree. I think Jan now is realizing there are concrete issues. Uh, maybe when he saw this position from afar, he thought he could simply capture this pawn. He's realizing now that's impossible, but still plenty of resources. Long term, yeah, I wonder whether this D pawn might decide the game as well. Uh, this past D pawn, it could start motoring up the board in the next few moves. If Jan can get the queens off, maybe some elements of safety there. But uh, yeah, he needs to defend this pawn somehow, keep his A pawn alive, and make sure he doesn't get checkmated. So it's kind of dual or triple purpose uh, next few moves. High stakes for Jan. And uh, I, still not back at the board. Yeah, but I just don't see... Uh, of course, I understand the deep one maybe one day, but um, you have to show me the line. Like, I don't mm -hmm. see uh, anything wrong with neither king h7 nor bishop d3. I don't see why uh, why black is uh, in such trouble. Yeah. Can you explain to me? So let's say uh, I play king h7. Please explain Okay, me. let's jump back into the board. And... Uh, it's, 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 my, it's my man. It's wow. my man. King h7, yeah. You called it a niche on the board now, king h7. And uh, just to point out, uh, white can take this pawn, but now black, I guess, has time to take on c3 simply. Is there something better? I think c3, yeah. That's yeah, probably the one take I take. This. Yeah, and white suddenly has no threats. This king, safer than it looks, at least on h7, on the, this diagonal protected by the bishop. So knight takes f7, not too tempting. It was yeah, around because... here that I was thinking d5, maybe a niche. Yeah, because knight f7, just uh, to finish that point uh, you were making, that after knight f7, you won a pawn, but you haven't you haven't gotten closer to my king. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow, quickly. quick move. Quick reply. Is it probably a good move or not? Is it a good move? Feels decent, uh, at least from a human point of view, going to the 7th rank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What could be more mm -hmm. natural? Oh, yes, yes, I see the point. So I see the point. So the queen on e5, it prevents queen c1, queen f4 idea. Mm -hmm. The knight on d6 uh, is ready to go to e8 or f5. And so Ding is improving is improving uh, the rook. Also, if you start with king h2, which was another tempting option, if you start with king h2, I suspect queen c3 was uh, already a serious uh, candidate move. Mm -hmm. Because now knight e8 is rook takes e8. There's no more check. So actually, uh, rook c5 is uh, kind of an obvious move in, in a way. Now, a big question I have, big question I have. Okay. I have a few. I have a few. <laughs> it's um, the position, type of position where there's hundreds of questions. Yeah, in each... I have a few. So my oh. first question probably is what about a5? Because you let my a pawn, like you, you released, released the... Uh, you know, release the rook from a5 or it was blocking. Now, I guess a5, a4 is too slow, but let's try it. So mm -hmm. rook c7, I think you got to go for mate, right? Yeah. So for me, it's now maybe enough to trade queens under any circumstances, and then I will push the a pawn. So what about queen c1, queen g5 here? Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I can't really run away from that exchange. No, I'm really not worried as black here. I'm really optimistic about defensive chances because we'll trade queens, then I'll push my a pawn, then you have to go passive, and then I'll get some... Uh, I mean, take maybe knight c4, knight a3, but, well, I'm not uh, not concerned. I think this I should be... No? Not should oh. be? Should be? I Should I be able to? Okay, you have connected passers, I understand. Yeah, we have connected passers. c4, d5, they're going to gonna go very fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so I have to be more accurate than that with black, yeah? 
Yeah, maybe in the current position, is there a more useful move than a5? Uh, I'm wondering as well, why, sometimes white's just going to take on c4. Just gobble up the pawn. Uh, I was wondering about f6 originally, just to try and destabilize your queen, but maybe this is still a good square for her. F6, yes. F6 is also a move. Uh, so taking on c3 was bad because of knight e8. Are we correct? Is that still the case? It was earlier, but now you could... Now I can take and take on d4, take yeah. Get rid that of this. Wonderful version of things. Yeah, no chance you lose this as black. Uh, attacking the rook, some checks as well. Even if the queens come off, if you can kind of get this pawn, even at the cost of black's queenside pawns, should be a draw. What's yeah, the idea uh... there? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure, let's say, if it's impossible to lose out with black, but let's say it's not uh, not uh, the end of the world uh, either. Mm -hmm. So after queen c3, okay, maybe just rook c4, yeah, for now. Just collect okay. the pawn for free. And I have to get out of the way, I'll maybe give a check. Whoa, yeah, engine hates this one. <laughs> yeah, but okay, let's make moves, I mean. Okay. Bishop and d3, now... rook c7. So... Yeah, yeah, no, now it's just, uh, yeah. it's just attack. Big, big attack for free. Maybe the black queen needs to find a better square. And, yeah, uh, what was a better square? Something closer, like d2, maybe something closer to... Uh -huh. I'm not sure why this is such a big change, but I think maybe after rook c7, maybe it's something to do with f6, and then queen d1, queen yeah. h5. If I take, then... And queen g6, yeah. Yeah. And I'll take with the bishop, and I got and away. White's got to be careful here of the past a pawn long term. Wow, so queen c3 is, is fine or not? To conclude, yeah. queen c3 is fine, not just. Looks playable. Queen takes c3. Can we just take a look at what oh. did Ding miss? So why was the bar saying that? I'll just take a look one moment uh, here on my um, on my screen. I'll just take an engine just to see what, because I remember the computer was saying that White was winning, and I no longer understand uh, why he is. So mm. Yang played king h7, which is the best move. Oh wow. Some crazy stuff, I imagine. This is the computer's dream where it's all concrete, it's all forcing, the stakes are high for both sides. Oh, this is some weird engine. Let me check another one. Because this, this engine, it says Queen E1. Let me just try another engine. No they way. All say Queen E1. Be played an issue. <laughs> Queen E1? Really? My God, they all say Queen E1. So the, the best move after KH7 was Queen to E1. <laughs> what the hell is that move? So back in this position, instead of rook c5, which was played in the game, just to drop back with the white queen. But yeah, just defend the instinctive. just defend the c3 pawn and collect c4 or f7. Just so, as greedy as that. Can you can you imagine? Wow, such an ugly move to go queen e1. How can you can you do that? Yeah, of, that was... of course. Of course, he he went rook c5. Now queen c3. Yeah, and uh, well, there is uh, there is the option of knight takes f7. But already White's uh, advantage, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not decisive at all. Yeah, it's it's not not decisive. If anything, actually, it's uh, very 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 drawish. Jan is probably going to escape in this game. Actually, Jan's probably yeah. escaping in this game. Do you think it was influenced by the clock that last decision, Rook C five, because there were plenty of options? I mean, Queen E one, we can definitely forgive Ding for not finding. I don't think uh, many mortals would find that move. But maybe there were other things he could have considered. He played Rook C five very quickly. He's kind of just guessing at this point. Uh, yeah, he has like. no time. To, he cannot afford anymore. Um, but you know, he was never, he was never that clear cut anymore. I think his big mistake was on move twenty three when he didn't go before, because that position the computer is evaluates it as kind of strategically winning. It says it's just winning actually. It gives the advantage of like I don't know, like depending on the engine, it's like plus two. And this um, strategic advantage was huge. After this concrete concrete sequence that he initiated, the advantage was no longer this big, and well, he had sort of a winning like advantage after queen e one, but it's really difficult to make that move, and it doesn't seem so winning to me. Um, and after rook c five already, yeah, instead of queen e one, there was no other move. Rook c five was the second best. Mm -hmm. Rook c five, queen c three, it's already it's already okay uh, for black, so. It seems as though, yeah, it seems as though yeah, it was never so easy. And uh, I think given the time situation, uh, Jan will now you know, compose himself and find find all the right moves and probably he'll escape here. Slipping um, away from Ding. Ding's problem here as well is that queen takes c3 is the first thing black will calculate. Jan's very direct, very concrete. And if he sees no issue with that one, he's just gonna play it. There's nothing else he needs to even consider. 
Um, of course, maybe a5, other moves you mentioned there, Anish, but we take c3 if it works and it seems to do uh, seems to do so, then it's yeah, going to be on the board. The first move you calculate, I mean, I, I just forgot about it uh, for a second there, mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it's the first move you you calculate because uh, now after queen c3, knight e8, you have a much better version with black than a move earlier because even then you wanted to sack the exchange, mm -hmm. but now you can sack the exchange in a much better version because after rook e8, queen e8 is no longer a check. You had already stepped out of the check. Yeah, yeah no, I'm uh, I'm not uh, I'm I'm not uh, optimistic here for for ding after queen c3 because a lot of options, but all of them seem very vague to me. This knight f7 move was uh, computer's preferred choice. Maybe it's the best in intending rook c7 later, keeping the tension. Mm -hmm. mm, actually, maybe still asking some questions. Yeah, maybe knight f7 is the, actually the best move. Yeah. Got to say, though, uh, I want to praise Jan just for finding this king h7 move on the last turn. Uh, I think that one, very difficult decision. Not easy to kind of take a timeout in such a wild position and uh, just play a quiet king move. But now all the tactics seem to, or at least the kind of immediate term tactics, they all seem to favor black because there's no checks with tempo. And uh, yeah, like you say, white will still find a way to play on. I'm pretty sure Ding will uh, play knight takes f7 if he sees nothing else. And uh, yeah. it's not easy. You still get so, nervous as black. It's a very exciting uh, position, in fact. It is going to be a very exciting uh, phase now. As um, I, I would hope that both players would have less time for even more drama. Well, not queen takes c3, I think. He gave a check instead. And king yeah, h2 you know, immediately. I think, this knight, I think with c3, knight f7, the longer I looked at the position, the more worried I got because rook c7 was coming and mm. you didn't have any checks. So I think Nepo, uh, Jan is going for the queen g5 idea, maybe. But I don't know in which, but wait, not cannot do it right now. This could be yes. outrageous. Or oh, F6, okay. F6. Yeah, you mentioned that move at some point, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, just to try and kick the queen away. Obviously, white's queen has to keep an eye over this F4 square. Uh, otherwise, there's a... G3, yeah? Only, is G3 is the only square then? Feels that way. I'm wondering whether you can get away with kind of uh, meeting this check with marching your king up the board, but that feels so wrong. Um, so brave. Wow, <laughs> foolhardy potentially. Uh, yeah, so queen g3 looks like the most stable. Keep the king protected. Doesn't what feel do like a game want? for black. Uh, I don't know. I have, uh, I have, uh, you know, threat of knight f7 was there. Mm -hmm. So I got rid of that. I removed my pawn from f7. And after rook c7, I have queen g5. So after mm -hmm. queen g3, I don't even see your threat. Uh, I don't see your threat. This is true. Maybe I'll just take your pawns if you let me start uh, getting greedy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I. Uh, it's difficult for me to... Okay, he plays this. You have to play queen g3, of course. It's difficult for me to understand if the bar is... Um... Ah, yeah, so the bar likes queen g3. It's kind of hard to understand uh... why white is winning. Is it because we just collect the c4 pawn? Is that why white is winning? It's possible, right? Long term, yeah, any end games will be winning for white if you just take on c4. Yes, co connected passers simply, right? Then even the end game. Yeah. Simply connected connected passers. Is that is that is that enough? Maybe. For example, a5. Uh, let's say rook c7, queen g5. Bring up the board to show this. Yeah, let's let's just show it because I think it could be real. So a5, rook c7, queen g5, queen takes g5, a g knight c4. Is that winning for white? Is that what the computer is implying? <sighs> I mean, it looks close so to winning for me, but it, it went a bit down. Yeah, no. so, so that was not. So is a five? Uh, so is my point after a five to go knight c four directly, and then after a four, and then after a four, mm -hmm. uh, I don't go rook c seven. Oh, my knight e. Can I go knight e? No, what, to to cut, cut off the. Yeah, but it's not sure what's the point because rook c rook seven you have rook g eight. Cut cut this one off. Uh, let's keep going. Rook g eight, yeah. but maybe now I just go behind. Or even some yeah behind or some even some knight d5 kind of attacking business uh, mm -hmm. knight can come back in yeah maybe knight d5 it's as well interesting yes sort of a sort of a slow attack uh, second wave kind of thing and actually yes white wins a pawn a pawn can be stopped always with the rook mm -hmm. okay maybe maybe you know some sometimes uh, some people tend to uh, overestimate the the dangers of the past pawns. You might tend to over evaluate your a pawn. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, not an intuitive decision, Quincy 1f6 by Jan. It felt, it felt wrong, 
it felt wrong, but I guess Queen C3 Knight F7 was also looking very scary. I have to admit, I have to admit it was looking scary. So yeah, the fortunately for Ding, uh, he's still in control here. He's still very much in control, and now Jan is also dropping lower on the clock. Ding is feeling more comfortable. It's a big deal when you are in time trouble that the opponent joins you. It's a very big deal. Because being in the time trouble alone, you probably know, David, it's a very lonely, uh, very lonely journey. <laughs> yeah, I'm a very lonely man. Uh, always in time trouble myself. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> meanwhile, A5 on the board, Anish. We're heading straight down that line we showed. But I don't know. Like, is Ding going to go for the end game or not? Because the end game is also reasonably tempting, isn't it? Like knight four, knight a3. I, I okay, I hate the look of it, but if I get a knight on a3 and then I go c4, d5. Start marching down the board with my two pawns. It's possible, but of course, knight c4 is the is the money move. Of course, you don't want to trade queens. You you want to keep um, you know you want to keep it uh, keep it all in reserve, and you, you want to somehow be fearless and not be terrified by the a pawn marching down because it's not so fast. The a pawn is still not so fast. Big choice here for Ding. Rook c7 is a risk free option. Knight c4, knight e3 is the more ambitious one. I think knowing Ding's style and uh, his match situation, Knight C4, Knight E3 will come. Yeah, and we've talked about Ding dropping a bit low on the clock. He still only has six moves, though, to make to move 40, where he does get uh, an extra hour. So six moves in, what is it, 17 minutes should be fine. And here would be a good moment to spend maybe five to 10 of those minutes, actually, uh, because it is oh, such a, a key <laughs> crossroads. <laughs> No, you know, I hear my... I hearing the the instincts of the time trouble person. The ten minutes here, uh, spending more than half the time. I, it's well, fine. Well, this is David. a critical moment, Anish. No, no, David, David, this is not how it's done. Please. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I rely a lot on increment, and uh, in the world yeah. championship, they don't have that luxury at the moment. So maybe that's a no, bit but, uh, optimistic. But you are right. I forgot to look at uh, the move counter. It's already move thirty four. I didn't realize that, uh, and it's move thirty five now for Ding. I didn't realize how close we got the last few moves. At some point, the sequence uh, was very long and forcing. Remember, with uh, the moment he went rook b3, then actually like the next like almost 10 moves were uh, almost forced. So he got a lot of moves in there. And uh, now Ding indeed should spend time. Yeah, uh, I think five minutes is OK. OK, if you want 10, I give you 10. But there might be more decisions to make uh, in the next five moves. But this one is the key, yeah. And I, I think intuitively. and. Like everything screams for knight c4 instead of rook c7. I mean, uh, honestly, rook c7, knight c4, knight e3, that's a little bit miserable. Um, it's safe and it's, it's an attempt to play for a win without risk, but it's uh, it's a little bit miserable. It, it, and of course, the instinct of Ding is to go knight c4, knight e3, block the queen, then go for the attack, rook c7, and try to try to go for the kill and only go for the end game once once it's completely winning. Yeah, this black queen really living a miserable life. Actually, um, I can't blame Jan for going for this too much, but again, it feels a bit like he's rushing these decisions, A5 as well. There were options. He did spend his time, but um, I, I think he just, just the squeeze the three, knight of seven position, I, I mean, I can imagine he didn't like it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was also not, it was not solving the problems. Like, queen c3, knight e8 was bad, but queen c3, knight of seven, it kept, it kept the initiative going, and I think Jan didn't like it. He saw some issues with that, rook c7 was coming. He wanted to uh, protect this f pawn with a tempo, send the queen back to g3, and he thought, okay, rook 7 I have queen g5 always. So I can sort of understand where he's coming from. Understandable mistake, but yeah, not the not, uh, not computer precision by Jan uh, in this game so far, definitely not. Yeah, and that's the key question. Will Ding show computer precision? Knight takes c4 is obvious. Maybe we can jump into a board here, but knight e3, you do have to weigh up, right? Uh, it's Maybe that move is the tricky one. Knight takes uh, yeah, c4 and because after a4, uh, rook c7, I think rook g8 is not as tempting as queen g5, is it? Mm -hmm. And if you yeah, can get you, the queens you, off, you should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, Dingus, uh, it's difficult. I could see, I could easily see a, a, a strong player go for this end game. I could easily see that happen. Uh, even the end game, by the way, we will still, uh, it will still be, uh, you know, it will still be a question. Maybe you will win the end game. I don't think the end game is easy for black. Knight a3 and push c4 d5 and okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't see like uh, if you ask me, I would think I have good winning chances because if you go bishop b3, you don't have the counterplay with the rook. If you go bishop d3 with the idea of rook b8, after rook, I go c4, rook b8, rook a7, and I don't see how you uh, necessarily. Sorry, maybe I just go d5, rook b3, d6 as well, just more direct. Yeah. 
is a question. It's a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe bishop f5, but well, at some point the c pawn will join. Knight b5, rook a7 will, will happen. Yes, uh, both options very tempting. Knight, rook c7 as well. Rook c7 as well. But I think knight c4 started with knight c4. Uh, that is nice. I I hope for Ding that he will he will find that. Or choose that rather. There's nothing to find. There's just something to choose. Mm -hmm. And I guess he can do it from another move order, but uh, just less accurate potentially. Uh, rook yeah. c7. You might as well keep your options open options open here by taking on c4 first uh, with this idea of dropping back with the knight, which we also thought was strong. You might th think that you avoid rook g8 with rook c7 first, because mm -hmm. after rook c7, rook g8, their knight e8 wins on the spot. Nice. You might think that you avoid that. Um, but, wait, why am I not winning on the spot? King h... King h8? Or Whoa, this looks over, Anish, I agree. Uh, queen g5, six. just to show, um, there is a fork here at a 6, uh, using the pin. So where's the defense? King h8, maybe, or but it is uh, ridiculous. Wow. Ridiculous. <laughs> this looks like it should be knight, checkmate, but maybe knight not. Knight c4, knight c4, knight c4. Anyway, knight c4 is the move. Is this the move. Mm -hmm. On the board. It's, it's right anyhow the move. Basically, however you think about it, knight c4 was the move. How much time did he spend? It was a long seven. think. Yeah, like se seven, yeah. Yep. seven minutes. He did in between. He he followed, he listened to commentators, and he decided to go to take the mid, <laughs> middle road. I recommend five, you said ten. He took seven. Yeah, it's good. Uh, good decision there by Ding. A four will come instantly. I think A four is uh, is a must. Jan will return from the rest area. Play A four instantly, and then it will be a big choice. Rook c seven, so human, so human to go rook c seven. Knight e three, even more ambitious. Both moves are very close to winning. Matter of style, matter of taste. Mm -hmm. And as you predicted, A four immediately from Jan. Uh, that pawn was actually attacked as well, so you might as well push it. Hope for the best. Last pawns are there to be pushed, but uh, more importantly, checkmate. I think he's going to play knight e3. Ding just, it feels like he's in that type of mood. We haven't seen that many end games this tournament, uh, this match so far. Feels like he Let's wants bet. to go for kill. Uh, Let's, go bet. For Let's bet. Let's bet. Let's bet. I'll, I'll take rook c7. What are we betting, Anish? Uh, everything. My house, my. Uh... <laughs> no. I don't want your house. I just want that Magnus mug. I'll trade it for the. Okay, uh... okay, okay, okay. okay. I'll try no, it no. My mug. Okay, I, I don't, I'm not gonna put my Magnus mag on on uh, on debate here for for some. I'm not gonna jeopardize, you know. He's nervous though. You you're not nervous when you play rook c7. You are nervous when you don't play rook c7. Yeah, this is true. But you're also nervous in end games when you're facing an a pawn when you only have a knight. Knights are so bad against a pawns. I've seen those go wrong plenty of times. And he's about to make a move. Okay, my mug is on the line, Ding. Don't, don't you go knight d3. My mug is on the line. <laughs> if he doesn't go neither, then okay, it's uh, it's all good, yeah? Knight yeah. b6 or something, and knight b6 or something, then it's uh, nobody has gets my mug. Knight b6 is very likely also, by the way. Knight b6. Wow. Sorry, Anish. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ding there with the computer precision. Smelling, uh, smelling blood. Smelling blood and going for the kill. Going for the yeah. throat, wow. It just feels like his mood, this this whole match, it's like do or die, it's checkmate or be checkmated. And uh, yeah, he learned yesterday the queen and knight versus the queen and bishop. It's a bit of a kind of mirror image where Jan outplayed him with the knight versus bishop. He's trying yeah. to do the same. And uh, I'll, yeah, ask, uh, chess 24. <laughs> I'll ask Chess24 to send you a mug on my behalf. Of course, I'm not going to give you my mug. I mean, <laughs> that, I'm, not, I'm not that stupid, but I'm going to get you one ordered. I'm not going to clone you, any sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, meanwhile, Rook C7, a huge threat now. Jan, what's he going to play? I don't really see any tempting moves for Black other than pushing the A pawn, but that looked miserable, the variations we were showing there. Uh, I was thinking uh, I was thinking about a move. I don't think it's... Uh, no, it's, it's, it's losing. But I thought of Rook A7 preventing the Rook C7 move, but then even worse, I go to, to the 8th rank. I go Queen B8, Rook, Rook C8. Oof. So you cannot control the 7th rank. You have to prioritize. The 8th rank is even worse. So yeah. yes, I guess you push the A pawn, I guess. And Rook C7, in... you go Rook G8. Jan's in his rest area again. Just feels like he doesn't want to come back to the board when he knows he's in trouble. And he knows he's missed something or misevaluated something. Do you think he missed ninety three? Surely that was on Jan's radar. Uh, well, I think from afar he misassessed a bunch of things, and I think he underestimated ninety three uh, as well. 
I think from afar, he, he, he pinned his hopes on the A pawn and he thought as long as he's not mated and the A pawn goes up the board, it's all okay. But now I think he realized that the A pawn is not as strong as he had hoped for. Uh, it's, it's very limited what, what, uh, what it uh, has accomplished. And the threats, the second wave of the attack is very strong. So rook c7 followed by knight d5. Uh, that is still a massive, massive uh, attack. And he was somehow hoping probably that uh, as long as he can defend with rook g8 after rook c7, he will be sort of okay. And I can understand that. I can understand this thinking process. Uh, but yes, there's uh, sometimes yes, it just gets a little bit deeper than um, than the first instinct. And of course, yes. It's still not clear. I mean, it's still not so clear to me. I don't think it's all over. So let's say a3, rook c7, rook g8. Yep, let's jump into a board. Let's put uh, this line on, a3, very forcing, defending checkmate. Yeah, is this completely done? So, um, so knight, do you do you go for knight d5 already, or yeah. are you just controlling my pawn first? Which one? I'm Probably very passive in these. Yeah, I mean, they both look good. I would just at least look at this one first, because now I have a threat of just capturing on c2 and picking up this pawn. Yeah, and and maybe I need to move my bishop, and I cannot move it to b b3 because of knight f5 mm -hmm. when uh well, the g7 square is uh, also falling so i need to move my bishop somewhere to like e4 maybe mm -hmm. and yeah, then... that's a good square stopping me jumping forward this way you have many options of course you have many tempting options here i even wonder about a simple move like queen to d6 if you're not just picking up the a pawn but okay maybe you want to preserve the c pawn because maybe this is not as much as, as i as i can get Maybe I can also play like queen f4 first, queen g4, a lot of different moves. Yeah, it feels like it should be winning, right? This black queen is so yeah. far detached from the action, so offside right now. And uh, yeah, the other move you mentioned, Anish, more direct, maybe suiting Ding's uh, mood more for the game is knight d5. Instantly yeah, knight d5 is more direct for sure. No, knight d5 is the, is the money move. So then you just have to calculate king h8, only move. Mm -hmm. Then you can probably calculate uh, knight e7, I suspect. It's the most Attacking. tempting. Yep. Then you have to move the rook, let's say, to e8. Mm -hmm. And now, um, if, now we have to finish it. There must be a way. Yeah, knight f5, queen g5. It's not immediately over. So here you have to finish yeah. it. How do we finish this game? I mean, I'm again tempted to just come back and seven. stop your yeah, ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's maybe how you do it. Maybe. Yeah, and uh, Jan does because return to the board. Oh yes, excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, because after queen uh, g5, I can just take on g5 and I can even... Uh... I can check if yeah, you want. I thought king H yeah, this was my plan, but actually king h7 oh. maybe is some fighting chances. But, uh, well, there's many moves there. I think even d5, d6 maybe, or just retracting the knight back like to, to some square is also looking very good. Let's see, let's see. Janus, uh, okay, so bishop b1 first. He wants to keep the bishop away from a trade, potentially. Mm -hmm. And... Now rook c7 knight d5. It looks so good. It's even like it's up. We are up. We are up a tempo. Yeah. It's not, it's not even a good defensive attempt. Just up a tempo. Yeah, it feels odd from Jan. Bishop b1. No, it's, it's, it's wasting. No, it's wasting. It's, it's the same line we looked at, but just uh, with the a pawn only one step further away. No, this is just hopeless. Now knight d5. You have to play king h8. Then knight e7. You have to play rook e8, or some other rook move. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't see what he, what his defensive attempt is. It looks totally hopeless to me. Yeah, it feels like he's just almost given up uh, body language. He's still at the board. Ding's got 10 minutes left, but yeah, it feels like he Bishop essentially did. A mission of defeat, right, Anish? And only three moves to make for Ding. Uh, only three moves to make for Ding and 10 minutes. Wow, Ding uh, completely in, in control, uh, completely in control here. And suddenly, suddenly we are in a position where Ding just has to convert it. And it it does look. Uh, it is not yet that the game is over, but it is becoming already obvious to both the players. I think that White is winning, uh, completely winning, most likely. And you just have to put the finishing touches here. It's not uh, that the game is decided, of course. There is still a lot of tension there uh, in the air, but um, I, I think it's quite clear. You're up a pawn. A pawn is still so far away from queening. The counterplay is too slow. There should be a decisive blow here. 95, 97 is, I suspect, how it begins. This is just too tempting of a start. And that will already be move 39. Only one move before time trouble. Everything is uh, everything is uh, here going uh, Ding's way. Yeah, Ding doing his thing. And 95 
looks like the best move. I guess the idea behind bishop b1 was to prevent the white rook from moving uh, for now because the c3 pawn is on prees. But yeah, just move the knight out of the way. Looks straightforward. Yeah, does it feel like a repeat of yesterday, just with colors reversed, just with roles reversed, uh, Anish? It's a bit it's like yesterday. Yeah, was winning. Yeah. I read. Uh, I read someone. Uh, I read someone mentioned that interesting fact that so far all the games have been one sided, but not for not for the same player, which is very unusual. Uh, it's, they, they've always been one sided, but Jan won two one sided games and Ding won two one sided games, which is very weird because you have one sided game if you are much better. You would think, but I think that comes because they are very asymmetric, and uh, they are of equal strength with, with very, very asymmetric strength. So, uh, certain positions Ding is superior to Yan, certain positions Yan is superior to Ding, and uh, so, like you, you get these weird one-sided games by two different players, and yeah, well, it, maybe also they are both not uh, defending the best way so far, but they are attacking in the best way. Um, mm -hmm. That's possible. That's possible. I had, I once had, you know, when I was a kid, I had some, I had an interesting uh, small training camp with Vichy, uh, Vichy Anand. But we played training games, and all the games were the same, in a sense that one side would win very easily as well, <laughs> and it would be different. Sometimes he would beat me, sometimes I would beat him. And I remember also Kasim Janov was there. He was also, you know, he was like, this guy said, guys, it's so weird. You are somehow you are both not fighting. It's just like one wins and the other wins. Very weird. It happens sometimes. It happens. Um, and in this match, it's it's so far it's the theme of the match, uh, but it makes it only. I mean, it it, it makes it uh, very interesting because it's such a close match. But the games are so not close. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah, that's a pretty cool experience, Anish. Pretty cool name drop as well. Just hanging out with Anna and the training camp, playing some training games. Uh, but uh, yeah. me <laughs> oh, meanwhile, so I had a rare. I only had a few such opportunities, of course. It was uh, it was not the first one, so I was already a little older. The first camp with Anand, I can tell you what happened. I played a lot of training games with him, and I like like a lot, like we can say like fifty games, and I won two, and I wrote uh, both of them down, so I, the entire camp. So it was kind of uh, kind of funny. Yeah, chess players, we don't remember our losses. We remember all the victories, though. And uh, meanwhile, I did talking of victories. I did see in the featured chat just a few moments ago. Uh, I think from Bigfoot that. This is the first time the London system has been played in a world championship, and it looks like it's on course to have a 100% record. Impressive. The opening choice just inspired actually from Ding in hindsight. Yeah, how low have we fallen? As a, you know, it's a game. <laughs> <laughs> how low have we fallen? The new low reached in the world championship matches, guys. Though I must say, I am surprised because I think Magnus did a bunch of trash uh, in his world championship matches. He played the Trompovsky, he played also uh, the Kole, D493 E3. And Magnus could have definitely played London at some point uh, during his uh, dynasty or whatever uh, Daniel Rensch calls it. He could have definitely thrown in a London or two there, but he never did for some reason. But yeah, he'll, he's going to regret this. Somehow, I think what Magnus always expected, he expected his opponents to be better prepared than they were. Because we see here Jan. Jan is very well prepared. Somehow, Ding keeps getting opportunities. And I think um, Magnus wasn't he was playing all sorts of weird ideas in all his matches. It was too much in his own head, probably, trying to be mm -hmm. too deep. Because just playing the London, just playing, you know, like C3, Bishop out, Castle, Rookie 1, Knight to center, just make normal moves and you just can win a game. I mean, no need to, no need, uh, to do anything strange. Just play normal chess and the win. Magnus yeah, was also capable, yeah. That's what he does in tournaments, but uh, yeah, clearly players do adopt their strategy for World Championship matches, for better or worse. Sometimes you just need to do what you know best. And yeah. okay, Jan, meanwhile, playing A3, pushing the A pawn. Yeah, no, I think uh, indeed Magnus was mostly shining in uh, the tournaments because probably he expected some special prep from, uh, from players in the match. But it seems that uh, their prep is just as ordinary as during a normal tournament. Because at the end of the day, what more can you do? When you play a tournament, you also try your best. You just have to try your best. Okay, you have a bit more time. At the end of the day, you cannot memorize everything and you cannot understand everything. And yeah, uh, we should probably talk a little bit about the game as well because uh, things are moving somewhat. Yeah. And uh, it's, it is now Ding's turn. It's move 40. How much time does he have? It's five minutes. Okay, it's a lot of time for one move. And he is uh, ready to uh, ready for action. So I think, knight, is it 97? Uh, what are his options? Is it 97? That's at least the most obvious move, uh, maybe because we've pointed it out before. It's stuck in my head now, that move. It looks like Ding is about to play. 
and there we go, knight e7 indeed. But but so. what? Yeah. So how do you finish uh, after uh, same question as we had before? So how do we finish it off after uh, rook moves? Just to be to be clear. Yeah, and it's we'll look for that finish in a moment, Anish. It's worth pointing out we have reached move forty. Ding will get an extra hour on his clock, so he's left the board. Understandably, he'll go and refresh and. He's got that luxury, an extra hour to figure out how to win this. I think by now he'll know that he's winning. He's up a pawn. Yeah. Black's A pawn is under lock and key. Um, this white rook is going to keep it nicely uh, in check. And yeah, should we jump into a border niche? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's it's obviously completely winning. And I think it's uh, there are multiple uh, ways to do it. But uh, I'm just looking for the one that uh, forces a resignation. You know, I'm looking for a clean uh, finish. So, oh yeah, oh yeah. I think I maybe see what it i know so i was going to or yes so I move my rook yeah so oh yeah queen c7 wow uh threatening knight g6 if rook is seven which was what i was worried about maybe i have queen b8 mm -hmm. keep the queen nice. on the diagonal it's preventing any checks by keeping the white queen here and you take and if, assuming you're in time here with anything just yeah yeah queen, queen queen g3 back, if you need trade queens and go back yeah this is the worst case it's enough yeah um, and just yes. in time and i to push my own pawn. pawns as well yeah yeah uh, but after rook 8 queen c7 uh, maybe the defense is king h7 yeah it's the only move maybe mm -hmm. which i didn't see initially yeah. so yeah this, this is not yeah yeah this is not the forcing uh one i, I missed king h7 from afar okay so i don't do queen c7 Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see how else to finish it off. Okay, any knight move is um, is a candidate. Yep. Knight f five is queen g five. Uh, knight g six. A g. Okay, this is not not maybe winning on the spot, although it's very very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing the win immediately either. What about knight f five? Uh... Mm -hmm. I'll drop back with the queen to defend. Yeah, yeah, you take. could probably even trade queens. I should, uh, I should, I think I should, because h5 is hanging. Yeah, knight d, knight, mm -hmm. knight d6, knight e3. Yeah, knight I don't want to allow a2. I don't want to allow a2. Okay, knight d7 also. Mm -hmm. I don't want to allow a2. I want to win on the spot. So if I go knight d6, mm -hmm. attacking me. Oh I yeah, have yeah, to, yeah. I guess okay, move. no, okay, knight of seven, h6. This is mate. It's just ah, mate. Ah, wow. It's a nice, nice. mate, actually. <laughs> yeah. Check. <laughs> got trapped there. Your G pawns are stumbling into these. Yeah, 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 mate. Next move guaranteed. Almost forced. And uh, is that wow. it? I think that I think that's a, that's a win. I'm not, I'm not sure it's the win, mm -hmm. but it's a win. It's good enough. Maybe maybe I messed up here, Nish. Maybe after queen takes queen, I should take with the F pawn uh, in hindsight, ah. just to prevent you mating me in that way. Uh, but that position is anyway lost. So let's say I go knight d6, rook e7, knight f7. Sorry, knight rook a8, rook a8, knight 7 is king mm -hmm. g8. No, rook a8 check, it's much yep. more accurate. Uh, king h7, knight f7, g6. I can take on a3 and just win it slowly. Uh -huh. I suspect. Yes. But may maybe, or hg, yeah, it can even go hg first. Mm -hmm. Because if you take with the bishop after knight e5, your bishop doesn't support the a pawn. Yeah, I think this is the most, I think this is the most straightforward human way to win. It, this is mm -hmm. enough. So rook e8 maybe is the losing losing one. Maybe you can try some other rook move in the starting position. But I don't think they they'll help you. They look even worse. Maybe rook f8 or. I don't you don't have so. many. You pretty much have a choice of three here for Jan. He's uh, thinking over his move forty with twenty two minutes left. But yeah, it looks like all all roads lead to Rome at this point. Um, that's one of many, as you say, Anish. And Ding has an hour to work out whether he can go for checkmate, whether he can pick up the a3 pawn. Yeah, um, even better. Uh, situation amazing uh, amazing match seriously this is completely uh, completely remarkable what what we are seeing i haven't seen something like this in a long time i, I mean i've uh, looked at i've uh, followed all world championship matches starting from kramnik topalov i think i followed them all uh, kind of live and mm -hmm. okay kramnik topalov was an insane match though it had some crazy start with kramnik losing a game then uh, then i think not showing up to the second one getting a loss as well so he started down two games and then he somehow came back with two wins and took it to tiebreak. That was that. I think the one that comes close is Anand Topalov. That was a very tipsy turn. Yeah, Anand Topalov had uh, Topalov, uh, Anand bouncing back once, then Topalov bouncing back as well. 
and then losing in the final round. So I think, yeah, we had some uh, ups and downs in the World Championship match history and the recent World Championship match history. But uh, the more recent ones of Magnus, they were much more cagey, much more slow. Just so many draws were always there. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, mm-hmm. the matches, they didn't bring the best out of Magnus until the last World Championship match, where after he uh, managed to somehow open the floodgates mm-hmm. in game six, then he, he started collecting win, uh, win after win. But um, a lot of other Magnus matches, they were just uh, very slow, and we got used to a slow pace, while here, okay, it's completely different. Just a win after win by both players, and uh, after this game, we'll have an equal score again. Remarkable stuff. Yeah, and you mentioned those two words, game six. It always seems to be game six. I'm just remembering, uh, yeah, Fisher against Baski, game six. Uh, yeah, Magnus striking, of course, game six last time. This blunder between, uh, this mutual blunder between Anand and Carlson, game six in 2014. Just always seems to be this game, and Jan must be sick of the sight of this one. Uh, he wants to get to, to the second half at this point. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, he tried rook f8. Uh, his idea yeah. is that uh, after knight f5, queen g5, he no longer loses uh, to this, no longer lo- loses the tempo to the knight d6 move. So it makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. Can I, can I try something uh, different here? Is my question. Uh, can I try to finish yeah. it off on oh. the spot? I'm wondering, Anish, whether we can go for that variation you mentioned earlier, queen c7. Because now the rook on f8 will be hanging after knight g6 in many lines. But it um, anyway goes to g8, though, right? Uh huh. King h7, knight g6, rook g8, yeah, probably. I'm mm-hmm. looking outside this move, queen d6. I don't know if it's uh, at all good, but it's a move uh, with a very clear threat. Yeah. Also, this pawn will be under fire from queen d6. Oh, yeah, I, like I didn't that even one realize. Too. Oh, actually, I didn't realize. There's actually a double attack potentially there. Yeah, yeah maybe queen d6 is the cleanest here. Looks like there are many good options here for Ding Laren. He's away from the board. So is Yanda Pomniashi. We have reached move 40. Both players have been given an extra hour on the clock. And we think this one is going to be a win for White. But let's take a few minutes break and we will be back with a conclusion of Game 6 of the 2023 World Championship. What's the best way to follow any chess event from the World Chess Championship to the candidates, the Speed Chess Championship, Title Tuesday, and so much more. Chess.com slash events has all of the top chess tournaments played both over the board and online. Analyze and review games from the world's greatest players with live commentary, cloud analysis, opening explorer, and table bases. Find all the key event information, including schedules, prizes, results, news reports, player bios, tie breaks, and more. Even compete by voting for your predicted results. Explore chess.com slash events today on web or with our iOS and Android apps and experience chess like never before. Hey everybody, it's Danny here, and as you may know, Chess.com and Chessable are now one, and I'm here to show you how you can make your Chess.com and Chessable one in just a few clicks. To start, let's log in and connect our Chess.com account. I just scroll right here above the browser and click log in. Scroll down and click continue with chess.com. Now, if you're already logged into chess.com, it's just gonna ask you if you wanna approve that connection. I'm gonna say yes, sir. But after approving, it'll bring you right back to the Chessable homepage. Now, the Puzzle Connect feature can be found under Tools and you click Puzzle Connect. Now, what that does after you type in your username is it's gonna pull positions from the games you played on chess.com, create your very own personalized chessable course, and then quiz you with the positions where you may have missed the best move. And the more you play on chess.com, the more games it will have to quiz you as long as your account stays connected. It's pretty sweet, and it's gonna help you get better learning from the mistakes in your games. Yes, this is a pro feature at chessable, but if you go to chessable.com slash link, you can get 30 days of pro for free. I do 
recommend Meetup to a lot of my friends that are looking for different things. Wine tasting, movies, book club. Meet a lot of new people, a lot of new friends, and it will make you more social. What is a chess dynasty? Unceasing dominance, move after move, again and again and again. We have a oh. resignation, we have history. He is the five-time FIDE World Chess Champion. But a chess dynasty can also be cruel. It forces most to defer their dreams until next time, if there is a next time. It's losing. Oh my God, did he just blow Yeah, him? he did. I'm blown away, the game is over. As the chess world turns to Kazakhstan, the Magnus Carlsen dynasty is set to close. The FIDE World Championship is finally up for grabs. For two chess superstars lying in wait, until next time is now. Jan Nepomneshi has methodically done what he needed to do to get another shot at the title. The pressure to seize the moment this time rests heavily upon him. Yana Pamnishi once again holds a one point lead in the 2023 World Championship match. What an incredible bounce back. Ding Li Ren knows firsthand what the end of this dynasty means an unexpected chance to make history. 
Can China's best turn his good fortune into eternal fame? Yan is just gonna smash through on the king side. Ding didn't have a good day. This is all over. And what a game, I have to say. The legacy of this championship spans across centuries. It reads from the names of chess giants. For the first time in a decade, a new name will raise the trophy and be etched into chess history. It's the 2023 FIDE World Championship. Whose name will next be called champion? Hello and welcome back to Chess.com's coverage of the FIDE World Championship 2023. We're currently in game six. We see Ding Liren poised to strike back to level the scores at 3-3 by winning his second white game in a row. He's been playing a great game so far. I'm here with Grandmaster Anish Giri, the world number six. We've been taking you through the action and Anish, any chance now for an upset, any chance for Jan to save this or do you think he's got it in the bag? Well, everything is uh, going against uh, against Jan right now. I think the fact that we've just reached move forward is very unfortunate as well. Very bad news. Ding's got an hour to figure this out. There are plenty of good moves here available. Of course, it can always happen because let's not kid ourselves. The position is not decided yet. I mean, I uh, I know many commentators when they see the evaluation bar, they start to um, talk about how completely winning a position is. And I notice a lot of people actually do it and sometimes I myself do it. But if we actually look at the position without uh, the bar, without the computer, and okay, it's still, of course, uh, it's still not finished. The A-pawn is extremely far advanced, so you have to find the finishing blow. You have to still be accurate. There are a lot of options, but none of them appear to win on the spot, uh, at least not, not immediately. So it's possible, of course, it's possible, but uh, you cannot imagine a better situation for Ding, a winning position, more than one way to win, and a lot of time on the clock just after the time control. So... No, I don't think it's likely. Yeah, he is investing that time wisely. It's a good moment to kind of reset, to freshen up at move 40. Uh, he spent around 10 minutes now, I think, Ding. And uh, yeah, he's certainly calculating right now. Plenty of forcing lines. You mentioned, though, that uh, maybe no knockout blow, uh, Anish, after calculating for a bit. Can Ding take, a, kind of take his foot off the pedal and find maybe a more prosaic way to win? The one... One move that I think uh, is the lazy way to play, and um, I'm not sure this is the right way to go. I think this is how you often uh, start messing up these positions. But one laziest way to play is knight g6, bishop g6, 8g. Uh, I really like that um, I, that approach because with that, you first of all establish the spawn on g6, which is there forever. Black will forever have the back rank issue. The bishop, once gone from b1, will not be able to support the a pawn. So I, I'm sure that after knight g6, 8g, white is winning. Uh, I don't know how easy it will be to convert because you will have to deal with some some, uh, some kind of in h5, queen d1, uh, perpetual check idea. So let's say black will play queen d1, you will have to deal with that somehow. Um, also, you have to keep an eye on the g6 pawn a little bit. You have to keep an eye on the a pawn. It's not trivial, but it should be winning. But I don't think that this is what you want to do. I think this is what you do if you don't see anything better. But I suspect that there are some better moves, um, some better ways uh, to, to play. Um, that Okay, that move queen d6 was sort of, um, I sort of mentioned. I guess that was the most natural that I had seen. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't think it was one of the engine moves. Um, maybe maybe there is something uh, wrong with it. Maybe rook e8 is... Uh, is a re response because King H or, or King H7, maybe King H7. I have we, some Knight D5, maybe. Should we jump into a board and try and figure out what yeah, we would do right, if we right. were in Ding shoes? Yeah, um, because nowadays, you know, the bar is so ruthless that uh, mm. player, people very often, the commentators very often stop analyzing kind of early because they mm. think, okay, it's completely winning. And then they get completely shocked when the players um, uh, make mistakes. But uh, to be to be very honest, I think the position is very unanalyzable. It's still very far from from clear. So queen d6 is. Uh, we saw the bar just uh, took a small hit there. I think king h7 is knight d5. I think that looks winning. So I I would I don't see another move than rook e8 because I'm threatening knight g6 check and then I'll pick up the rook with a check either with a knight or with a queen. So all the bishop moves are losing. All the queen moves are losing. I have very little options. I can either move my rook 
and the only square is e8 or move the king, which is king h7. So I think there are just two moves there. Maybe rook e8 is the best, uh, but then... There's a small okay, trap yeah. here as well. Rook h3, rook e7, yeah? Rook yeah. e3, rook e7. And mm -hmm. suddenly the whole advantage disappears. Uh, this is perpetual check. The white king can never escape. If you go forward, you get uh, mated even. And yeah, if you go back, this repetition that we've seen a few times now, and uh, yeah, the king gets chased. So yeah, too some easy. traps, some ghosts. Too think? easy, yes, yes, a trap, but too easy. Somebody mentioned here, so uh, in chat, uh, I think it's uh, going to take half an hour. I'm not, won't be shocked if he does, won't be shocked, because this could be the last big thing that he should take. You know, when I uh, at some point switched on the... Uh, lines of the engine just to see the options that engines adjust the first line completely shocked me you know it was i think it was oh now i get it oh, I, uh, but it actually it's a very difficult move to make it wins on the spot oh it wins on the spot actually i get it rook b7 wins on the spot wow if you gave me 20 guesses in each i wouldn't no, but no, have but suggested the, this one david it's because it's because you didn't see the point like i also didn't get it at all but if you think about it for for one second you see immediately it's, it's on rook b8 it's just uh, it's, it's you can resign mm -hmm. it's over yeah, but it's it all over. It feels so counterintuitive to let this pawn advance uh, to just take your eye off it for a moment. But like you say, yeah, it's yeah, over. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You you think the rook is well placed there, and you don't see the rook b eight idea because the idea is of course a one rook rook f eight and queen g queen g six. Mm -hmm. Let's show this uh, a one. You make a new queen. Check and checkmate. Beautiful stuff. <laughs> but I also I am pretty sure I would have never seen that move because yeah. also I have many alternatives. So I think I would never find the rook b8, rook b7. I mean, unless I think forever, and I just uh, by elimination. But it's just not the I, like exactly. It's so counterintuitive to remove the rook from behind the a pawn. But once I see the move, so I, once I uh, said said it out loud, rook b7, I immediately realize, of course, that it's winning on the spot. It's just it's just over immediately. Like it's just there's nothing to talk about. Yeah, you just did say after rook b7. Earlier in the uh, broadcast, you did say if you break through on the 8th rank, it's even better than the 7th rank. So <laughs> it makes sense from that point of view. But yeah, incredibly hard visually. Uh, it looks like you're focusing on this point and you actually want to background yeah. checkmate. You know, if you think Fabi maybe can find such, like there are some players, you know what it depends on? So it depends on your search algorithm because everybody has a certain search because you cannot, of course, calculate all the moves in chess because um, the tree of the variation is too wide. The question is uh, how... Um, how do you select your move? For example, I know that Magnus, he has a very narrow search. So that's why he's very quickly reaching a very good conclusion because he dismisses a lot of bad moves on each turn. And I notice it because that's also why he often misses um, some, some tactics because he's just dismissing moves. And this allows him to go extremely deep. And uh, he, he can afford to do this uh, as well because he has an incredible um, evaluation. Uh, function so he is able to evaluate uh, positions extremely fast and i think a player like magnus who calculates this way he might just never uh, consider rook b7 but there are players that calculate much more uh, much more broadly in particular fabiano has an extremely wide search he is looking at a lot of options uh, for both sides on the first few moves and i'm pretty sure if uh, you give half an hour to fabi he will spot rook b7 simply because it enters his radar because he considers more moves he considers more moves basically but uh, it doesn't mean that you come to a better conclusion it means you waste much more time and you spend time in the wrong direction very often but he just spends much and i i don't know what kind of calculator ding is um but he could he could find rook b7 but again there are other ways to win as well that are much more intuitive so mm -hmm. not sure Yes, yeah, fascinating the point you make. Uh, I also attended a lecture recently where Magnus was uh, basically saying he goes on instinct and he calculates deeply from those variations. Uh, also, one of the speakers at that lecture was uh, Ramesh, and he was encouraging these young Indian players to do a scan of the board. It's like, okay, do you have any good moves with your rook? Here, it doesn't look like you do, but uh, if you ask yourself that question, uh, maybe you find rook b7, knight, queen, likewise. And okay, d5 played by Ding. He immediately leaves the board and there we do see a question mark from the uh very harsh chess.com uh trainer there it looks like a good move to me why not push him? yeah 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 no the board? the thing is that uh, of course the, the algorithm and it's understandable um it's probably possible to fine tune actually as well at chess.com um when the eval drops from let's say plus five to plus three 
you can probably change the algorithm that it doesn't uh, show the move as a mistake because essentially both are winning. At the same time, sometimes, you know, a plus three is less than a plus five. So D5 compared to rook B7 is a mistake, but okay, position is still winning. And after uh, thinking for longer, the bar, um, the bar went uh, higher up. It's plus four now. So yeah, even the question mark disappeared. No, D5 is uh, a much more human uh, attempt to win. So the question I have is, so A2 is uh, probably queued up. So after A2, what is the idea? Or is the idea simply that black doesn't have a next move? Maybe that's the idea. You can get the pawn to a2, but no further. Uh, the go... a1 square. Yeah, is it, is it, is it, does he just want to go d6 or, or not? Is that simply the idea? Just push the d-pawn as far as possible? Possibly. Um, I don't see any reply to that for black. The black queen needs to be... Uh, sorry, my arrows. The black queen needs to be back in time to g5. So the queen can't move. The bishop has to protect the pawn if it lands on a2. Black is a bit stuck. Black is frozen. So it makes a lot of sense that white can uh, push the pawn forward. I'm liking it. And uh, Jan is back at the board and clearly in calculation mode. I don't think he would have expected this somehow. It's not as forcing as all the other options we were uh, looking at. So he needs some time to react, uh, some time to think. And Anish, yeah. how do you think well, he'll react? Yeah. I think a2. Uh, I think a2 at the end of the day... Um... I don't see how other moves contribute to to anything. Okay, he can try. He can try to go queen d1, but he, yeah, I think he's reaching for the a pawn. I guess queen d1 intending queen h5, but then probably f3 just does the job. No, a2, a2. Of course, he goes a2. Yeah, and now I just want to I want to establish. So is it is it uh, ah okay okay okay. No, in fact, the computer suggests that d6 is not the way. Okay, something even better. Yeah, queen c7. I'm just trying to understand queen c7. If what what has changed? So if king h7, mm -hmm. it's complicated, mm -hmm. Anish. Just, it is It is a little bit complicated, but yeah, I do feel Ding maybe could have found a cleaner way to do this. This feels messy now, at least with the black pawn on a2. We didn't see but what wait, next. Give, black, give him but... a benefit of the doubt. So it, it is plus four. And uh, mm -hmm. it is after queen c7. I just I think he probably sees sees it because I, he didn't need to go d5. So he he probably sees it. I don't see it just yet. Queen c7, king I think h7, mm -hmm. and then if knight f5. Yeah, let's knight jump five, in. Just... Anish. Uh, I'm just trying to remember what what changed. So why did we play d5? What so has you, changed? You want to break through here, but black has multiple moves. Queen g5, I guess. Doesn't look like much I, yeah, has changed I was thinking here. About knight, oh yeah, but knight g7. I thought maybe knight g7 was the idea, but yeah. Uh, maybe knight g7. What is the defense here? Oh, queen e5 feels. Wait, queen e5, I take a knight e6. Yeah, this is crazy stuff. Maybe I just move my king and what do you do next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this was I a take resource. This pawn yeah. If you move this your knight. Is, this was always the resource. Yeah, forget about it. No, sorry. So, yes, yes. That's why I didn't. So, king h7 was the defense. Queen mm -hmm. c7, king h7. Okay, so this bar is all the way up. So let's let's try to find it. What's what's going on here? Knight where uh, knight g six is rook g eight. Yeah, let's put that on the board. Threatening checkmate. You have to defend. I don't see a knockout blow here. But the bar suggests that there is one. What is this pawn doing? On d five. What has it changed? What? Yeah. Wait. <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> So confusing. What is the, some some checkmate. I oh okay. Wait wait. There is a. Um... Is it? You know what okay. is the fun fun fact is that if I had my rook on a eight, then queen takes g seven would be a checkmate. That was that's just a fun fact. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, we see Ding come back to the board very excitedly. Uh, he was away for a, min a moment or two, I think, in his rest area, just trying to calculate this variation that we're looking at. It bugs me that I don't. Yeah, it bugs me that I don't see it, and I really want to find it. Hmm. I really want to find it, but is... uh, I I hope for him that he found it. That's that's what matters. I don't have to find it now, though. I I do want I do want to. Yeah. It does disturb me. Critical moment. Maybe he'll show us before we can work it out. Anish, it looks like he's. I hope not, because I'm really I really like the challenge. I really like the challenge, but I, I don't know. Do you see? It? Do you do, you don't see it also? It's not easy, no. It's not easy. I mean, not easy. It, mm. it's like you said earlier, everything looks winning, but it's an illusion. Uh, you still have to be a bit careful, a bit accurate. Black does have some resources. Mm, it's, yeah, it's not at all. Uh, no, no, it's not. It's really not obvious. I'm struggling here. Got to say, what that position it? we were stuck on, queen c7, the first move. But he sees it. 
he sees it, you know? This is the remarkable part. He sees it. You think so? He looks yeah, like he's very excited. Yeah, 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 he's excited and he sees it's probably something pretty even. Wow. Oh, it's so disturbing that I don't see it. Look, he sees it. You see, he's going for it. Yes. What is yeah. it that he's going for? What is the finisher? After King H7, Knight G6, Rook G8, what is the finishing touch? Wow. He is a genius, Ding. So he's uh, going to oh, show us something clever. He is, he is. And it's, it's his moment to, to shine. So yeah. he, he is more than a genius and he should do it. I'm also being yeah. told, Anish, mm -hmm. that uh, this was the only winning, well, the only directly winning move. Everything else, the advantage would uh, have been yes, greatly yes. diminished. But he went D5. He went D5 with the idea to do this. But I, I just don't know what this is. <laughs> this is beautiful. This is something... I see some different patterns, but I don't see the the order in which I can do it. I'm struggling as well. King H7. Is the deep one, yeah, is deep one involved? I don't think the deep one is involved. And I don't know why D5 had to be played for the this to work. Pawn. <laughs> I don't <gasps> see what the deep... You see it? Wait, he's closed a mating net, Anish. The king, oh wow, okay, we have to show this uh, on the board. I think I've come up with the idea. Let's okay, uh, yeah. jump in. Both players are away right now. I think he wants to sacrifice his queen, and d5 does contribute here. So, okay, there's a discovered check. We were assuming uh, king h7. Let's bring up the analysis board while Yan returns. And now knight g6, we were saying rook g8, but Anish, queen f7. And I'm going to take this and checkmate you. Oh, that's weird. Look at this. See, I'm not. Uh, this is not my strength. Checkmates. checkmates. I'm gonna start. So I'm bad at checkmates. Checkmating patterns. There is a video online also where a bunch of top players solve checkmates. It's, it's just not my strength. It's just very difficult. Oh, this is beautiful. Wow. And so this weird. is why the d4 d5 push contributes. You cover the e6 square. Cover the escape square. He saw this. What was it? Five oh, six Jan moves in advance. It? Does Jan see it? He doesn't. He, he plays king h7. Well. I think he sees it. Oh, it just didn't occur to me. Oh, D5 takes away the E6 square. Oh, wow, that's a beautiful finisher. Ooh. Yeah, I just didn't... Wow, amazing. Wow, that's so beautiful. I must say, shout out to the featured yeah. chat. I saw that uh, people were hinting that it was a beautiful finish, and that's the only way you can stumble across this. Unless you're yeah. Ding, and you're, unless you're a genius. I would never have found this either. No, it reminds uh, me of something. Like, uh, it reminds me of something. But it's, it's a very difficult position to solve. I, I'm sure it's difficult. I'm sure it's a very difficult one to solve because uh, yeah, these ideas are, of course, queen takes g8 and rook a8 is is a theme that we all know with the pawn on f7. This I could find, but the one where the king comes comes to f7 and no, nonetheless gets mated, that's a very unusual theme. This is very rare. Really remarkable that he from all the options he found this one. This is really tough. It's much harder than to me than rook b7, rook b8. This is really like okay, but yeah, maybe it's. Uh, Oh, it's amazing, yeah. Wow, that he found it. It's uh... incredible stuff. Shout out to problem. shout out to Ding for finding this beautiful checkmating pattern. Shout out to the feature chat for giving us a clue on that queen sacrifice. You're like a rapper, and... you know. Shout out, you know, you're a good you know, <laughs> a rap song. Shout exactly. out to Ding, you know. Also, the forty thousand people watching uh, over in Twitch. Yeah. Uh, what a moment this is about to be. We're about to see one of the most beautiful finishes to a world championship game. Uh, I think in history, Anish. Every no, but it's every day. I mean, the guys, they're just like the final positions are so beautiful every time. It's just incredible. It's, seriously, it's, it's disturbing how beautiful the stuff is. It's like, I mean, it's just aesthetically. I, was, I said it yesterday, but it just keeps happening. This is just so beautiful from a chess point of view. It's just so incredibly satisfying, this checkmate. Wow. It's so satisfying. It's so hard also to see that. Seriously, it's, uh, how do you spot D5 with idea Queen 7? How do you even spot this? It's, it's completely beyond me how you can see it from, from afar. I, you must be total genius. Yeah, and I guess the way he found D5 first was spotting this whole tactic, realizing the Black King was running, and then yes. kind of tracing us back to square one. Yeah, he saw Queen C7. Seven. He saw Queen C7. Then he saw Queen C7, <laughs> King H7, Knight G6, Rook G8. He saw Queen F7. Yeah. He saw Queen takes G8 doesn't work because of uh, King of 7 King E6. And then he worked his way back. Yeah. That's, what, that's probably what must, but it's seriously sick. It's a uh, sick stuff. It's sick stuff. Wow. And Jan, I don't think Jan saw it coming either, but he certainly sees it coming now. He's realized what's happening. A queen sacrifice is guaranteed at this point to deliver yeah. checkmate. Black can only postpone the inevitable. And Yeah. I'm curious if wow. Jan had seen it coming from like a move or two before. I'm just curious because mm -hmm. uh, there are a few checkmates, you know, I have a collection. Uh, there are a few. I should actually make collection, but I've I've missed also some. Uh, there are a few checkmates uh, which are like very short, like 
one, two, three move checkmates like that, but they are extremely hard. And um, it's really interesting that some top players see them uh, and some don't. And I think it has to do with how many uh, uh, how many checkmate patterns you solve as a kid. Like, let's say we all solve like a thousand or two thousand, ten thousand, but some have solved hundred thousand, mm -hmm. and some are exceptional, like Mamediar of Duda, uh, some Vichy, uh, Polgar, some who have solved a crazy amount of puzzles as, as kids. They are more exceptional at um, checkmate patterns. While some other top players, um, uh, they, they are they have other strengths and they are, they are less alert to this uh, to this check many patterns. But yeah, Ding has uh, found a very beautiful one, and it also he set it up from so from afar. The D five already sets it up. It's really really insane. He set it up four moves ago. He's about to execute it. And uh, Anish, the eternal question as a chess player, do you resign now knowing yeah. you're about to get checkmated or do you let it play out on the board if you're Jan? No, but uh, I know that you British guys, especially you, you are all about uh, checkmate on the board, but no, I, I'm, uh, I'm Team Jan, I, I resign. No, I don't want to see it. And uh, just as you say it there, Anish, Jan has resigned. You called it no beautiful checkmate on the board, but still a beautiful game, beautiful finish from Ding. And the scores are level at 3-3. Three, three. What a day it's been. No, but I'm still, uh, I still need to recover from the final checkmate. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. And we will recap that uh, that checkmate, the incoming checkmate for the viewers after this. Yeah, Ding though, he's got to be buzzing. He's got to be high now. Momentum swinging in this match day after day. Who would have predicted this? Well, at this point, you could have predicted it already. <laughs> it's already, it was, it was, it was already, a, it was already a thing. Um, Ding has come back once. At this point, you could predict the unpredictable, and uh, but yeah, uh, it's really unusual stuff and. You know, again, like yesterday, it was Jan who looked like the best player in the world, and Ding looked very miserable in the entire game. And today is the opposite. It's a Ding. It's it's a Ding show today, and uh, wow, like uh, day in day out, like the players they are able to bring their best, um, but they alternate. That's uh, very unusual, and uh, yeah, a remarkable match so far. With uh, and a lot, a lot is a lot more is left, a lot left in store for us as uh, we are still approaching the first half the finish of the first half of the match yeah it's only game six and uh still eight rounds to go in this one definitely feels like the players are inspiring each other uh, to show their best striking back uh kind of continuously at this point and anish shall we go and recap this uh this incredible game from ding right from move one we're hoping for a press conference a bit later on but um, yeah, while the players have left the stage, let's go back to the beginning. And uh, it was the London system, the infamous London system, Anish. Yeah, and the Jan chose this very simple setup, a healthy setup with the uh, 5CD4. At that point, uh, instead of 5CD4, there are a lot of different options. The, there's a big line with Queen B6 take B2, for example, right here, and Knight H5 as well. But he went for the simplest of, of all, CD, ED, Bishop F5. And now Ding went for the very unassuming, very quiet C3, like Bishop B5 followed by C4 is much more uh, principled. But that's what Jan has prepared mainly. That's where he went deep. His complications, he has figured them out. Instead, Ding went for the very unassuming C3, E6, Bishop B5, allowing Black to develop comfortably. He didn't want much, just wanted to get the post structure, just wanted to play this position. Maybe he realized that Jan is not comfortable in the Karlsbach structure, so he realized he could get it to colors reversed. And uh, just rookie one, and already here, Jan maybe made a few inaccuracies. H6 allows knight e5. Instead, queen c7 dropping back uh, out of the knight x e5, d takes e5 fork was maybe more clever. H6 is the most natural move to keep the bishop on f5, not allow knight h4. But now knight e5 came with the tempo. Bishop c6 already kind of annoying, as after bc before the c6 square will be c6 pawn will be um, uh, weakness. So Jan logically went for knight e7, and after a4. I think here, Jan, uh, the sequence he went for, this was a big, big positional mistake. He went a6, followed by knight d7, allowing Ding to fix his pawn structure. Now, after takes, takes, and a5, the knight is heading to c5. And uh, the queen side pawns are blocked in such a way that you cannot kick the knight out ever. And this was already very unpleasant. And uh, yeah, it was already determined, let's say, who is going to press here. And uh, then around move 22, something interesting happened after. Jan tried to drum up some counterplay with e5, move 22. Uh, yeah, here Ding went for a concrete sequence with uh, rook b3 instead, and the play just 
went somewhat out of uh, control. The thing was always in control, but it, it went sort of, uh, uh, started to get very forced. And uh, Jan had some chances, according to computer. And I think the decisive moment was around move 32 after rook c5. The computer was claiming that there is a defense after queen takes c3, knight takes f7. Still possible to defend there. Uh, but what Jan did was not good because after queen c1 and f6, he kept the f pawn, but Ding simply captured the c pawn. And uh, the a pawn looked like it's going to drum up a lot of counterplay. And it actually reached a2 in the game, but it reached no further as uh, Ding found a mating net in the end, yeah. and a very beautiful one. And there were multiple ways to, to win, but his is the... Rugby 7 very beautiful, by the way. Very beautiful too, but his is actually much harder and much, much prettier, in my opinion, this d5, followed by queen c7, and then queen f7, setting up queen takes g8. Yeah, amazing. And we see the players already ready for the press conference. Yeah, beautiful finish from Ding. And uh, hopefully we can hear what he has to say about his victory. Let's see if we can get uh, that press conference up. And uh, yeah, here we go. In with the players. Welcome everyone at the press conference of round six. We had one more decisive result today. Ding Liren won with white pieces and the result is three to three. The first question to Ding, how comfortable was it for you to play London system today in the game? And if this was your home preparation, how many moves was the home preparation? <clears throat> well, uh, uh, actually today I was very, uh, and I'm not sure which opening to play, and, and the last time I decided to, to go for this London system. Uh, so the line appear, occurred in the game, he played bishop e5 was out of my preparation, so I just tried to keep the position as uh, not so forced as, and keep some possibility to play for a win. And I think it turned out to be quite well. Right, thank you. And the uh, the question to Jan, if you have expected that today the London system might be might be happen, and also uh, the second question right away, what was the most challenging for you for this game? Um, well, yeah, I just among among all openings, of course, I expected like London in one of the games, so it happened. Uh, yeah, but I guess I played uh, one of my worst games ever. Uh, so, I mean, like, nearly every move was, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's hard to, I think every move was bad. And even uh, then I get the second chance out of this awful position. Mm -hmm. I think it was, like, pretty much equal at some point if I would play bishop d3 instead of bishop c2. Uh, yeah, even that uh, was, uh, yeah, unfortunate. So, yeah, bad day. Right. If I may can ask, uh, what was the, uh, the the inaccuracy that all this started? I mean, uh, it's all. I mean, my whole game cont like uh, it uh, all contains of inaccuracies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Um, and the question to Ding. Um, you have spent quite a lot of time today on the board instead of the rest area. Have you found your comfort zone right now on the table? Yeah, I spent most of my time after he played e5, rook b3. Yeah, this was uh, not, not my plan, not according to my plan. Maybe I should have played b4 instead of rook b3. So before that, the position was nearly one side. I was the one who pressing and he didn't have much counterplay, but after e5, after knight a5, suddenly he has a lot of counterplay. Yes, so maybe I'll play. I didn't play so well in the middle of the uh, games, but yeah, I'm very happy to find rook a5. This might be the critical move. Um, yeah, in general, 
and uh, I feel I was in very good shape there during that whole game, and I it, it I was not so uh, influenced by yesterday's lose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, I will now give the floor to the press for the questions. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions for today's game. Please, Mike. Thanks, uh, Mike Klein with Chess.com. My question is for mostly for Grandmaster Jan Napomnishi. I'd like to ask you about a very specific moment in the game. After h5, there was this very strange resource, rook takes e5, d takes e5, queen back to d8. I'm wondering if you saw this at all with ideas of queen d1 and queen h5, or did you see it but, and reject it because of the response queen f3? Uh, no, I didn't see, but I somehow thought at that moment that, uh, I mean, the position is not as, like, as bad or something, I, I think, like, once again, with the bishop d3 move or something, it's quite, uh, uh, I mean, I, I definitely it's worse, but it's surely holdable. Uh, yeah, but uh, perhaps after bishop c2, that's, uh, yeah, that's not so easy. But, uh, yeah, I guess uh, this is some nice trick, like, takes the queen d8, but, um, yeah, it's like, it's not checker, so you shouldn't, uh, I mean, you're not forced to capture on g6. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Can I ask in Russian? Yes, of course, you can ask in Russian. Uh, Jan, у меня вопрос для вас. Uh, если абстрагироваться от результата, есть ли ощущение, что вы принимаете участие в одном из самых зрелищных uh, матчей за корону uh, за последние 10-15 лет? И какой матч для вас в 21 веке был ну, наиболее интересным? Спасибо. Uh, my question is for Ian. Uh, if we forget the result, uh, the result you, you've, you've had today, so do you have an impression that you are taking part in one of the most spectacular uh, chess events of the past 10 to 15 years? Да, спросите в другой день. Answer is, uh, ask me this question in some other day, please. Fair enough. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, the, the photographer from here is blocking my side, so I cannot see the journalist. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Mike. If you can, please, just a little bit. Yeah. MikeKleinChess.com, my question is for Grandmaster Ding Loren. At the end of the game, Anish was seeing all these checkmates on the Chess.com broadcast, and he said that they, it was disturbing how beautiful it was. He was complimenting you. And then he said that you're a total genius for these ideas. Do you agree that your game today was genius level? Yeah, I'd like to thanks to Anish. Actually, yesterday I saw his remark. He, he's, he believes I, I will uh, tie the match despite uh, I was lost yesterday. So thanks for his, uh, his confidence. Yeah, today, yeah, the game itself, I feel very, very pleased with uh, with ideas. Many ideas occur so over the board. Yeah, in the end, yes, this d5 followed by queen c7. Also, I was very happy to find. Thank you. Next question, Leoncho, please. Leoncho Garcia from El País. My question is for Ian. Yesterday you achieved something really fantastic, winning the fifth game just after losing the fourth one. You just say that today's game is the worst you have ever played. Do you have a logical explanation for that? I mean, maybe too much self-confidence or something like this? Uh, thank you for the question, but uh, I think I just played really poorly. And uh, yeah, in some way it was, uh, I, I don't know, like a mirror from yesterday's game. Yeah, like the same material, like uh, and the same patterns. But uh, uh, yeah, I guess uh, yeah, the tension is high. So yeah, sometimes you can't perform at your best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have more questions from press? Yeah, please go. Uh, Mike Klein, chess.com question for Grandmaster Ding Loren. After yesterday's game, you said you were very sad or upset. I'm not putting you correctly, but you were down. Uh, were you able to change that mentality yesterday? Or 
did it only change when you started playing your game today? Well, the story was that uh, today I was struggling to find which opening to play uh, just before starting of the game. I have many choices. Uh, in the end, uh, I decided to play this London system because actually I was not so afraid of... Uh, uh, it's hard to say. I just want to play something I was more familiar with. Uh, it, I try to stay calm after yesterday's tough lose lost. And this opening, I think, shoot my style pretty well. It's like, it's kind of reversed. Uh, Carves part pawn structure in the uh, third game. So I can say it went very well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the Twitter segment. We're bringing the questions from Twitter. So when everyone who cannot travel here can anyway ask the questions and we will bring it. And please, Jesse. My name is Jesse February. My first question is for Jan. Do you find that your patience runs low in certain situations? Why is that? So, sorry again? Do you find that your patience runs low in certain situations? Why is that? No, I, I don't think it's anything about patience. It's, yeah, it's about uh, like a lot of bad moves made uh, like in one particular game. Uh, so I guess that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. All right. My next question is for Ding um, from Sand Dude. You took a lot of time playing Rook A3. What were you calculating? Uh, the point behind it. Right. So what were you calculating during that time? Uh, yeah, Rook A3. I saw bishop g6, knight b3, and queen b3, g3. And instead of rook a3, if I play knight b3, he had knight c6. And if I go queen g3, I don't want to exchange the queens immediately. I want to keep the possibilities. So it turns out the rook a3 is a very useful waiting move. Just improve my position a little bit more. All right, thank you. And the last question I have is for both players from Emil. Why do you think there are more decisive games in this match than World Championship matches in the past? Uh, we will go with Jan to answer this first. Yeah. Ask me this question another day. Sorry? Ask me these questions like some another day. <laughs> All right, we'll keep that. What about you, Ding? I guess the reason is maybe we are not that, that professional than Magnus. Right, You're very you. honest. <laughs> we appreciate that. Okay. Oh, do we have more questions from press? We have. Please, Maria, go ahead. Hello, Maria from Chess.com. The question uh, is for both players. Uh, so far, this is the most decisive match equal to Karpov versus Karchnoi in 1981. Why do you think we are seeing so many more decisive games uh, in this match than previous ones? Is, is it your styles of playing or your attitudes towards chess or something else? Uh, maybe start with Ian. Are we still keeping this question for the next round, Ian, or you would like to answer? <laughs> okay. So and yeah. Ding? No, it's uh, just the same question in the previous one. <laughs> no, yeah, but maybe something about your styles. Um, oh. Do you think it might affect? Maybe until now, there are not so many computer lines happens during the opening phrase. So early division from the theory. Yeah, sometimes we divide from this long and forced line. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, we appreciate that because it makes the match very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have more questions from the press? Please go ahead, go ahead and ask right now because this will be one last question and meanwhile I would like to just make a small announcement as yesterday there was a question about the coverage of the match in China uh, so um, I have an information that the uh, the live broadcasts in China are on 
Zhe Zhang satellite channel and CCTV channels, which covers the entire country. And also um, a lot of news, sor news sources are covering the event, including seeing what uh, news which provides reports every day. I apologize for my Chinese <laughs> uh, words. I just tried my best to announce. If someone is interested for these links, please approach me. I can share the links of the news in China. And if we have one last question, please. Yeah, commentary team. Oh, yeah, it's a question for Ding. Um, like, at which point did you see the move Rook A5, like after Queen takes B2? Like, when did you get that planned? Well, just in the end. <laughs> like, after Queen takes B2 happened, and then you started and After looking. I take on E5. Uh -huh. the first, I was thinking about Knight C4, take back, about Queen C1, King H2, Bishop D3, Queen E3, Queen D1, Knight E5, Queen H5, Queen H3, take. And this end game is not so easy to win, so in the end, uh, so I guess the other move doesn't work, so in the end I found the last chance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, s I think we don't have any more questions from press. I don't have also more questions. And we can conclude today's press conference. Tomorrow is a day off and I wish the players to have a nice rest day. And we will meet each other the other day. Thank you very much. And here we have the scoreboard after game six. The score now is 3-3 after Ding equalized with a fantastic victory today. What a game it was, finishing it off in style as well. Momentum Ding, you would think. Anish, what are your conclusions after watching that press conference? Yeah, momentum or not, it's hard to say at this point. Uh, maybe if we are looking for a pattern, or even that is flawed, but if you're looking for a pattern, maybe the player that's plays with the white pieces has the momentum at this point because the last uh, three wins were um, were by the players with the white pieces so if anything maybe the next game momentum is with Jan I'm confused I don't know this anymore I think uh, the match is very unusual uh, the development of it is also not what we have seen before and uh, just players trading blows uh, trading brilliances and today yeah I think just um, saw a lot of incredible lines and we, we had seen at the press conference as well. He had just a very deep understanding of this game. Yeah, it was interesting at the press conference, firstly, that Ding uh, watches the broadcast. Shout out. He was quoting you there, Anish. But uh, also that Jan described it as one of the worst games he's ever played. Do you think it's just the kind of post-game uh, kind of haze there? Or uh, is it genuinely going to affect his confidence? I don't think it will impact his confidence very much. He's extremely confident. But I uh, do think... Of course, uh, he realized he made a lot of mistakes in the opening. I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, if uh, what what caused it. I think I think they came from the fact that he, you know, is not familiar with the structure. So I don't think that they uh, they came out of the blue. But he certainly, I think what happened is that he realized that you know point point A he was having a good position and in the point B it was lost and he realized between point A and point B he must have played horn, horrible chess. Uh, I'm not sure he. Um, yeah, he, he knew exactly how that happened. Uh, and that is also why the choice of Ding was so so good. And as Ding mentioned as well, he uh, was fully aware that uh, the reverse Kalsbad position could suit him better than, than Jan and credit to him. Although I have to say, I was really surprised to hear how, um, how open he was about... How do I even put it? Like he, he mentioned that... Uh, he mentioned that, uh, that he didn't know what to play. And then last moment he decided to play the London and after Bishop F5 already, he was out of book and he just somehow it, it sounded all like, I don't know, like I'm looking for a good word, but the word is like amateuristic, you know, like in a way, like uh, normally you would expect that, you know, there's like a team and like for months he is making plans. He knows he has uh, seven white games, seven black games, so seven different plans for white. He would prepare everything, but maybe he, what he means is that he had a lot of things ready for the match, and this was one of the things that he chose. Uh, and you know, I mean, he says that he was out of book after Bishop F5, but he played the position so well uh, and so fast. I don't know. He must have studied similar positions somehow. Like if you look at the game, uh, it looks as you know the player showed deep understanding, uh, and he did, and uh, it was a great game. While if you listen to the press conference, it sounds like. Uh, you know, I came, uh, I saw nothing, and I conquered. I mean, it cannot be like that, yeah? It's... 
it's it's refreshing his honesty though it's very relatable as well i know a lot of players a lot of the viewers at home we kind of turn up at the board without a game plan we kind of act on the fly we freestyle a bit but uh ding pulled it off and anish this was game six let's look ahead still plenty more action to come over the coming days and uh tomorrow of course of course is a rest day uh, the players need time to recuperate recover and we will be back on Tuesday with Game 7. It's a one-off before another rest day. And, uh, of course, same time, same place. But what do you think, uh, Anish Giri? It's been a pleasure and, uh, commentating with you. What are your main takeaways from the day? And what are you looking forward to most after the rest day? I think the pleasure is mine. And, uh, well, I think that what we have seen so far is that uh, there's nobody's... Uh... You know, is is down in the match. Uh, both Jan and Ding, they're able to bounce back with incredible chess. So it's it's by now becoming extremely unpredictable, and it, it's it's no longer possible to um, to see and understand the flow of this match. is is just a total chaos. I think an interesting uh, thing perhaps we could touch upon because we see the schedule here, and I just wanted to point out the reason for this one game uh, surrounded by two rest days. At first, I was very confused, but I think I understood the point. So the reason is that. Um, they want that not always after the rest day a player has uh, the same color because it would give it would give an advantage uh, to one of the players. So let's say if you prefer to have more time for preparing with the white pieces, give the advantage for that player. But if they what they did before is to uh, reverse that, they would swap the colors. But that would then give the advantage once again to one of the players because that player could have two games in a row of the same color. So what they did is by creating an extra rest day, they reversed that around without having uh, players play two uh, games in the same color. So they, they did this whole operation for this. That means that we have uh, a lot of rest days. And if that game will be drawn, there will be sort of a little moment of peace in between the match. Um, but I, have, I really wouldn't bet on a draw. I think the both players have been so aggressive with the white pieces. They come up with uh, such ambitious game plans not necessarily going for a big advantage, but avoiding forced, forcing lines, which is what Ding mentioned, because the forcing lines, th these are the ones that often can lead to a draw if both players know them. They're just going for these positional fights, which are very ambitious. And, uh, well, I wouldn't bet on the draw anymore. And uh, game seven is, is going to be a big one, just like every game so far. And I'm looking forward immensely. Yeah, there's certainly method behind the madness with the schedule. And uh, Anish Giri, Grandmaster, world number six. It's been a pleasure. I think you'll be back after the rest day, right? Yes, I have the plans to commentate um, a couple more games for me, and uh, I hope uh, you know the, then uh, people will uh, will find a good replacement in my good colleague Fabiana Corona, who I'm a big fan of, and I, I'll be uh, you know following his commentary with pleasure as well. It was also an honor for me to commentate with you, with uh, also with Daniel Nordiski and. Yeah, really, really fortunate and happy to be commentating on this remarkable, this remarkable occasion. But I will certainly, I'm certainly intending to be back after the rest day, and so will the players. And uh, David, uh, in terms of your uh, your commentating journey this year, are you uh, are you doing more uh, days with us? Or unfortunately, not. Uh, this was my final day in the commentary booth for this World Championship match. But I'm going to be watching you. I'm going to be watching from afar and enjoying all the drama, of course. But uh, on that note, as we do head into the rest day, we leave you with the best moments of Game 6. I've been David Hal, Anish Giri, and thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you, David. I, I think it's a disaster for Black already. This could get incredibly unpleasant. The rookie 2 is computer best, and Nepo, I think, he smells it. No, I think he is, um, he's, he's done here. Ding has just resigned the game. He has stopped the clock. A handshake has occurred. And we're off. We have the handshake and okay, it is oh, no. D4. Surely he's not going for the London system or any other things uh, associated to 9F3. Yes, he does. He oh, is. No. Oh, wow. no. oh no, oh no, oh <laughs> no. The London. Half the viewership is already lost. Anish, we're back with some moves. I see a look on your face. You're not liking the developments here in the game for Jan Nepomniji. Oh, it's horrible. It looks horrible. E5 on the board. It is just strategically horrendous for you. This is Ding's kind of game. It reminds me of some of a game I lost to Ding. Yeah, and Anish, uh, before we dig deeper into H4, we are seeing a lot of uh, messages from the featured chat about your mug. Is that Magnus? Maybe you can show us uh, a bit yeah, closer. Yeah, it's Mag Magnus with the U, yeah? Mag Magnus. Magnus, wow. <laughs> Jan's in his rest area again. Just feels like he doesn't want to come back to the board when he knows he's in trouble. Wow. Being there with the computer precision, smelling blood and going for the kill. 
Jan has resigned, you called it. No beautiful checkmate on the board, but still a beautiful game, beautiful finish from Ding, and the scores are level.